Introduction and Foreword to Precious Bane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian. Precious Bane by Mary Webb. Introduction and Foreword. Mary Meredith Webb, 1881 to 1927. A note on the author of Precious Bane. Mary Webb died in 1927, almost unnoticed. She had lived obscurely in the village of Shrewsbury, a frail woman in delicate health who had to earn her living by raising vegetables and flowers and selling them in person at market. The daughter of a schoolmaster, George Edward Meredith, she received her education at home, except for two years of schooling at Southport. At thirty she married Henry B. L. Webb, and together they tried to eke out a living from a grudging land. The dream of writing found its first reality in a novel, The Golden Arrow, published in 1916. There followed gone to earth the how in dormer forest and seven for a secret all of these novels suffered the same indifference that the world had shown their author then she wrote precious bane a handful of people were moved by it and sung its praises it was awarded the pre femina as the best english novel of 1925 like its predecessors, Precious Bane might have languished unnoticed by the world at large, and its author, now dead at forty-six, might have been forgotten, had not a busy Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, paused to introduce and champion Mary Webb in 1928. Then the world began to take notice, and posthumously at least, a dream of fame was fulfilled for the author of Precious Bane. Introduction Mary Meredith, the author of Precious Bane, was born in the little village of Leighton, near Cressage, under the Wrekin, on March 25th, 1881, and died at St. Leonard's, October 8th, 1927, and was married at Shrewsbury. She was the daughter of George Edward Meredith, a schoolmaster of Welsh descent, by his marriage with Sarah Alice Scott, daughter of an Edinburgh doctor of the clan of Sir Walter Scott. She was the eldest of six children, and spent her early girlhood in the Grange, a small country house near Much Wenlock. From twelve to twenty-one she lived at Stanton on Hine Heath, six miles northeast of Shrewsbury and for the next ten years at the old mill, Mule Brace, a mile from Shrewsbury. In 1912, Mary Meredith married Mr. Henry Bertram Law Webb, a Cambridge graduate and a native of Shropshire. After two years at Western Supermare, where Mr. Webb had a post in a school, Mr. and Mrs. Webb returned to Shropshire, living at Pontesbury and Lythe Hill, working as market gardeners and selling the produce at their own stall in Shrewsbury Market. Mrs. Webb had written stories and poems from childhood, but it was at this period that she seriously turned her mind to writing novels. A volume of essays on nature, The Spring of Joy, and three novels, The Golden Arrow, Gone to Earth, and The House in Dormer Forest, had been published before she came to live in London in 1921. Seven for a Secret followed in 1922 and Precious Bane in 1924. It was awarded the Femina V. Herreus Prize for 1924-25, given annually for the best work of imagination in prose or verse descriptive of English life by an author who had not attained sufficient recognition. I am indebted for these biographical particulars to Mr. Webb, to whom Precious Bane is inscribed. I never met Mary Webb, 
and knew nothing of her work until I read Precious Bane at Christmas, 1926. I am glad to think that I was in time to send her a few words of appreciation. The stupid urban view of the countryside as dull receives a fresh and crushing answer in the books of Mary Webb. All the novels, except Precious Bane, are set in the hill country of southwest Shropshire, between the Clee Hills and the Brydens, and between Shrewsbury and Ludlow. The scene of Precious Bane is the country of North Shropshire Mears, the Ellesmere district, but the dialect is that of South Shropshire. It is the country of the Severn Lowlands and of isolated upland ridges, where Celt and Saxon have met and mingled for centuries. For the passing traveller it is inhabited by an uncommunicative population dwelling among places with names like Stedmont and Squilver and Stipperston, Nipstone and Nind. There are of course the old castles and timbered black and white houses for the motoring visitors. But to the imaginative child brought up among the ploughlands and pools and dragonflies there is a richness on the world so it looked what our parson used to call sumptuous. It is this richness which Mary Webb saw and felt as a girl and remembered with lyrical intensity as a woman. She has interlaced with this natural beauty the tragic drama of a youth whose whole being is bent on toil and thrift and worldly success only to find himself defeated on the morrow of the harvest by the firing of the cornricks by the father of his lover. The dour figure of Gideon San is set against that of his gentle sister Prudence who tells the tale. She is a woman flawed with a hair-shotten lip and cursed in the eyes of the neighbours, until her soul's loveliness is discerned by Kester Woodseaves, the weaver, and so there comes to her at the end of the story the love which is the peace to which all hearts do strive. The strength of the book is not in its insight into human character, though that is not lacking, nor does it lie in the inevitability with which the drama is unfolded and the sin of an all-absorbing and selfish ambition punished. It lies in the fusion of the elements of nature and man, as observed in this remote countryside by a woman even more alive to the changing moods of nature than of man. Almost any page at random will furnish an illustration of the blending of human passion with the fields and skies. So they rode away, and the sound of the people died till it was less than the hum of a midge, and there was nothing but a scent of rosemary and warm sun and the horse lengthening its stride towards the mountains whence came the air of morning. Page 117 One reviewer compared Precious Bane to a sampler stitched through long summer evenings in the bay window of a remote farmhouse, and sometimes writers of Welsh and border origin like William Morris have had their work compared to old tapestries. But while these comparisons suggest something of the harmonies of colour, they fail to convey the emotional force which glows in these pages. Nature, to Mary Webb, was not a pattern on a screen. Her sensibility is so acute, and her power over words so sure and swift, that one who reads some passages in Whitehall has almost the physical sense of being in Shropshire cornfields. Precious Bane is a revelation, not of unearthly, but of earthly beauty, in one bit of the England of Waterloo, the western edge, haunted with the shadows of superstition, the legendary law and fantasy of neighbours on the border, differing in blood and tongue. This mingling of peoples and traditions and turns of speech and proverbial wisdom is what Mary Webb saw with the eye of mind as she stood at her stall in Shrewsbury Market, fastened in her memory and fashioned for us in the little parcel of novels which is her legacy to literature. Stanley Baldwin, 10 Downing Street, 
Southwest One, October 1928. Forward. To conjure, even for a moment, the wistfulness which is the past is like trying to gather in one's arms the hyacinthine colour of the distance. But if it is once achieved, what sweetness, like the gentle fugitive fragrance of spring flowers dried with bergamot and bay. How the tears will spring in the reading of some old parchment. To my dear child, my tablets and my ring. Or of the yellow letters with the love still fresh and fair in them, though the ink is faded. And so good night, my dearest heart, and God send you happy. That vivid present of theirs, how faint it grows. The past is only the present become invisible and mute, and because it is invisible and mute, its memoried glances and its murmurs are infinitely precious. We are tomorrow's past. Even now we slip away like those pictures painted on the moving dials of antique clocks. A ship, a cottage, sun and moon, a nosegay. The dial turns, the ship rides up and sinks again. The yellow-painted sun has set, and we, that were the new thing, gather magic as we go. The whir of the spinning wheels has ceased in our parlours, and we hear no more the treadles of the loom, the swift silken noise of the flung shuttle, the intermittent thud of the batten, but the imagination hears them, and theirs is the melody of romance. When antique things are also country things, they are easier to write about, for there is a permanence, a continuity in country life, which makes the lapse of centuries seem of little moment. Shropshire is a county where the dignity and beauty of ancient things lingers long, and I have been fortunate not only in being born and brought up in its magical atmosphere, and in having many friends in farm and cottage who, by pleasant talk and reminiscence have fired the imagination, but also in having the companionship of such a mind as was my father's, a mind stored with old tales and legends that did not come from books, and rich with an abiding love for the beauty of forest and harvest field, all the more intense, perhaps, because it found little opportunity for expression. In treating of the old subject of sin-eating, I am aware that William Sharp has forestalled me, and has written with consummate art. But sin-eaters were as well known on the Welsh border as in Scotland, and John Aubrey tells of one who lived in a cottage on Ross Highway, and was a lamentable poor rascal. My thanks are due to the authors of Shropshire Folklore for the rhymes of Green Gravel and Barley Bridge and for the verification of various customs which I had otherwise only known by hearsay, and to the Somerset weavers who recently let me see both hand looms and spinning wheels in use. Mary Webb, March 1926 End of the Introduction and Foreword Book One Chapter One of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. San Mir. It was at a love spinning that I saw Kester first, and if in these newfangled days, when strange inventions crowd upon us, when I hear tell there is even a machine coming into use in some parts of the country for reaping and mowing, if those that may happen will read this don't know what a love spinning was, they shall hear in good time. But though it was Jancis Beguildi's love spinning, she being three and twenty at that time, and I being two years less, yet that is not the beginning of the story that I have set out to tell. Kester says that all tales, true tales or romancings, go further back than the days of the child, 
Aye, farther even than the little babe in its cot of rushes. Maybe you never slept in a cot of rushes, but all of us did at Sarn. There is such a plenty of rushes at Sarn, and old Beguildy's missus was a great one for plaiting them on rounded barrel hoops. Then they'd be set on rockers, and a nice clean cradle they made, soft and green, so that the babe could feel as big sorted as a little caterpillar, painted butterflies as is to be, Kester calls them, sleeping in its cocoon. Kester's very set about such things, never will he say caterpillars. He'll say, there's a lot of butterflies as is to be on our cabbages, Prue. Who won't say, tis winter, he'll say, summer's sleeping, and there's no bud little enough, nor sad coloured enough, for Kester not to call on it the beginnings of the blow. But the time is not yet come for speaking of Kester. It is the story of us all at Zahn, of mother and Gideon and me, and Jancis, that was so beautiful, and wizard beguiledy and the two or three other folk that lived in those parts, that I did set out to tell. There were but a few, and maybe always will be, for there's a discouragement about the place. It may be the water lapping, year in and year out. Everywhere you look and listen, water. Or the big trees waiting and considering on your right hand and on your left. Or the unbreathing quiet of the place as if it was created but an hour gone, and not created for us. Or it may be that the soil is very poor and marshy, with little nature or goodness in the grass, which is ever so where reeds and rushes grow in plenty, and the flower of the pagel. Happen you call it cowslip, but we always named it the pagel, or keys of heaven. It was a wonderful thing to see our meadows at Sarn when the cowslip was in blow. Gold over they were, so that you would think not even an angel's feet were good enough to walk there. You could make a tossy ball before a thrush had gone over his song twice, for you'd only got to sit down and gather with both hands. Every way you looked there was naught but gold saving towards Sarn, where the woods began, and the great stretch of grey water, gleaming and wincing in the sun. Neither woods nor water looked darksome in that fine spring weather, with the leaves coming new, and buds the colour of corn in the birch tops. Only in our oak woods was there always a look of the back end of the year, their young leaves being so brown. So there was always a breath of October in our May, but it was a pleasant thing to sit in the meadows and look away to the far hills. The larches spired up in their quick green, and the cowslip gold seemed to get into your heart, and even San Mir was nothing but a blue mist in a yellow mist of birch tops. And there was such a dream on the place that if a wild bee came by, let alone a bumble, it startled you like a shout. If a bee comes in at the window now to my jar of gillyflowers, I can see it all in clear colours, with plash lying under the sunset beyond the woods, looking like a jagged piece of bottle glass. Plash Mere was bigger than San, and there wasn't a tree by it, so where there were no hills beyond it, you could see the clouds rooted in it on the far side and I used to think they looked like the white water lilies that lay round the margins of San half the summer through. There was nothing about Plash that was different from any other lake or pool. There was no troubling of the waters, as at San, nor any village sounding its bells beneath the furthest deeps. It was true, what folk said of San, that there was summer to be felt there. It was at Plash that the Beguildies lived, and it was at their dwelling, that was part stone house and part cave, that I got my book learning. It may seem a strange thing to you that a woman of my humble station should be able to write and spell, and put all these things into a book, 
and indeed when I was a young wench there were not many great ladies even that could do so much more scribing than to write a love letter, and some could but just write such things as this be quince and apple on their jellies, and others had ado to put their names in the marriage register. Many have come to me time and again to write their love letters for them, and a bitter old task it is to write other women's love letters out of your own burning heart. If it hadn't a been for Mr. Beguildy, I never could have written down all these things. He learned me to read and write and reckon up figures, and though he was a preached against man, and said he could do a deal that I don't believe he ever could do, and though he dabbled in things that are not good for us to interfere with, yet shall I never forget to thank God for him. It seems to me now a very uncommon working of his power to put it into Beguildy's heart to learn me, for a wizard could not rightly be called a servant of his, but one of Lucifer's men. Not that Beguildy was wicked, but only empty of good, as if all the righteousness was burned out by the flame of his fiery mind, which must know and intermeddle with mysteries. As for love, he did not know the word. He could read the stars and tell the future, and he claimed to have laid spirits. Once I asked him where the future was, that he could see it so plain, and he said, It lies with the past, child, at the back of time. You couldn't ever get the better of Mr. Beguildy. But when I told Castor what he said, Castor would not have it so. He said the past and the future were two shuttles in the hands of the Lord, weaving eternity. Castor was a weaver himself, which may have made him think of it thus. But I think we cannot know what the past and the future are. We are so small and helpless on the earth that is like a green rush cradle where mankind lies, looking up at the stars, but not knowing what they be. As soon as I could write, I made a little book with a calico cover, and every Sunday I wrote in it any merry time or good fortune we had had in the week, and so kept them. And if times had been troublous and bitter for me, I wrote that down too, and was eased. So when our parson, knowing of the lies that were told of me, bade me write all I could remember in a book, and set down the whole truth and nothing else, I was able to freshen my memory with the things I had put down, Sunday by Sunday. Well, it is all gone over now, the trouble and the struggling. It be quiet weather now, like a still evening with the snow all down, and a green sky, and lambs calling. I sit here by the fire with my Bible to hand, a very old woman and a tired woman, with a task to do before she says good night to this world. When I look out of my window and see the plain and the big sky with clouds standing up on the mountains, I call to mind the thick blotting woods of San and the crying of the mere when the ice was on it, and the way the water would come into the cupboard under the stairs when it rose at the time of the snow melting. There was but little sky to see there, saving that which was reflected in the mere. But the sky that is in the mere is not the proper heavens. You see it in a glass darkly, and the long shadows of rushes go thin and sharp across the sliding stars, and even the sun and moon might be put out down there, for times the moon would get lost in lily leaves and times a heron might stand before the sun. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of Precious Bane by Mary Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Telling the Bees my brother Gideon was born in the year when the war with the French began. That was why father would have him called Gideon, it being a warlike name. 
Jancis used to say it was a very good name for him, because it was one you couldn't shorten. You can make most names into little love names, like you can cut down a cloak or a gown for a child's wearing. But Gideon you could do naught with, and the name was like the man. I was more set on my brother than most are, but I couldn't help seeing that about him. If nobody calls you out of your name, your name's like to be soon out of mind. And most people never even called him by his Christian name at all. They called him San. In father's life, it was old San and young San. But after father died, Gideon seemed to take the place to himself. I remember how he went out that summer night and seemed to eat and drink the place, devouring it with his eyes. Yet it was not for love of it, but for what he could get out of it. He was very like father then, and more like every year, both to look at and in his mind. Saving that he was less tempersome and more set in his ways, he was father's very marrow. Father's temper got up desperate quick, and when it was up, he was a ravening lion. Maybe that was what gave mother that married all o'er look. But Gideon I only saw angered, to call angered, three times. Mostly a look was enough. He'd give you a look like murder, and you'd let him take the way he wanted. I've seen a dog cringing and whimpering because he'd given it one of those looks. Sans mostly have grey eyes cold grey like the mere in winter, and the San men are mainly dark and sullen. Sullen as a San, they say about these parts, and they say there's been something queer in the family ever since Timothy San was struck by forked lightning in the times of the religious wars. There were Sans about here then, and always have been, ever since there was anybody. Well, Timothy went against his folk and the counsels of a man of God, and took up with the wrong side, whichever that was, but it's no matter now. So he was struck by lightning and lay for dead. Being after a while recovered, he was counselled by the man of God to espouse the safe side and avoid the lightning. But Sans were ever obstinate men, he kept his side, and as he was coming home under the oak wood, he was struck again, and seemingly the lightning got into his blood. He could tell when tempest brewed, long afore it came, and it is said that when a storm broke, the wild fire played about him so no one could come near him. Sans have the lightning in their blood since his day. I wonder sometimes whether it be a true tale, or whether it's too old to be true. It used to seem to me sometimes as if San was too old to be true. The woods and the farm and the church at the other end of the mere were all so old, as if they were in somebody's dream. There was frittering about the place, too, and what with folk being afraid to come there after dusk, and the quiet noise of the fish jumping far out in the water, and Gideon's boat knocking on the steps with little knocks, like somebody tapping at the door, and the causeway that ran down into the mere as far as you could see, from just outside our garden gate, being lost in the water. It was a very lonesome old place. Many a time, on Sunday evenings, there came over the water a thin sound of bells. We thought they were the bells of the village down under, but I believe now they were naught but echo bells from our own church. They say that in some places a sound will knock against a wall of trees and come back like a ball. It was on one of those Sunday evenings, when the thin chimes were sounding along with their own four bells, that we played truant from church for the second time, it being such a beautiful evening and father and mother being busy with the bees swarming. We made it up between us to take dog's leave, and to wait by the lich gate for Jancis, and get her to come with us. For old Beguiledy never worried much about her church going, 
not being the best of friends with the parson himself. He sent her off when the dial made it five o'clock every fourth Sunday, for we had service only once a month, the parson having a church at Brampton where he lived, and another as well, which made it the more wicked of us to play truant. But whether she got there early or late, or got there at all, he'd never ask, let alone catechise her about the sermon. Our father would catechise us last thing in the evening when our night rails were on. Father would sit down in the settle with the birch rod in his hand, and the settle, that had looked such a great piece of furniture all the week, suddenly looked little like a settle made for a moment. Whatever father sat in, he made it look little. We stood barefoot in front of him on the cold quarries, in our unbleached homespun gowns that mother had spun, and the journeyman weaver had woven up in the attic at the loom among the apples. Then he'd question us, and when we answered wrong, he made a mark on the settle, and every mark was a stroke with the birch at the end of the catechizing. Though father couldn't read, he never forgot anything. It seemed as if he turned things over in his head all the while he was working. I think he was a very clever man, with not enough things to employ his mind. If he'd had one of the new-fangled weaving machines I hear tell of to look after, it would have kept him content. But there was no talk of such things then. We were all the machines he had, and we wished very heartily every fourth Sunday, and Christmas and Easter, that we were the children of Begaldi, though he was thought of so ill by our parson, and often preached against, even by name. I mind once, when father lathered us very bad, after the long preaching on Easter Sunday, Gideon being seven and me five, how Gideon stood up in the middle of the kitchen and said, I do will and wish to be Master Beguiledy's son, and the devil shall have my soul. Amen. Father got his temper up that night, no danger. He shouted at Mother Terrible, saying she'd done very poorly with her children, for the girl had the devil's mark on her, and now it seemed as if the boy came from the same smithy. This I know because Mother told it to me. All I mind is that she went to look very small, and being only little to begin with, she seemed like one of the fairy folk, and she said, Could I help it, if the hair crossed my path? Could I help it? It seems so strange to hear her saying that over and over. I can see the room now if I shut my eyes, and most especially if there's a bunch of cowslips by me for Easter fell late, or in a spell of warm weather that year, and the cowslips were very forward in sheltered places, so we'd pulled some. The room was all dim like a cave, and the red fire burning still and watchful seemed like the eye of the Lord. There was a little red eye in every bit of wear on the dresser too, where it caught the gleam. Often and often in after years I looked at those red lights, which were echoes of the fire, just as the ghostly bells were reflections of the chime, and I've thought they were like a deal of the outer show of this world, rows and rows of red gladly fires, but all shadows of fires, many a chime of merry bells ringing, and yet only the shadows of bells. Only a sigh of sound coming back from the wall of leaves or from the glassy water. Father's eye caught the gleam too, and Gideon's, but mother's didna, for she was standing with her back to the fire by the table where the cowslips were, gathering the mugs and plates together from supper. And if it seemed strange that so young a child should remember the past so clearly, you must call to mind that time engraves his pictures on our memory like a boy cutting letters with his knife, and the fewer the letters, the deeper he cuts. So few things ever happen to us at San that we could never forget them. Mother's voice clings to my heart like trails of bed straw that catch you in the lanes. She's got a very plaintive voice and soft. Everything she said seemed to mean a deal more than the words, and times it was like a person fumbling in the dark, 
or going a long way down black passages with a hand held out on this side and a hand held out on that side and no light that was how she said could i help it if the hair crossed my path could i help it everything she said though it might not have anything merry in it she smiled a bit in the way you smile to take the edge off somebody's anger or if you hurt yourself and won't show it a very grievous smile it was and always there so when father gave gideon another hiding for wishing he was beguiled his boy mother stood by the table saying o oh, dunna son hold thy hand son and smiling all the while seeming to catch at father's hand with her soft voice poor mother oh my poor mother shall we meet you in the other world dear soul and atone to you for our heedlessness i have never forgotten that easter but gideon had seemingly for when i remembered him of it saying we surely durstn't take the dog's leave he said it's naught we'll make sexton's tivy listen to the sermon for us so as we can answer well and i dunna care much if i am leathered so long as i can find some good conquers and beat jancis for last time she beat me conquers maybe you know are snail shells and children put the empty ones on strings and play like you play with chestnut gobs our woods were a grand place for snails and gideon had conquer matches with lads from as far away as five miles the other side of plash he was famous all about because he played so fiercely and not like a game at all all the bells were sounding when we started that sunday in june the four metal bells in the church and the four ghost bells from nowhere mother was helping father with the bees getting a new skep ready down where the big chestnut tree was to put the play of bees in they'd swarmed in a dead gooseberry bush and mother said with her peculiar smile it be a sign of death but gideon shouted out a play of bees in may is worth a noble that same day a play in june's pretty soon and he said so long as we've got the bees mother we're the better of it die who may eh hey, dear i'm afraid gideon had a very having spirit even then but father thought he was a sensible lad and he laughed and said well we've got such a mort of bees now i mean be hopes it wanna be me as has the telling of em if anybody does die where be your sprigs of rosemary and your prayer books and your clean handkerchers says mother gideon had been in be hopes to leave them behind but now he ran to fetch them and mother began setting my kerchief to rights over my shoulders she put in her big brooch with the black stone that she had when george the second died and while she was putting it in she kept saying to herself not as it matters what the poor child wears deary deary me but could i help it if the hair crossed my path could i help it whenever she said that her voice went very mournful and i thought again of somebody in a dark passage groping now then mother hold the skep whilst i keep the bow up said father they've knit so low down i'd lief have stayed for i dearly loved to see the great tossy ball of bees bodies as rich as a brown christmas cake and to hear the heavy sound of them we went through the wicket and along the top path because it was the nighest way to the church and we wanted to catch tivy afore she went in the coots were out on the mere and the water was the colour of light with spears in it now said gideon we'll run for our lives what's after us the people out of the water so we ran for our lives and got to the church just as the two last bells began their snabbing ting tong ting tong that always minded me of the birch rod we sat on the flat grave where we mostly sat to play conquer and the church being on a little hill we could watch the two three folks coming along the fields 
there was Tivy with her father coming from the east copy, and Jancis in the flat water meadows where the big thorn hedges were all in blow. Jancis was a little thing, not tall like me, but you always saw her before you saw other people, for it seemed that the light gathered round her. She'd got golden hair, and all the shadows on her face seemed to be stained with the pale colour of it. I was used to think she was like a white water lily full of yellow pollen or honey. She'd got a very white skin, creamy white, without any colour unless she was excited or shy, and her face was dimpled and soft, and just the right plumpness. She'd got a red, cool, smiling mouth, and when she smiled, the dimples ran each into other. Times I could almost have strangled her for that smile. She came up to us very demure in her flowered bodice and blue skirt and a bunch of blossoms in her kerchief. Although she was only two years older than I was, being of an age with Gideon, she seemed a deal older, for she'd begun to smile at the lads already, and folk said, Beguiledy's chances will soon be courting. But I know old Beguiledy never meant her to get married. He meant to keep her as bait to draw the young fellows in, for mostly the people that came to him were either young maids with no money or old men who wanted somebody cursed cheap. So at this time, when he saw what a white, blossomy piece Jancis was growing, he encouraged her to dizzen herself and sit in the window of the cave house in case anybody went by up the lane. It was only once in a month of Sundays that anybody did, for Plash was nearly as lonesome as San. He made a lantern of coloured glass too, the colour of red roses, and while Jansa sat in the stone frame of the window, he hung it up above her with a great candle in it from foreign parts, not a rushlight such as we used. He had it in mind that if some great gentleman came by to a fair or a cockfight beyond the mountains, he might fall in love with her, and then beguiled he planned to bring him in and give him strong ale and talk about charms and spells, and offer at long last to work the charm of raising Venus. It was all written in one of his books. How you went into a dark room and gave the wise man five pounds, and he said a charm, and after a while there was a pink light and a scent of roses and Venus rose naked in the middle of the room. Only it wouldn't have been Venus, but Jancis. The great gentleman, howsoever, was a long while coming, and the only man that saw her in the window was Gideon one winter evening when he was coming back that way from market because the other road was flooded. He was fair comic struck about her and talked of her till I was a-weary, he being nineteen at the time, which is a foolish age in lads. Before that he never took any account of her but just to tell her this and that, as he did with me. But afterwards he was naught but a gorby about her. I could never have believed that such a determined lad, so set in his ways and so clever, could have been thus soft about a girl. But on this evening he was only seventeen, and he just said, Take dog's leave out, Jancis, and come with us after conquers. Oh, said Jancis, I want her to play green gravel, green gravel. She's got a way of saying, oh, afore everything, and it made her mouth look like a rose. But whether she did it for that, or whether she did it because she was slow-witted and timid, I never could tell. There's naught to win in green gravel, said Gideon. We'll play conquer. Oh, I wanted green gravel. You'll beat me if we play conquer. Ah, that's why we'll play. Tivy came through the lich gate then, and we told her what she'd got to do. She was a poor foolish creature, and she could hardly mind her own name, times, for all its outlandishness, let alone a sermon. But Gideon said, so long as she got an inkling of it, he could make up the rest. And he said, if she didn't remember enough of it, he'd twist her arm proper. So she began to cry. 
Then we saw Sexton coming across the ploughed field, very solemn, with his long staff, black and white in bands, and we could hear Parson's piebald pony clopping up the lane. So we made off, and left Tivy with her round chin trembling, and her mouth all crooked with crying, because she knew she'd never remember a word of the sermon. Tivy, at a sermon, always used to make me think of our dog being washed. He'd lie down and let the water souse over him, and she did the same with the sermon, so I knew trouble was brewing. It was a beautiful evening, with swallows high in the air and a powerful smell of may blossom. When the bells stopped, ours and the others, we went and looked down into the water to see if we could get a sight of the village there, as we did most Sundays. But there was only our own church upside down, and two or three stones, and crosses the same, and Parson's pony grazing on its head. Times on summer evenings, when the sun was low, the shadow of the spire came right across the water to our dwelling, and I was used to think it was like the finger of the Lord pointing at us. We went down into the marshy places and found plenty of conkers, and Gideon beat Jancis every time, which was a good thing, for at the end he said he'd play green gravel, and they were both pleased. Only we were terrible late, and nearly missed Tibby. Now tell, says Gideon. So she began to cry, and said she knew naught about it. Then he twisted her arm, and she screamed out, burning and fuel of fire. She must have said that because it was one of the texts the sexton was very fond of saying over, keeping time with tapping his staff the while. What else? Naught. I'll twist your arm till it comes off if you don't think of any more. Tivy looked artful, like pussy in the dairy, and said, Parson told about Adam and Eve and Noah and Shiman Japhet and Jesus in the manger and thirty pieces of silver. Gideon's face went dark. There's no sense in it, he said. But she's told you anyway. You must let her go now. So we went home, with the shadow of the spire stretching all across the water. Father said, What was the text? Burning and fuel of fire. What was the sermon about? Poor Gideon made out a tale of all the things Tivy had said. You never heard such a tale. Father sat quite quiet, and Mother was smiling very painful, standing by the fire, cooking a rasher. Suddenly father shouted out, Liar! Liar! Parson called but now to say, Was there sickness, there being nobody at church? You've not only taken dog's leave and lied, but you've made game of me. His face went from red to purple, and all veined like raw meat. It was awful to see. Then he reached for the horsewhip and said, I'll give you the best hiding you ever had, my boy. He came across the kitchen towards Gideon, but suddenly Gideon ran at him and bunted into him, and taking him by surprise he knocked him clean over. Now whether it was because father had eaten a very hearty supper after a big day's work with the bees, or whether it was him being in such a rage, and then the surprise of the fall we never knew. However it was, he was taken with a fit. He never stirred, but lay on his back on the red quarries, breathing so loud and strong that it filled the house, like somebody snoring in the night. Mother undid his Sunday neckcloth and lifted him up, and put cold water on his face, but it was no manner of use. The awful snoring went on, and seemed to eat up all other sounds. They went out like rushlights in the wind. There was no more ticking from the clock nor purring from the cat, nor sizzling from the rasher, nor buzzing from the bee in the window. It seemed to eat up the light, too, and the smell of the white bush roses outside, and the feeling in my body, and the thoughts I had afore. We'd all come to be just a part of a dark snoring. "'San! San!' cried Mother. 
O oh, San, poor soul, come to thyself. She tried to put some hollands between his lips, but they were set. Then the snore changed to a rattle, very awful to hear, and in a little while it stopped, and there was a dreadful silence, as if all the earth had gone dumb. All the while Gideon stood like stone, remembering the horse with father meant to beat him with, so he said after. And though he'd never seen anyone die afore, when father went quiet and the place dumb, he said in an everyday voice, only with a bit of a tremble, He's dead, mother. I'll go and tell the bees, or we met lose em. We cried a long while, mother and me, and when we couldn't cry any more, the little sounds came creeping back, the clock ticking, bits of wood falling out of the fire, and the cat breathing in its sleep. When Gideon came in again, the three of us managed to get father onto a mattress and lap him in a clean sheet. He looked a fine, good-featured man, now that the purple colour was gone from his face. Gideon locked up and went round to look the beasts and see all well. Best go to bed now, mother, he said. All safe and the beasts in their housen. I told every skep of bees, and I can see they are content and willing for me to be maester. End of Book One, Chapter Two Book One, Chapter Three of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Prue takes the bidding letters. In those days there was little time for the mourners to think of their sorrow till after the funeral. There was a deal to do. There was the mourning to make. And before that, if a family hadn't had the weaver lately, there was the cloth to weave and dye. We hadn't had the weaver for a good while, so we were very short of stuff. Mother told Gideon he must go and fetch the old weaver, who lived at Lullingford by the mountains, and went out weaving by the day or the week. Gideon saddled Bendigo, father's horse, and picked up the riding whip with a queer kind of smile. As soon as he was gone, mother and I began to bake for it wasn't only the weaver that must be fed, but the women we were going to bid to the funeral sewing bee. They would come for love, as was the custom, but we must feed them. It seemed lonesome that night without Gideon. He had to bait and sleep in Lullingford, but he came back in good time next day, and I heard the sound of the hooves on the yard cobbles through my spinning. We were hard at it, getting yarn ready for the old man. He came riding after Gideon on a great white horse, very bony, which put me in mind of the rider on the white horse in the Bible. He was the oldest man you could see in a month of Sundays. He hopped about like a magpie, prying here and there over the loom, looking at his shuttle for all the world like a pie that's pleased with some bright thing it's found. I had to take his meals up to the attic, for he wouldn't have waste time leaving off for them. It was a good thing the apples were all done, so he could hop about the loft without let or hindrance. Now you must take the bidding letters for the sewing, Prue, mother told me. Can I take one to Jancis, mother? No, we manna spend money paying for a bidding letter to Jancis, but she can come and welcome. I'll go and tell her. She sews very nice. But not so well as you, my dear. Whatsoever's wrong, thee sews a beautiful straight seam, Prue. I ran off, mightily pleased with praise, which came seldom my way. I met Gideon by the lake. Taking the biddings, he said. Ah? Chance is coming? Ah? Well, when you be there, ask Beguildy to lend us the white oxen for the funeral, Oot. 
to lug father to the church ah and when we've buried father you and me must talk a bit there's a deal to think of for the future all these bidding letters now you met as well have written them and saved a crown i wondered what he meant seeing he knew i couldn't write a word but i knew he'd say in his own time and not afore that being his way nobody would have thought he was but seventeen he seemed five and twenty by the way he spoke so choppy and quick but ever so quiet when i got to plash jancis was sitting in the garden spinning she said we could borrow the beasts that were hers by right being a present from her granny though she never had the strength to control them in a wagon nor to drive plough with them like i had in the years after but she got a bit of pin money for hiring them out for wakes when beguiled he didn't a pocket it they dressed up beautiful with flowers and ribbons after they'd been scrubbed i went in to speak to beguiledy father's dead mr beguiledy i said so so what's that to me dear soul he was a very strange man always was beguiledy tell me what i knew not child he said did you know then ah i knew thy father was gone didna he go by me on a blast of air last sunday evening crying out thin and spiteful you owe me a crown beguiledy tell me some at fresh girl new strange things now if you could say that the leaves be all fallen this day of june and my damsons ripe for market or that the mere hath dried or that man lusteth no more to hurt his love or that jancis looketh no more at her own face in plash pool there would be tellin yes but for your dad it is naught i cared not for the man and taking up his little hammer he beat on a row of flints that he had till the room was all in a charm every flint had its own voice and he knew them as a shepherd the sheep and it was his custom when the talk was not to his mind to beat out a chime upon them i came to see if we could borrow the beasts for our wagon jancis said yes you mun pay how much mister the same as for wakes a penny a head so you be taking the biddings now who did your man pay to write em parson wrote em for us and mother put a crown in the poor box dear soul the bitter waste i'd have wrote em very clear and fine for half the money i can write the tall script and the dwarf round or square red or black parson can only do the sarmon script and a very poor script it be i wish i could write master beguiledy oh you he laughed in a very peculiar way he had soft and light at the top of his head it's not for children he said but i thought about it a deal i thought it would be a fine thing to sit by the fire in the settle corner and write bidding letters and love letters and market bills or even a verse for a tombstone and to do the round or the square tall or little red or black and sermon script too if i had a mind i thought when anybody like jancis angered me by being so pretty i'd do her letters very crabbed and with no red at all but i knew that was wicked of me for poor jancis couldn't help being pretty then beguiledy went off to cure an old man's corns and jancis and i played lovers but jancis said i did it very bad and she thought gideon would do it a deal better end of book one chapter three book one chapter four of precious bane by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian torches and rosemary it was a still dewy summer's night when we buried father 
In our time, there was still a custom round about San to bury people at night. In our family, it had been done for hundreds of years. I was busy all day decking the wagon with you and the white flowering laurel that has such a heavy, sweet smell. I pulled all the white roses and the two, three pinks that were in blow and made up with daisies out of the hay grass. While I pulled them, I thought how angered father would have been to see me there trampling it, and I could scarcely help looking round now and again to see if he was coming. After we'd milked, Gideon went for the beasts, and I put black streamers round their necks, and tied yew boughs to their horns. It had to be done carefully, for they were the longhorn breed, and if you angered them, they'd hike you to death in a minute. The miller was one bearer, and Mr. Callard of Callard's Dingle, who farmed all the land between San and Plash, was another. Then there were our two uncles from beyond the mountains. Gideon, being chief mourner, had a tall hat with black streamers and black gloves and a twisted black stick with streamers on it. They took a long while getting the coffin out, for the doors were very narrow and it was a big, heavy coffin. It had always been the same at all the San funerals, yet nobody ever seemed to think of making the doors bigger. Sexton went first with his hat off and a great torch in his hand. Then came the cart, with Miller's lad and another to lead the beasts. The wagon was mounded up with leaves and branches, and they all said it was a credit to me. But I could only mind how poor father was used to tell me to take away all those nasty weeds out of the house. And now we were taking him away, jolting over the stones, from the place where he was maester. I was all of a puzzle with it. It did seem so unkind and disrespectful as well, leaving the poor soul all by his lonesome at the other end of the mere. I was glad it was sweet June weather and not dark. We were bound to go the long way round, the other being only a foot road. When we were come out of the fold yard past the mixen and were in the road, we took our places, Gideon behind the coffin by himself, then mother and me in our black poke bonnets and shawls, with prayer books and branches of rosemary in our hands. Uncles and Miller and Mr. Callard came next, all with torches and boughs of rosemary. It was a good road, and smoother than most, the road to Lullingford. Parson used to say it was made by folk who lived in the days when the Redeemer lived. Romans, the name was. They could make roads right well, whatever their name was. It went along above the water, close by the lake and as we walked solemnly onwards, I looked into the water and saw us there. It was a dim picture, for the only light there was came from the waning, clouded moon and from the torches. But you could see in the dark water something stirring and gleams and flashes, and when the moon came clear, we had our shapes like the shadows of fish gliding in the deep. There was a great heap of black, that was the wagon, and the oxen were like clouds moving far down, and the torches were flung into the water as if we wanted to doubt them. All the time, as we went, we could hear the bells ringing the corpse home. They sounded very strange over the water in the waste of night, and the echoes sounded yet stranger. Once a white owl came by, like a blown feather for lightness and softness. Mother said it was father's spirit looking for its body. There was no sound but the bells and the creaking of the wheels, till Parson's pony, grazing in the glebe, saw the dim shape of the oxen a long way off, and whinnied, not knowing, I suppose, but what they were ponies too, and being glad to think, in the lonesomeness of the night, of others like herself nearby. At last the creaking stopped at the lich gate. They took out the coffin, resting it on trestles, 
and in the midst of the heavy breathing of the bearers came the promising words, I am the resurrection and the life. They were like quiet rain after drought. Only I began to wonder, how should we come again in the resurrection? Should we come clear or dim, like in the water? Would father come in a fit of anger, as he died, or is a little boy running to grandma with a bunch of primy roses? Would mother smile the same smile, or would she have found a light in the dark passage? Should I still be fast in a body I'd no mind for, or would they give us leave to weave ourselves bodies to our own liking, out of the spinnings of our souls? The coffin was moved to another trestle by the graveside, and a white cloth put over it. Our best tablecloth it was. On the cloth stood the big pewter tankard full of elderberry wine. It was the only thing mother could provide, and it was by good fortune that she had plenty of it, enough for the funeral feast and all, since there had been such a power of elderberries the year afore. It looked strange in the doubtful moonlight standing there on the coffin when we were used to see it on the table with the colour of the Christmas brand reflecting in it. Parson came forward and took it up, saying, I drink to the peace of him that's gone. Then everybody came in turn and drank good health to father's spirit. At the coffin foot was our little pewter measure full of wine and a crust of bread with it, but nobody touched them. Then Sexton stepped forward and said, Be there a sin-eater? And mother cried out, Alas, no, woe's me, there is no sin-eater for poor San. Gideon gainsaid it. Now, it was still the custom at that time in our part of the country to give a fee to some poor man after a death and then he would take bread and wine handed to him across the coffin, and eat and drink, saying, I give easement and rest now to thee, dear man, that ye walk not over the fields, nor down the byways, and for thy peace I pawn my own soul. And with a calm and grievous look he would go to his own place. Mostly, my grandad used to say, sin-eaters were such as has been wise men or layers of spirits, and had fallen on evil days, or they were poor folk that had come through some dark deed out of the kindly life of men, and with whom none would trade, whose only food might oftentimes be the bread and wine that crossed the coffin. In our time there were none left around San. They had nearly died out, and they had to be sent for to the mountains. It was a long way to send, and they asked a big price, instead of doing it for nothing as in the old days. So Gideon said, We'll save the money. What good would the man do? But mother cried and groaned all night after, and when the sexton said, Be there a sin-eater? She cried again very pitifully, because father had died in his wrath with all his sins upon him, and besides, he had died in his boots, which is a very unkept thing and bodes no good. So she thought he had a great need of a sin-eater, and she would not be comforted. Then a strange, heart-shaking thing came to pass. Gideon stepped up to the coffin and said, there is a sin-eater. Who then? I see none, said Sexton. I'll be the sin-eater. He took up the little pewter measure full of darkness, and he looked at mother. Oot turn over the farm, and all to me, if I be the sin-eater, mother, he said. No, no, sin-eaters be accursed. What harm to drink a sup of your own wine, and chumble a crust of your own bread. But if you done a care, let be. He can go with the sin on him. No, no, leave un go free, Gideon. Let unrest, poor soul. You be in life and young, but him cold and helpless, in the power of Satan. 
he went with all his sins upon him in his boots poor soul if there's none else to help let his own lad take pity and you'll give me the farm mother yes yes my dear what be the farm to me you can take all and welcome then gideon drank the wine all of a gulp and swallowed the crust there was no sound in all the place but the sound of his teeth biting it up then he put his hand on the coffin standing up tall in the high black hat with a gleaming pale face and he said i give easement and rest now to thee dear man come not down the lanes nor in our meadows and for thy peace i pawn my own soul amen there was a sigh from everybody then like the wind in dry bents even the oxen by the gate it seemed to me sighed as they chewed the cud but when gideon said come not down the lanes nor in our meadows i thought he said it like somebody warning off a trespasser now it was time to throw the rosemary into the grave then they lowered the coffin in and all threw their burning torches down upon it and doubted them it was over at long last and we went home by the shortest way only gideon going by the road with the wagon we were a tidy few for all that had been at the church came back for the funeral feast there was the smith and the ox driver from plash farm and the shepherd from the mountain and the miller's man and a good few women as well as those i spoke of afore mother had asked tibby to mind the fire and see to the kettles for making spiced ale and posset for the air struck chill along the water at that time of night when we wrought home there was mrs beguildy as well and jancis they had a nice gladly fire and the horn of ale set upon it all ready she was a kind soul mrs beguildy but sorely misliked through being the wife of a wizard a preached against man she was never invited to weddings nor baptisms but at a burying when the harm's on the house already what ill can anybody do mrs beguildy dearly loved an outing she'd have liked to live in lullingford and keep a shop and go to church twice of a sunday and sing in the choir she'd no faith at all in her goodman's spells though she never said so except to me and a two three she knew well once a long while after this when there'd been trouble at the stone house which you'll hear of in good time when she'd quarrelled with beguildy i went in by chance and found her with lady camperdine's bottle in which he said he'd got the old lady's ghost shaking it as if it was an ill-mixed sauce so that i thought the cork would come out and shouting i'll learn ye i'll learn ye lady camperdine indeed plash water that's what's in this here bottle plash water and naught else it was seldom anybody saw mrs beguildy she was always out with the fowl or the ducks or dig in the garden or fishing she was a good fisherwoman if it hadn't been for her they'd have clemmed for beguildy never reckoned to do anything but wizardry she'd baked us a batch of funeral cakes in case we hadn't enough and she was so kind and comely being fair like jancis and plump and the posset she made was so good that everybody forgot she was the wizard's wife even parson i'm to take back the cattle my dear she said to mother hey harvest we use em a deal been you started ah been you i start to-morrow said gideon everybody looked at him tall in the doorway with a kind of power in him and it seemed to me that everybody drew away a bit as if from summit unto it parson got up to go it's to-morrow now young san he said see you do well in it and in all the to-morrows to-morrow oh to-morrow said jancis it be a word of promise 
she yawned, and all in a minute her mouth was a rose, and I knew I couldn't abide her. One song, Sexton spoke very solemn, one holy song afore we part. So we stood up about the table, where the twelve candles were guttering low, and we sang. With a turf all at your head, dear man, and another at your feet, your good deeds and your bad ones all before the Lord shall meet. There being a sight more men than women, the song sounded deep, like bees in a lime tree. Jancis and Tivy sang very clear and high, and cold too, as if they didn't a mind at all that the poor corpse lay out yonder with only turfs for company. Then there was a trampling and a traversing, and they all went out, mother standing by the door the while, doling out the funeral cakes. These were made of good sponge with plenty of egg, coffin-shaped and lapped in black-edged paper. By this the birds were singing very loud and clear, with a ringing, echoing noise. Our chimneys lay in the mere, which meant that it was sunrise. There was a cuckoo in the oak wood, and the first corncrake spoke up from the hay-grass very masterful. Gideon said, It be too late for sleep now, tomorrow be come. Let's go down into the orchard. I want to tell you what I've planned out. Little did I think, as I followed him down into the orchard, where was neither blossom nor fruit, what those plans were to mean for us all. End of Book One, Chapter Four Book One, Chapter Five of Precious Bane by Mary Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The First Swathe Falls We climbed up into the old pippin tree, where we had a favourite place between the boughs. Looking at Gideon's face among the bright leaves, I thought it was very queer to think of all those sins being on him. Ever since father was a little baby, roaring and beating on his cot of rushes, on through the time when he was a lad, taking dog's leave from church, and after, when he went cock-fighting and courting, all the evil he did, Gideon had got to carry. All his rages were Gideon's rages. Now, Prue, says Gideon, listen what I be going to tell ye. You and me has got to get on. And mother? Oh, well, mother too, but she's old. She'd like to get on, though, sure. That be neither here nor there. If we get on, she will. You and me have got to work, Prue. I am na feared o' work, I said. Well, there'll be a plenty. I want to make money on the place, a mort of money. Then, when the time's ripe, we'll sell it. Then we'll go to Lullingford and buy a house. And you shall hold up your head with the best and be a rich lady. I dunna mind all that about being rich and holding up my head. Well, you must mind, and I'll be church warden and tell the rector what to do, and say who's to go in the stocks and who's to go in the almshousen, and vote for the parliament men, and when any wench has a baby that's a love child, you'll go and scold her. I'd leave her play with the baby. Anybody can play with a baby, none but a great lady can scold. And we'll buy a grand house. I hanna put my eye on one yet, but there be time enow. And a garden with a man to see to it, and serving wenches. And the place full of grand furniture and silver plate and china. I dearly like pretty china, I said. Can we get some of them new cups and saucers from Staffordshire with little people on them? You can get anything you like, and a gold thimble and a press full of gowns into the bargain. Only you man help me first. 
It'll take years and years. But couldn't we stop at San and get just a little bit of new furniture and china and do without so many maids and men? No, there's not enough of folks at San saving at the wake and that's only once a year. What's once a year? And what use being chief if there's nobody to be chief of? Chief among ten thousand, that's a good sounding text. I'd leaf be chief among ten thousand. I wonder if it be the lightning in you, I said, makes you feel like that. I always used to think he looked as if he'd got it in him when there was anything out of the common going on. His eyes would be all of a blaze, but cold too. And he'd make you feel as if you wanted what he wanted, though you didna. Times, when he wanted to look for badger earths in the wood, he made me think I did too. And all the while, what I wanted in my own self was to go and gather primy roses. Well, it'll take a deal of lightning in the blood to do what I'm set to do, he said. The place never did more than keep us, mother says, and father left naught. Not but just enough to pay the weaver and sexton and buy the wax candles and gloves and that for the burying. Whatever shall we do if we'd only just enough for, I wondered, and father to work for us. We can never put by money, lad. I shall do what he did and a deal more beside. You never can. I can do all as I've a mind to. I've got such a power in me that naught but death can bind it. And with you to give a hand? He stopped a bit there and pulled a leaf and tore it. Being as how things are, you'll never marry, Prue. My heart beat soft and sad. It seemed such a terrible thing never to marry. All girls got married. Jancis would, Tivy would, even Miller's Polly that always had a rash or a hoose or the ringworm or summit, would get married. And when girls got married, they got a cottage and a lamp, maybe, to light when their man came home. Or if it was only candles, it was all one, for they could put them in the window, and he'd think, there's my missus now lit the candles. And then one day, Mrs. Beguiledy would be making a cot of rushes for him. And one day there'd be a babe in it, grand and solemn, and bidding letters sent round for the christening, and the neighbours coming round the babe's mother like bees round the queen. Often, when things went wrong, I'd say to myself, Near mind, Prusarn, there'll come a day when you'll be queen in your own skep. So I said, Not when, Gideon? Oh, ah, I'll wed for sure. I'm afeard nobody'll ask you, Prue. Not ask me? What for not? Because, oh, well, you'll soon find out. But you can have a house and furniture and all just the same, if you give a hand in the earning of em. But not an husband, nor a babe in a cot of rushes. No. For why? Best asked mother for why. Maybe she can tell you why the hare crossed her path. But I'm main sorry for ye, Prue, and I be going to make you a rich lady. And maybe when we've gotten a deal of gold, we'll send away for some doctor's stuff for a cure. But it'll cost a deal. And you must work well and do all I tell you. You're a tidy, upstanding girl enough, Prue. And but for that one thing... The fellows had come round like they will round Jancis. I thought about it a bit, while the water lapped on the banks at the foot of the orchard. Then I said I'd do all Gideon wanted. You man swear it, Prue, a solemn oath on the book. Maybe if you didna, you'd tire and give over soon, and I'll swear what I promised too. He went into the house to fetch the book. 
I sat still and listened to the rooks going over to the rookery at the back of the house, beyond the garden and the rickyard. They were coming back from their breakfast in the fields away toward Plash. I wanted my breakfast, too, for whoever's dead, we poor mortals clem. And as I listened to the sleepy sound of the cawing and the flapping of their wings when they came over low down, I thought it seemed a criss-cross sort of world, where you bury your father at night and straight away begin to think of breakfast and housen and gold with the first light of dawn, where you've got to go cursed all your life long because a poor silly hare looked at your mother afore you were born where a son, eating his mother's batch cake and drinking of her brewing, loads his poor soul with all his father's sins. Gideon came running back with the great book in his hands, very heavy and fastened with a silver clasp. Come down, Prue, and swear, he said. Now hold the book. I asked him if he was sure mother would give us leave to do it. Give us leave? It's not for her to give us leave. She canna hinder me. The farm be mine. Didna you hear her say so when I took the sin upon me? But will you make mother abide by that? Will folks pawn their souls for naught? Is another's sin sweet in the mouth that I should eat it save at a price? The farm be mine for ever and ever until I choose to sell it. Now swear, say, I promise and vow to obey my brother Gideon San and to hire myself out to him as a servant for no money until all that he wills be done. And I'll be as biddable as a prentice, a wife and a dog. I swear it on the holy book. Amen. So I said it. Then Gideon said, I swear to keep faith with my sister, Prue San, and share all with her when we've won through, and give her money up to fifty pounds when we've sold San to cure her. Amen. After we'd done, I felt as if San Mir was flowing right over us, and I shivered as if I'd got an ague. What ails you? says Gideon. Best go and light the fire if you be cold, and get the breakfast. We can talk while we eat. Mother's asleep. There's a deal to say yet. So I went in and lit the fire, and set the table as nice as I could, for it seemed a bit of comfort in a dark place. I wondered if it would be unfeeling to pull a few rosebuds to put in the middle, and seeing that it wasn't unfeeling to eat and drink, I thought it wouldn't hurt to pull a rose or two. When Gideon came in from the milking, we sat down, and he told me all that was in his mind. First, I was to learn to make cheese as well as butter. Then, he was going to make some wythy panniers for Bendigo, and every market day he'd ride to Lullingford with butter and eggs, cheeses and honeycomb, fruit and vegetables, and even flowers. Them roses now, he said, you could bunch em up, and they'd bring in a bet. Times they'd be dressed poultry and ducks, rabbits, fish and mushrooms. You'll see, Prue, we'll make a deal, he said. But what a journey! Thirty miles in the day? I'll plough a bit of land to grow corn for Bendigo. As for me, I'm never tired. When we've saved a bit, we're to buy another cow. She'd calve in the spring, and then there'd be two cows milking when one was dry. That'd mean more market butter. After that, we were to buy two oxen to plough and turn the flail and lug manure and save hiring big Ildes beasts. When our sow farrowed, we were to keep all the piglets and turn them loose in the oak woods, and mother was to take her knitting and mind them. Then there'd be a deal of bacon for market, over and above what we could eat. We'd only got five sheep, 
But Gideon said we'd mend that by keeping all the lambs, and so have wool to sell, and a big flock of sheep next year. Mother and me were to spin yarn all winter, and he'd sell it at the draper's, or change it for things we were bound to have at the grocer's, such as salt for curing, yeast and sugar. Soap we made ourselves out of lye. Rush lights we made too, out of fat and large dry rushes. Rye we had, and one small field of wheat. Father used to take a few sacks at a time to be ground at the mill where Tivy's uncle lived. I shall grow more corn, acres of corn, he said, and take it to the mill in the oxwain. Whatsoever the French do, corn wanna come amiss. And though it's cheap now, it wanna be if they tax it, which I hear tell is more than likely. It'll be better, a power, to have one acre under wheat then, than to be coddling about with twenty acres under aught else. We'll grow hops as well, and never be short of a drop of good ale, for though I mean to work you, Prue, I wanna clem you. Good plain food, as much as you can eat, but no falals. The rough honey after we've put by the best for market, fruit when it's cheap, bacon and taters and bread, and eggs and butter when the roads are too bad for market. I shall put up a prayer for bad roads, I said. Gideon looked at me very sharp, but seeing it was only my fun, he laughed. All right, but it'll take the devil's own weather to stop me. He'd got a plan that I should learn to do sums and keep accounts and write. I was glad, for I dearly loved the thought of being able to read books, and especially the Bible. It always worried me in church when Sexton read out of the Bible, for no matter what he read, it all sounded like a bee in a bottle. It didn't matter when he was reading, and he took unto him a wife and begat a minadab. For it was naught to me if he did. But when there were things to be read with a sound in them, like wind in the aspen tree, it seemed a pitiful thing that he should mouth it over so, being very big sorted at being able to read at all. I wanted to be able to read, or ever the silver cord be loosed, for myself, and savour it. It would be grand to be able to write too, and put down all such things as I wanted to keep in mind. So when Gideon said I was to learn, I was joyfully willing. But if Mr. Beguildy learns me, how can I pay, I said. You can dig taters for him, and give a hand in the hay, and drive plough for him now and again. Beguiled is so mortal lazy, and so big sorted with being a wise man, there's not a hand's turn of work in the man. Mooning, mooning, a salve for every sore he's got, saving for idleness. You be strong, you can pretty near dig spade for spade with me. Pay that way. And if you've a mind, you can put on your black and go and ask him this evening. He went off to the hay meadow with his scythe, and I set about my work with a will, and should have sung a bit, but called poor father to mind. It made me gladsome to be getting some education, it being like a big window opening, and out of that window who knows what you met in a sea. When I took Gideon's nooning, going through the rookery, I called to mind that we'd never told the rooks about a death in the place. It's an old, ancient custom to tell them. Folks say if you're done a, a discontent comes over them, and they fall into a melancholy and forget to come home. So, in a little while, there are your elms with the nest still like dark fruit on the sky, but all silent and deserted. And though rooks do a deal of mischief, it's very unlucky to lose them, and the house they leave never has any prosperation after. So I remembered Gideon of this, and we went to the rookery. They were the biggest elm trees I've ever seen, both common and witch elms. 
Under them it was all dimmery with summer leaves. The ground was green with celandine that had just left blowing, and enchanter's nightshade not quite in blow. The leaves were white with droppings. It was a very still hot day, with only a little breeze rocking the very tops of the trees, and a sleepy caw coming down to us time and again. I used to like to come to the rookery on days like this after tea when I'd cleaned myself, and on Ascension Day in special I liked to come and watch if they worked, for they say no rook'll work on Ascension Day, and sure enough I never saw them bring even a stick on that day, but they seemed very thoughtful and holy in their minds, sitting each in his tree like parson in pulpit. Ho, oh, rooks, shouted Gideon, father's dead, and I be maester, and I've come to say as you shall keep your housen in peace, and I'll keep you safe from all but my own gun, and you're kindly welcome to bide. The rooks peered down at him over their nests, and when he'd done, there was a sudden clatter of wings, and they all swept up into the blue sky with a great clary, as if they were considering what was said. In a while they came back and settled down very serious and quiet, so we knew they meant to bide. When we were back in the field, Gideon laughed a bit while he was wetting his scythe on the hone, and he said, I'm glad they mean stopping. I be desperate fond of rookie pie. With that he swept the scythe through the grass, thinnish and full of ox-eye daisies, and sighing with a dry sound. And because the grass was so thin, you could watch the scythe like a flash of steely light through the standing crop before the swathe fell. And it seemed to me now that it was like the deathly will of God, which is ever waiting behind us till the hour comes to mow us down, yet not in unkindness, but because it is best for us that we leave growing in the meadow, and be brought into his safe rickyard and thatched over warm with his everlasting loving kindness. End of Book One, Chapter Five. Book One, Chapter Six of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Saddle your dreams before you ride em. So soon as I'd milked, Gideon being still hard at it in the meadow, I went upstairs and put on my black, and my mob cap. I never wore it to work in, to save washing, and folk thought I was a heathen pretty near, what with no mob cap, and no shoes or stockings most of the time, but bare feet or clogs. Gideon could whittle a clog right well, and they'd be grand for doing mucky work like I did. I'd made me a sacking gown, too, short to the knee, for cleaning the beast housing in. I know everybody called me the barn door savage of San. But when I remembered the beautiful house at Lullingford that was to be, and the flowered gowns and dimity curtains and china, I didn't take it to heart much. I was very choice of my homespun gown with the crossover, and the new mob cap trimmed with little sausages made of sarsnet, very new fangled. So I did my hair in ringlets, one on each side, and two at the back, down to my waist. I was comfortable in my mind, thinking how we were going to send away for simples to make me as beautiful as a fairy. While I milked, I thought about it, and while I cleaned the styes, and while I scrubbed the kitchen quarries. Mother winnocked a bit to hear I was off to plash, for she was low and melancholy from abiding under the shadow of death. She'd been so used to humouring a tempersome man 
that she felt as restless as you do when you've just cast off the second stocking toe of a pair. She'd sit quiet a bit in the chimney corner, and you'd hear the wheel whirring softly like a little lich fowl. Then suddenly she'd give over spinning and wring her hands. That always made me think of a mole's little hands, lifted up to God when it be trapped. And she'd say, Sunday was a week, he had no bacon to his tea. Sunday was a fortnight, he didn't like the dumplings. And no wonder, for they were terrible sad, Prue. Twice I o'erboiled his eggs in the last week, and the new smock, Prue. At that she'd cry a long while. I hivered and hovered over it, Prue, so he died afore it was done. Oh, my dear, to think on it, it wanted but the shoulder pieces and the cuffs, and it would have been the best smock I ever made. But I hivered and hovered, and he couldn't abide any longer. He heard the mighty voice, child, calling among the elms out yonder. And he could not tarry for his smock, poor soul, all my stitches for naught. Now, mother, you mun finish it for Gideon, I said. It'll fit Gideon right well, for he is a fine big man, though not so broad as father. But he'll fill out. Come his eighteenth birthday, I should no wonder but he'd look right well in it. So you'd best hurry up. Well, she said, well, there's sense in that child. He took the sin to wear all his life long. He shall have the smock. She fetched Gideon's Sunday coat and took the smock out of the dresser drawer to measure it. I sent up a wish that they might be enough of a size to content her. And so they were and she quieted down again, and set off once more, whirring like a little lich fowl. But it won her for long. She gave me a look time and again while I was putting on my mittens, and said, The ringlets be right nice, Prue. And then, You've got a very tidy figure, child. And all in a minute she bent two double over the wheel, and began the old weariful cry. Could I help it if the hair crossed my path? Could I help it? Oh, mother, mother, I beseeched her, give over crying for what we can amend. I can bear to hear you cry, my dear. Mother, look ye, I don't mind at all. There, there now, my lamb. I was used to call her that because she seemed so little and so lost. There, dunna take it to heart. Listen what I'll tell you. I'd as lief have a hair shot and lip as not. With that, I ran out of the house and through the wicket and up the wood path, roaring, crying. I cried so loud that there was a whir of wings on this side and on that, and far up the glade a coney heard me and sat up in the middle of the path like a Christian with one paw held up, just as Parson does, giving the blessing. Only it was a curse that his cousin, the hare, gave me. I wonder why it cursed me so. Was it of its own free will and wish, or did the devil drive it? Did God begrudge me an husband and a cot of rushes, that he'd let it be so? In the years after, it did often seem a queer thing that I should be obliged to work weekdays and Sundays so as to earn enough money to put straight what a silly hair had put crooked. And I knew it would take a deal of money to cure a hair shotten lip. There was a kind of sour laughter in the thought of it. It called to mind the blackish autumn evenings when grouse rise from the bitter marsh and fly betwixt the withered heather and the freezing sky and laugh. Old harsh men laugh that way at the falling down of an enemy, and the good ladies of a town, 
big with stiff-flowered silks and babes righteously begotten, laughed so behind their fans when they went to the prison to see a lovely harlot whipped. With that kind of bitterness, a man might laugh when he was dying of a wound gotten in the king's cause, and one came busily in while the parson was reading the prayer for the dying, and cried out, The king doth give you an earldom, and sends you a bidding letter to his palace. Ah, those be the ways Grouse laugh, and that was how I laughed in those days. But now I sit here between the hearth and the window, with the tea brewing for one that will be home afore sundown, and the clouds standing upon the mountains, and when I laugh, I laugh easy, like the woodpecker in spring. He was ever a laugher, was the woodpecker, and a right merry laugher too. He'd fly into an elm tree and laugh to see it so green, and he'd fly into an ash and laugh to see it so bare, with only the black buds and no leaves. And then he'd fly into an oak and laugh fit to burst to see the young brown leaves. Ah, the woodpecker's a good laugher, and the laughter's sweet as a sound nut. If we can laugh so at the end of long living, we've not lived in vain. But that evening I laughed like the grouse, and my heart was rebellious within me. Yet I could not but be pleased to think of the writing. I was glad also because it would give me a hold over Gideon since if he was too harsh with mother and me, I could be a bit awkward about the writing. I ran along by the water, feeling light and easy in my best sandal shoes, thinking how I'd work to get the stuff that was to make me as beautiful as a fairy, and how in a while there'd come a lover, and the axings would be put up in church, and in another while I'd sit in my own house-place, with my foot on a rocker, and with a babe, grand and solemn, on my knee, better than all the French wax dolls they told of, that I'd never seen, but wanted very bad. I was contented to see the coots swimming about with a trail of coot chickens after them, for all the world as if they were on a string, and I laughed to see the heron that lived on the far side of the water, and had got a missus and a nest there, standing knee-deep among the lilies, fair comic-struck. In after days, I saw Gideon look like that, time and again, when he'd leaf talk to Jancis, and could not call to mind a single word, or when he'd put his best cravat on, and could not get it to his liking, looking in the glass that he'd bought out of his second wool-money, after he'd seen Jancis under the rosy light. I met Jancis before I got to the stone house. She was bringing the oxen in, because they were ordered for a fair, and the people were coming for him early in the morning. Betwixt the two white beasts, with a hand on each, with all that gold hair shining, and a face like a white rose, she looked like the ghost of a beautiful lady that died a long while ago, and came again every midsummer, and fled at cockcrow. Oh, she said, you've gotten ringlets, Prue. Shall I have ringlets for San Wake? As you please, I answered very snappy, for she was pretty enough without ringlets, and her mouth more arose than ever. I thought how rich the ringlets would look, hanging down like ripe yellow bunches of white currants, when they be traced very thick on the boughs, and she saying, Oh, and the fellows wanting to kiss her. When she'd fastened the beasts in the trevice, we went indoors. Mr. Beguildy, I called out, I want you to learn me to read and write and sum and all you know. I'm to pay in work. Gideon and me's going to get rich and buy a place in Lullingford and have maids and men, and flowered gowns for me, and china. Beguiled, he looked at me over the rim of a great measure of mead. 
Saddle your dreams afore you ride them, my wench, he said. How mean you, Mr. Beguildy? The answer's under your mob cap, says he. If I be to learn ye, there's to be no argling, no questions and no answers. I say the saying, but you mun find the meaning. Now, you come back to me a week today and tell me what I meant. And then, for a bit of a treat, I'll show you the bottle with the old squire in it. Old Camperdine, great granddad to the son, him as came again so bad every harvest home, and sang a roaring bawdy song somewhere up in the chancel, only none could see un, so none could catch un. Saving you, Beguiled he smiled. He'd got a very slow stealing smile that came like a ripple on the water and stayed a long while. Ah, saving me, I caught em proper. What way did you? If I told you, Prusan, you'd know as much as me. But do tell how you got him into the bottle. Dear to goodness, you've forgotten the bargain. No questions. He picked up the hammer and beat upon the row of flints, making out a little tune. And with that, in came Mrs. Beguildy, like the dancing woman at the fair comes in, when they sound the drum. She'd got a basket of trout, and a couple of fowl she was going to dress for the wake the oxen were going to. She'd got on an old bottle green hat of Beguildy's, tall in the crown, such as gentlemen of the road were partial to then, and it looked very outlandish atop her frizzy grey hair. Did you hear tell, she said to me, she'd got a deep solemn voice, and as she was too busy to speak often, everything she said seemed very weighty, as if the town crier said it, standing on the steps of the market in his braided coat. I hear as the devil was dead, said Beguildy, but it inna true, for I met un yestereen, and very pleasant spoken he was indeed, and right pleased to have your father's company, Prue. Now hush your gabble, said Mrs. Beguildy, pulling the feathers out of the fowl in handfuls, so that the room was like a snowstorm. Did you hear tell, Prue, as poor John Weaver strayed off the road going through the woods in the dark of the moon last night, and was drowned in black mere? Death's very catching, poor soul. Why, it wanted but an hour to dawn when he left, I said. Time enow, time enow. It's dark as Egypt in the woods down yonder. Who'll take his place? They say in there's a nephew learning the trade, but he's bound apprentice for a year or two. They'll make shift with a higher mon, I reckon. And it had be better, a power, burst out Mrs. Beguildy, if you took that sort of job. She took the poker from the fire and singed the fowl very shrewdly, as if it met a bean Beguildy. Woman, I've better things to think on than weaving weeds to cover the poor dying body. Dunna I snare souls like conies and keep em from troubling the lives of men? Canna I bless and they are blessed, curse and they are cursed? Canna I cure warts and the chin cough and the barrenness and the rheumatics and tell the future and find water though it be in the depth of the earth? None of the fowls I bless beat all other fowls in the cockfighting. Ah, and if I chose, I could make a waxen man for every man in the parish and consume them away, wax, men and all. Can I do all that, woman? So you say, my dear. Mrs. Beguildy set the fowl's legs to rights and ran a skewer through to make all safe. Seeing that the wizard was becoming very angry, I told his missus how I was going to be his scholar, and he was to learn me to spell and write. 
Will your headpiece stand it, child? she asked, for she always thought in common with many people that if there was anything wrong with a person's outward seeming, there must be somewhat wrong with their minds as well. By that measure, Jancis, who was so silly that oftentimes she appeared to be well-nigh simple, would be a very clever woman. Ah, Prue's headpiece be right in now, said Begaldi. Only I do think there be too many questions in it. But her'll fettle into a good scholar, will Prue? We'll start to days a week, Prue. Jancis, you can get the besom and sweep out my room a bit. Put the two three books together, gather me some quills, and be very careful of all my bottles, for you never know who's in them. We dunna want any frittening about the place. Oh, and you met as well turn them toads out from behind the locker. They be all dead. Prue, says Jancis, when I went out, if you tell me the way to make ringlets like that, I'll tell you what Feather's old riddle me re means. I know, because he's said it over and over, and I've heard untell the answer. I made em round and round the poker, my dear, I said, not too hot, and give it a good clean first. But you needna tell me the answer to the riddle me re, for I'd liefer find it out. The dew came showering onto my gown as I went past the bushes of wild roses at the wood gate, spilling out of the hearts of the blossoms. It was so quiet that I could hear the sheep cropping across the corner of the mere in the glebe, and the fish rising out in the middle, and the water lapping against the big stiff leaves of the bulrushes. I felt like a lady walking out in my best on a weekday. It was not often that I could be spared, and it was to be a deal less often now. So I was glad Gideon wanted me to be a scholar, for once every week, I should get the afternoon and evening off. When a breeze came, the leaves lapped up the silence like the tongues of little creatures drinking. Up in heaven there were clouds like the bit of lace on mother's wedding gown, and a setting moon as green as a young beech leaf. And down under the polished water was another moon, not quite so bright, and other clouds, not quite so lacy, and the shadow of the spire, very faint and ghostly, pointing across the water at us. End of Book One, Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven of Precious Bane by Mary Webb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Padrian. Pippins and Jargonelles Mother looked up when I went in. She was stitching the smock. What a big girl you look coming in, Prue, she said. And you not near sixteen yet. I asked where Gideon was. Cutting by moonlight. Such a lad I never saw, labours and sweats as if summat was after un. Well, the moon's setting down behind the church croft now, mother, I said, so he'll be bound to give over. I went to the meadow. He'd got as much cut as a full-grown man could ha' done. He was rubbing the scythe down with a handful of grass and honing it for putting away as I came over the field. I thought it sounded nice, coming over the wet, dimmery swathes, and sad as well. When I called to mind all the things he'd taken on shoulder, I was sorry for un. Come thy ways in to supper, Gideon, I said. By gum, you look like a ghost stealing out from under the dark hedge, all in your blacks with that white face. Then he seemed to remember him of all we'd got in hand. He began to cross-wound me about the work. Shut the fowl up? No, be quick about it then. It should have been done this hour. 
Look the traps? No, I thought you would. When I'm mowing, I canna do aught else, save in the jobs that are too heavy for you. There been a many of them. When you've done the fowl and the traps, you can set a two three night lines in the mere. I've got some sawing to do yet. It'll take a terrible long while, and I'm no good at setting the night lines, I said, nearly crying, being tired already, and it late, and another day's work beginning, seemingly. Did you make a bargain or didn't you? Ah, I did, Gideon. Then abide by it. Wandering about the place when mother was abed and Gideon in the fields, I felt lonesome. I wished there was some shorter way to be as beautiful as a fairy. Then a thought came to me all of a sudden. I wonder it didn't come afore, but then I'd never much minded having a hair lip afore. It seemed to me that often it's only when you begin to see other folks minding a thing like that for you that you begin to mind it for yourself. I make no doubt, if Eve had been so unlucky as to have such a thing as a hair lip, she'd not have minded it till Adam came by, looking doubtfully upon her, and the Lord frowning on his marred handiwork. Now my thought was this, why shouldn't I, that was in sore need of healing, do as the poor folk did here at San in times past, and even now and again in our own day? namely at the troubling of the waters which comes every year in the month of august to step down into the mere in sight of all the folk at the wake dressed in a white smock it was said that this troubling of the water was the same as that which was at bethesda and though it had not the power of that water which healed every year and for which no disease was too bad it being in that marvellous holy land where miracles be daily bred, yet every seventh year it was supposed to cure one, if the disease was not too deadly. You must go down into the water fasting, and with many curious ancient prayers. These I could learn, when I could read, for they were in an old book the parson kept in the vestry. Not that he believed it, nor quite disbelieved it, but only that it was very rare and strange. The thing I misdoubted most was it being such a public thing. I had need be a very brazen piece to make a show of myself thus, as if I were a harlot in a sheet, or a witch brought to the ducking-stool. And sure enough, when I spoke of it timidly to mother and Gideon, they liked it not at all. What, says Gideon, Make yourself a nay word and a show to three hundred folk. You met as well go for a fat woman at the fair, and had done with it. Only, I am na fat, I said. That's neither here nor there. You'd be making yourself a talked-about wench, from Sarn to Lullingford, and from Plash to Brampton. Going down into the water, the like of any poor plagued o man, without a farden. Folks had say, there's San sister, darked into the water like poor folk was used to do, because San's too near to get the doctor's mon, let alone the doctor. And when I went to the market, they'd laugh, turning their faces aside. Never shall you do such a brassy thing. It'd be better, a power, if you took and made some mint cakes and spiced ale for the fair when the time comes, like mother was used to do. You'd make a bit that way. Yes, my dear, said mother, you do as San says. It'll bring in a bit, and you'll see all as is to be seen, which you couldna, saving in the way of business, for it'll be scarce two months from father's death. And come to think of it, what an unkind thing it would be for a poor widow to have it flung in her face, afore such a mort of people, that her girl had got a hair shot in lip. She began to wring her hands, and I knew she'd go back to the old cry in a minute, so I gave in. You've got to promise me you'll never do such a thing, Prue, ordered Gideon. I promise for this year, but no more. 
You've got a powerful cursed will of your own, Prue, but promise or no, you shanna do such a thing, never in life shall you. And in death I shanna mind, I said, for if I do well and go to heaven, I shall be made all new, and I shall be as lovely as a lily on the mere. And if I do ill and go to hell, I'll sell my soul a thousand times, but I'll buy a beautiful face, and I shall be gladsome for that, though I be damned. And I ran away into the attic and cried a long while. But the quiet of the place and the loneliness of it comforted me at long last, and I opened the shutter that gave on the orchard and had a great pear tree trained around it. And I took my knitting out of my reticule, for it was on a Saturday after tea that I had spoken of the troubling of the water, and the week's work being nearly done, I had my tidy gown on and the reticule to match. Sitting there looking into the green trees, with the smell of our hay coming freshly on the breeze, mixed with the scent of the wild roses and meadows sweets in the orchard ditch, I hearkened to the blackbirds singing near and far. When they were a long way off, you could scarcely disentangle them from all the other birds, for there was a regular charm of them, thrushes and willow wrens, seven-coloured linnets, canbotlins, finches and writing maesters. It was a weaving of many threads, with one maester thread of clear gold, a very comfortable thing to hear. I thought maybe love was like that, a lot of coloured threads and one maester thread of pure gold. The attic was close under the thatch, and there was many nests beneath the eaves and a continual twittering of swallows. The attic window was in a big gable and the roof on one side went right down to the ground, with a tall chimney standing up above the roof tree. Somewhere among the beams of the attic was a wild bee's nest, and you could hear them making a sleepy, soft murmuring, and morning and evening you could watch them going in a line to the mere for water. So, it being very still there, with the fair shadows of the apple trees peopling the orchard outside, that was void as were the near meadows, Gideon being in the far field making haycocks which I also should have been doing, there came to me, I cannot tell whence, a most powerful sweetness that had never come to me afore. It was not religious, like the goodness of a text heard at a preaching. It was beyond that. It was as if some creature made all of light had come on a sudden from a great way off and nestled in my bosom. On all things there came a fair, lovely look, as if a different air stood over them. It is a look that seems ready to come sometimes on those gleaming mornings after rain, when they say, so fair the day, the cuckoo is going to heaven. Only this was not of the day, but of summit beyond it. I cared not to ask what it was, for when the nuthatch comes into her own tree, she dunna ask who planted it, nor what name it bears to men. For the tree is all to the nuthatch, and this was all to me. Afterwards, when I had mastered the reading of the book, I read, His banner over me was love. And it called to mind that evening. But if you should have said, Whose banner? I could not have answered. And even now, when Parson says, it was the power of the Lord working in you, I'm not sure in my own mind. For there was naught in it of churches, nor of folks praying nor praising, sinning nor repenting. It had to do with such things as birdsong and daffodowndillies rustling, knocking their heads together in the wind and it was as willful in its coming and going as a breeze over the standing corn. It was a queer thing, too, that a woman who spent her days in sacking, cleaning styes and beasthausen, living hard, considering over fardens, should come of a sudden into such a marvel as this. For though it was so quiet, it was a great miracle, 
and it changed my life. For when I was lost for something to turn to, I'd run to the attic, and it was a core of sweetness in much bitter. Though the visitation came but seldom, the taste of it was in the attic all the while. I had but to creep in there and hear the bees making their murmur, and smell the woody, oh, a sweet scent of capped apples, and hear the leaves rasping softly on the window frame, and watch the twisted grey twigs on the sky, and I'd remember it and forget all else. There was a great wooden bolt on the door, and I was used to fasten it, though there was no need, for the attic was such a lost and forgotten place nobody ever came there but the travelling weaver and Gideon in apple harvest and me. Nobody would ever think of looking for me there, and it was parlour and church both to me. The roof came down to the floor all round, and all the beams and rafters were oak, and the floor went up and down like stormy water. The apples and pears had their places, according to kind, all round the room. There were codlins and golden pippins, brown russets and scarlet crabs, biffins, nonpareils and queenlings, big green bakers, permains and red streaks. We had a mort of pears too, for in such an old garden, always in the family, every generation will put in a few trees. We had Worcester pears and butter pears, jargonelle, bergamot and good Christian. Just after the last gathering, the attic used to be as bright as a church window, all reds and golds, and the colours of the fruit could always bring my visitation back to me, though there was not an apple or pear in the place at the time, because the colour was wed to the scent, which had been there time out of mind. Every one of those round red cheeks used to smile at poor Prue San, sitting betwixt the weaving frame and the window, all by her lonesome. I found an old locker, given up to the mice, and scrubbed it, and put a fastening on it, and kept my ink and quills there, and my book and the Bible, which mother said I could have, since neither she nor Gideon could read in it. One evening in October, I was sitting there, with a rushlight, practising my writing. The moon blocked the little window, as if you took a salver and held it there. All round the walls the apples crowded, like people at a fair waiting to see a marvel. I thought to myself that they ought to be saying to one another, Be still now, hush your noise, give over jostling. I fell to thinking how all this blessedness of the attic came through me being cursed. For if I hadn't had a hair lip to frighten me away into my own lonesome soul, this would never have come to me. The apples would have crowded all in vain to see a marvel, for I should never have known the glory that came from the other side of silence. Even while I was thinking this, out of nowhere suddenly came that lovely thing and nestled in my heart, like a seed from the core of love. End of Book One, Chapter Seven Book Two, Chapter One of Precious Bane by Mary Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Riding to Market In telling this story, I take little count of time, for when the heart is in stress, what is time? It is naught. Does the bridegroom that has clemmed for his love a long while hearken to the watchman's voice telling over the hastening hours? Does he that dies in the dawn care to what hour the dial points when the sun arises that rises not on him and when we poor beings take up our stand against all the might of the things that be 
striving to win through to our peace, or to what we think is our peace, when we are dumbfounded like a baited creature in the bullring, then we forget time. So four years went by, and though a deal happened out in the world, naught happened to us. Rumours came to us of battles over sea and discontents at home. The French went to Russia and never came back, save a few. At last, one golden summer evening, there came one riding all in a lather to tell of the great victory of Waterloo. But the news Gideon liked best, which came in the same year, was the news of the corn tax. Fetch me a mug of the home brewed, Prue, he shouted, when he wrought home from market and told me. It's the best news ever we had. We'll be rich in it a three years. We must get more land under corn. I thought corn would never come amiss, but I did not hope for anything like this'll be. When Callard came up to my stall with the tidings, I was fair comic struck. Dang me, I says. What, I says, make the furriners pay to lug their corn to us? Ah, that's the size of it, says Callard, and that'll make it scarce, Seester, and that'll make it dear, Seester. Why, mon, I've seen that this long while, I says, but I never thought they'd do it. And what do you think I did then, Prue? Why? I axed unto the mug of cider and stood on a drink. So you can tell how comic struck I must have been. And now all we've got to do is to drive plough, both of us. So there was a prospect of living harder than we had in the four years gone, when we'd slaved from daybreak to dark, and in the dark too, by the wandering light of the horn lantern. It would not come so hard to me if it hadn't been all for the money, if I could have been a bit house-proud, and if Gideon had taken a pride in fettling the farm. But there was none of that. It was just scrat and scrape to get the money out of the place and be off. I grew as lanky as a clothes prop, and Mother began to show signs of wringing her hands about that too. For being little herself, and Mrs. Beguildy and Jancis and most of the women about being little, it seemed meet to mother that a woman should be small. So when I grew and grew, and was very slender also, for, indeed, with such a deal of work and little time to eat, anybody would be slender, she said I was like a poplar in an unthinned woodland, or an o'er-tall bulrush in the mere and I got used to being ashamed of my tallness as well as the other trouble, until, but I manna be too forward with the tale. Gideon wore his smock and looked right well in it. He was two and twenty now, a man grown, very personable, broad in the shoulder with a firm, well-knit figure. As his body set, his mind set with it, harder than ten days' ice. He'd no eye for the girls at market, though there was a many looked at him. And once at market, when he was wearing father's blue coat with the brass buttons, Squire Camperdine's daughter, not the squire in the bottle, but his great-grandson, came riding past his booth and smiled at him. But Gideon would only laugh when I questioned him and stroke his chin and look at me warily. There was no doubt he was a very comely man, and it used to seem to me unfair that it was me and not Gideon that was born after the hare looked at mother, for Gideon could have grown what they call a mustachio and looked very well, and none need have known he'd got a hair shotten lip. But with me it was past hiding. As to the farm, it was doing pretty well, We'd got a big flock of sheep, so that the shearing took us above a week. We'd got a herd of pigs that kept mother busy all the time the acorns lasted, tending them in the oak wood. The grass meadow by the orchard was under wheat, 
but we had no good of it the first year, for the wheat sprouted and acaspired in the ear, it being a very wet season. There was enough saved to buy two oxen for ploughing and other heavy work about the place. Being a bit out of fashion, they were not very dear. Gideon said that when he went to buy them, I could go too and give a hand driving them back, and I could look in the shop windows while he haggled over the beasts, and then we could look at the house he'd set his mind on buying when it should come into the market. But mother must know naught about the house, or she'd tell folk, and if they thought I had such a thing in mind, they'd bant all my prices and double all their own, and where should we be then, said Gideon. You may guess I was glad to be going pleasuring, for I'd scarcely been away from San since father died, and Lullingford always seemed a wonderful place to me. I was in the cornfield leasing when Gideon said it, he being just back from market, coming across the field in the last light of evening, and the shadows of him and Bendigo stretched away over the grass from the far gate to the orchard as I watched them come. But how'll I go, I asked. I canna ride pillion, for there be the panniers. If you'll do a bit extra leasing, I'll hire the mill pony when I take the next corn to be ground. Going to plash for a lesson tomorrow? Ah, then fetch back the beasts, oot, and I'll go with corn Saturday. But I've leased till there's scarce an ear left in any part of this field or the other, I said. Ask Beguildy to let you lease his. I saw them lugging their corn. But Jancis and Mrs. Beguildy, you know very well, Jancis is too bone idle to pick up as much as an ear. Though I like her right well, and as for looks... He stopped, and stood with his hand on Bendigo's neck, gazing away to where Plash shone like bright honey in the long light, dreaming. It was but seldom Gideon sat still, and very seldom he gave his mind to any thought but the thought of making money. But the name of Jancis would often quieten him, and when he fell into one of his silences, he would make me think of a tranced man that was once brought to Beguildy to be awakened and he made me think of a brooding summer tree on a windless day, minding its own thoughts above the water. He was like the lichgate yew that dreams the year long and keeps its dream as secret as it keeps its red fruit under the boughs. Gideon had been used to fall into a dream like this ever since he saw Jancis under the rosy light. Times he'd mutter, no, no, and shift his shoulders as though from a weight, and bestir himself, and be more of a driver than ever. For Gideon was a driver if ever there was one, and what he drove was his own flesh and blood. It seemed a pity to me that a young man should be so set in his ways, and have no pleasant times, for I was mighty fond of Gideon. I knew well where he went of a Sunday, when he took off his smock and put on the bottle blue coat. He was a deal more regular at Plash than ever he was at church. The rosy light started it, but it would likely have been the same anyway. Mrs. Beguildy told me how he'd come and knock, and Jancis would run to the door in her best gown and a ribbon or a flower in her hair and go red and white by turns. And I saw for myself too when she came to our place how she would pant under her kerchief, and I wondered how this might be. For Gideon was just Gideon to me, but to her he was fire and tempest and the very spring, and his voice was as the voice of the mighty God. He'd come in, Mrs. Beguildy said, with no word, and he'd sit down, and beguiled he would scowl, having no mind for Jancis to marry. He'd scowl from the innermost chimney corner, for he felt the cold very bad, living in such a damp place, and being a very stay-at-home man. And Gideon would scowl back. 
Jancis blushed and trembled over her spinning, taking sideways looks at Gideon as a wren will, and Mrs. Beguiledy set her face like a flint, and laid plans to get her good man out of the kitchen. She dearly loved to see a bit of lovering going on, being short of summer to think of and talk of. She wanted to be a granny too. So she'd go to any length, but she'd get Beguiledy out of the room. Once, when Gideon was a-glowering more than common, being very desirous to kiss Jancis because she'd put on some new ribbon or what not to set her off, and when Mrs. Beguiledy had called her man and come back and argued and gone out and called again, but still he only sat there like a goblin in the dark of the fire, she even went as far as to set light to the thatch on the barn. Ah, she did. She was a very strong-minded woman. And she kept the poor man who couldn't abide any work with his hands, running to and again with buckets all evening. When he'd nearly doubted one place, she set light to another, while he was still dipping water from the lake. I kept the flint in the tinder right hot, my dear, she said to me, and she laughed. I never saw a woman laugh more lungeously over anything than she did over that. She said she took a peep at the window just to encourage her and she could see through the clear bits in among the bottle glass that they were sitting side by side on the settle. Very right and proper, says she, and runs back to her work. Another time she loosed the sow and it made straight for our oak wood, she having taken it there afore. Beguiled he liked his rasher, and the sow meant many a bacon pig, so for fear she should come to harm, he took stick and went after her, cursing considerable. After a bit he began to be suspicious, because any ill that came, came on a Sunday, and he liked his day of rest, though he was a heathen man. So he said to Gideon, there's no luck with you. When you come, harm brews. Keep off. So he had to give over going. Then he wiled Jancis into the woods, and I'd see them going up the dim ways. Rainy or frosty was no matter. She with her face like a white rose, shining, and he looking down at her, loving and angered to be loving. When they were in the woods, Mrs. Beguiledy was so interested in the wizard's bottles with the ghost in them, so he said, that he'd have hard work to answer her questions, and she'd give him such a tea that it lasted nearly to supper. But he found out. He began to wonder why Jancis had taken such an affection for Tivy, it being Tivy she said she went to see. And as he couldn't speak to Sexton, being at daggers drawn, he followed her one evening unbeknown, and when she got home he lathered her so that her eyes were red for weeks, and she came running to Gideon all bedraggled with tears. He was in a rage with Beguiledy, and he told Jancis he'd leave wed with her, only not till he'd won through and was rich, for how could he get along, he said, with a helpless one like Jancis clinging to him, and a tribe of children very likely but he was moody and troubled in mind, for he could see Jancis but seldom, beguiled he being so watchful. I thought maybe the plan to show me the house he wanted was to comfort himself and strengthen his will, because he was afraid of giving in. He wanted to give in, mind you, for he was sore set on Jancis, only he was fixed, and when he was fixed, he could not let himself give in, not if it was ever so. It turned out that we couldn't borrow the mill pony for a good few weeks, because she'd gone lame. So the harvest was long over, winter upon us, and Christmas drawing nigh, when they sent a message to say we could have the loan of it for the Christmas market, for they'd just bought one of the old horses from the Lullingford and Silverton coach, and they would drive that to market themselves. I may say I was very pleased to think of the outing, and watched the weather very anxiously, for it boded snow. 
I was up at four on market day, setting the place to rights for mother, and getting the things together for market. Eggs and dressed fowl we had in plenty, and greens and apples, and a bit of butter. Polishing the apples in the attic, peace came upon me, as it ever did up there, since the time I told of. While the rushlight flickered in the cold air, and the mice scuttled, I stood at the open window that was like an oblong of black paper. No sound came in, naught stirred outside. Even the mirror was frozen round the edges, so that the ducks must go skating every morning afore they could come at the water. The world was all so piercing still that it was almost like a voice crying out. It was used to seem to me that when the world was so quiet, it was like being along of somebody as knew you very well. Ah, like being with your dear acquaintance. Down in the dark barn the cock crew, thin and sweet, and I thought it sounded like no earthly bird, but maybe that was because I was in the attic, where things were always new. You may think it strange that a woman like me should think such things, being one that worked with my hands always, at poor, harsh tasks, whereas you'd expect such thoughts to come to fine ladies sitting at their tapestry work. But I was so lonesome, and had such a deal of time for thinking, and what with that, and the book learning I was getting, all sorts of thoughts grew up in my mind, like the flowering rushes and forget-me-nots coming in blow, in a poor marshy place, that else had naught. And I can never see that it did much harm, for the thoughts seldom came but in the attic, and they did never make me dreamy over my work. So now, hearing the clear sound of our gamecock crying out upon the dawn, that was yet more than two hours away, I ran downstairs all of a lantern puff to get the breakfast. When Gideon came in, it was all ready, and a great fire roaring, for we need never stint of wood at Sarn, which was much to be thankful for at a time when many poor families in England must herd together six or seven in one cottage to boil their kettles all on one fire. I was always thankful for our plenteous wood, that cost naught, and need not take up too much of Gideon's time neither, for if I burned more than he cut, I could make shift to chop it myself. We were as snug as could be, sitting in the merry firelight, with a red glow shining on the quarries, and the ware and the spinning wheels in the corner. I was pleased to think mother wasn't a to be lonesome, for I'd asked Tivy to come and keep her company since I never could enjoy anything if one I loved was lonesome or sad. Shaking the cloth out of the door after it got light, I could see her red cloak coming along under the dark woods. For as Tivy never did anything, nor thought anything, she had all her time to herself, as you met say, and so she had no cause to be late. Gideon had roughed Bendigo and the mill pony overnight, so all being ready, and the sun just risen, we set off. All the lake was full of red lights, as if our farm was on fire reflected in the water. The black pines stood with their arms out, dripping with hoar-frost, all white over, so that the tips of their drooping branches were like your fingers when you take them from the suds. The rooks were very contented, cawing soft and pleasant, as if they knew their breakfast was ready so soon as our ploughland thawed a bit, and in the stackyard there was a great murmuration of starlings. "'Bring me a fairing,' screams Tivy from across the water. Gideon looked sullen, and I knew the only fairing he'd a mind to bring was one for Jancis. So I called out, I will. What shall it be? A bit of cherry-coloured sarsnet to tie up my hair, she calls. For though she was a foolish piece in most things, she knew very well she'd got pretty curls, bright brown and thick. She'd toss them ever so when Gideon was there, 
and take every chance to miscall Begaildi, though she durst na say anything against Jancis, for fear Gideon might blaze out. But she was clever enough in this, as oftentimes a stupid girl is when she's in love, and she could always make it seem a very poor, ill-liking sort of thing to be sweet on a wizard's wench and a grand thing to be in love with the sexton's daughter, whose dad could mouth texts as fast as the wizard could mouth charms. It was a grand morning, very crispy underfoot, with more fowl about, especially widgeon. We were riding to the hills, across the far woods and the rough moors beyond, and the bits of ploughland here and there, and the frosty stubble where partridges ran from the noise of the trotting, we could see the hills as blue as pansies. Promising hills, they seemed to me. There was a clatter in the spinney, and a flock of wood pigeons got up and took their flight, with wings flashing blue in the sun, for the same hills. It was as if some wonderful thing was there, as it might be a healing well, or some other miracle, or a holy person such as there were of old time. I said as much to Gideon, but he was looking away over shoulder to Plash, and the long spire of blue smoke going up from the stone house. He began to whistle below his breath, for he'd never whistle outright, even at the merriest, but always very quiet and to his mommets. So I said no more, and in a while our old road ended, and we came into the main road where it was bad going, for whatever the weather was, the road the Romans made was good going, and even better than the turnpike. In a little we passed the milk folk going soberly along, and then a two or three more, and soon we were riding up the hill into the town, with the plovers crying about us in their winter voices. So we rode to Lullingford to look upon a dream, for the house we were about seeing was woven in the dream of Gideon's life. The house, that is, along with what it meant, the maids and the men, the balls and the dinners with the gentry at the mug of cider at election time. When we were going through the ford as you come into the lower part of the place, Gideon said, I wish Jancis was riding pillion with me. Why, so she shall, I said, the very next time we come. Why shouldna she come every time? There be beguiledy. Oh, beguiledy, I'll wile un with his own spells, and charm un with his own charms, I said, and I laughed as we went up the narrow street, so that heads came out of windows here and there to see what it might be. Hush now, girl, says Gideon, laugh quiet, not like a wild curlew. But a curlew's very good company, and a pleasanter voice I seldom heard and I'm pleased with the compliment, lad. And indeed I was pleased with the world and all, for there was summit about Lullingford, as if a different air blew there, and as if there was a brighter sun and a safer day. I knew not what it was. It was a quiet place, though not near so quiet as now. Folks go off to the cities these days, But when I was young, they gathered together from many miles around into the little market towns. Still, it was quiet and very peaceful, though not with the stillness of San. That was almost deathly times. There was one broad street of black and white houses, jutting out above and gabled, and made into rounded shop windows below. They stood back in little gardens. At the top of the street was the church, long and low, with a tremendous high steeple, well carved and pleasant to see. Under the shadow of the church was the big, comfortable inn, with its red sign painted with a tall blue mug of cider. It had red curtains in the windows, and a glow of firelight in the winter, and it seemed to say, in being so nigh the church, that its landlord's conscience was clear and his ale honest, and that none would get more than was good for him there, but of the last I a little doubt. 
of a Sunday, the shops had each a bit of white canvas hung afore the window, like an apron, which made it seem very pious and respectable. There were few shops, and only one of each kind, so you could never run from one to another, cheapening goods. There was the green canister, where they kept groceries and spools and pots and pans, and there was the maltsters and the butchers and the bakers, for Lullingford was well up with the times, since it was not all towns could boast a baker in days when nearly everybody baked at home. Then there was the leather shop, for boots and harness, and the tailor's, which was only open in winter, for in summer he travelled round the country doing piecework. There was the smithy, too, where the little boys crowded after dame school every winter dusk, begging to warm their hands and roast chestnuts and taters. It was a pleasant thing to see the sparks go up, roaring, and to feel the hearty glow about you, warming you to the heart's core, with nothing to pay or to do, like love. Nearby the smithy was the row of little cottages where was the weavers. Like the tailor, he went abroad over the countryside in summer, and sometimes to a village in winter, if it was open weather. But in hard weather he stayed in his snug slip of a house, and heard the wind roaring over from the mountains north to the mountains south. I never could tell why this cottage drew me, even from a child. It had a narrow garden, and a walk of red brick, an oaken paling, and bushes of lavender on either side the walk. Three well-whitened steps led up to the door, and there was a window of many little panes, not bottle glass. Above was another window. At the back, a patch of garden ran down to the meadows, and there was a second window in the living room that looked over this garden and the meadows to the mountains. This I knew, because I went there once with a message in the old weaver's time. Upon the front of the house was a vine, very old and twisted. This was a rare thing in a place of such hard winters, but the town was sheltered by the mountains, and the weaver's house faced south, so the vine throve, and though in cold seasons the grapes did not always ripen, in some years they ripened very well. What with the vine and the lavender and the pleasant shadows on the strip of green lawn and the lilac tree that stood beside the door, and what with the great weaving frame in the living room, which was comfortable with firelight shining on brasses and copper vessels, and very well kept, what with it all, I could never pass it without a look of longing. I was used to envy the fat thrushes hopping on the lawn. It drew me as heaven draws the poor sinner, weary of his miry wanderings. So today, as we rode by, I said, Gideon, what is it makes that house different to the other housen? It in a different. Oh, but it's as different as if it was builded of stone fetched from another world, I cried out. It's as different as if the timbers were felled in the forests of the better land. Dear to goodness, girl, you've been raving, says he. Hushed, or the beadle'll put you in pound. So I hushed, and we came to the mug of cider, and after turning our beasts in among the rest, we set out our goods in the market. End of Book Two, Chapter One Book Two, Chapter Two of Precious Pain by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Mug of Cider. The market was in the open, in a paven square by the church. Each had his own booth, and the cheeses stood in mounds between. There were a sight of old women in decent shawls and cotton bonnets, selling the same as we had, butter and eggs and poultry. 
There was a stall for gingerbread and one for mince pies. There was a sunbonnet stall and a toy stall, and one for gewgaws such as strings of coral and china cats, shoe buckles and amulets and beaded reticules. It was a merry scene, with the bright holly and mistletoe, the cheeses yellow in the sun, and the gingerbread as brown and sticky as chestnut buds. The butcher stood at his door, which gave on to the marketplace, shouting his meat, and holding up a long shining knife, enough to make you think the French were coming. There was a woman selling hot potatoes and pig's fry and a crockman who put up his wares to auction, and every time the clock chimed he broke some at, keeping some seconds in readiness, which served to amuse the people. Then the mummers came along and gave us a treat, and in one corner the beast leech was pulling teeth out for a penny each, and had a crowd watching. What with them all shouting, and the mummers mouthing their parts, and the crash of broken china, and beasts lowing and bleating from the fair ground close by, and the chimes ringing out very sweet at the half hours, you may think there was a cheerful noise. When we'd got rid of our goods, we went into the mug of cider for a snack. Ten or a dozen old men sat without, though the air was so nipping that they must have been starved. Each one was holding a great pewter tankard, and they were roaring out at the top of their voices, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not fear. Each one went his own way, and made his own tune, and I thought how angered Mr. Beguiledy would be if he could hear em making such an untuneful sound, for he was very particular over his row of flints and when he struck them he was troubled if they didn't strike the note true. But when we were come by these old ancients, every one held his mug where it was, and stopped in his singing, and so sat with his mouth open and his eyes fast on me. They were like those new-fangled mommet shows with the little dolls that stop altogether when the showman unhands them. There they sat, with the inn behind them, and the frosty sunshine on their old, red, veiny faces, and a kind of frittened look. As we passed the bench, every head of them came round slow, and the score or so of eyes stared slantwise over the rims of their cups, as young owls will stare and turn their heads, watching you over their feathers. As we went through the dark doorway, with its door studded with nails like a prison, and came into the inn parlour, where sat the more genteel, I saw their looks fasten on me too, but more shyly. The farmers and their ladies, and two or three folk that had come by the early coach and were baiting there, and the squire's son, who was a parson in Silverton, and was on the way home for Christmas, and was taking some refreshment because his nag had cast a shoe, all of them looked up, quiet and careful, but very curious at me. All on a sudden I knew that all these folks, the grand ones within, and the old fellows without, were staring at my hair shotten lip. They were thinking, according to their station and their learning, Here's a queer, outlandish creature. This is a woman out of a show, sure to goodness. Here be a wench turns into a hare by night. Hers a witch, an ugly hair shotten witch. Maybe in the two three times I'd come to Lullingford in the past, they'd stared so, but then I was but a child and didna see. I could hear the old men without croaking like a lot of rooks, and one said, Dunna drink while she's by, it'll pison your innards. Another said, Dunna look upon the bagel, her'll put the evil eye on you, you'll dwine and dwine away. The folk inside looked at each other, and I wished I could die, for all the bitter cold and my thin gown, and us being far from the fire, I was all in a swelter. For indeed I loved my kind, and would lief they had loved me, and I felt a friendliness for the drovers and for the gentry, and the host and his missus, 
for they were part of my outing and part of Lullingford and of the world that ever seized my heart in its hands as a child will hold a small bird which is both affrighted and comforted to be so held. I would lief have ridden forth and seen new folk, new roads, new hamlets, children playing on strange village greens, unknown to me as if they were fairies. Come there I knew not whence nor how, singing their songs and running away into the dusk. Old folk wending their way along paths in meadows of which I knew not so much as the name of the owner to churches deep in trees with all the bells a-ringing pulled by men i never saw afore ah i should dearly have liked that only the gist of it must ever be that the old folk looked kind as they saw me go by and the children smiled or threw me a blossom and that when i came to inn or tavern they'd say draw in to the fire now dear art for night thickens ah I dearly her liked that. This made it all the more a shocking thing to me that the real world was thus toward me, for living so apart I had not truly felt my grief afore. But now I knew that I was fast bound in misery and iron, as the book saith. Ah, prisoned beyond a door, to which the great nailed door of the inn was but paper. As I was bending over my plate, so that my bonnet might hide the tears, a lady came in. She was a handsome piece, if ever there was one. She was lissom as a wand, dressed in a long scarlet riding coat and a highwayman hat to match, with a great swathe of chestnut hair tied in a bow. She'd got black eyes with no human soul in them, but sparkles instead, like a cat's eyes on a frosty night. Gauntlets on her little hands, spurs on her boots. She came in laughing from a talk with the old men on the bench. A besom, host, she says. We want a besom here. Everybody smiled and sniggered a bit. I knew well what she meant. For once, when Mother was talking to me, she said that if folk began to speak of besoms, I best go, since it was their way of saying I was a witch. But Gideon never noticed, for not being afflicted like me, he never thought of such things, and being used to me, he didn't have it in mind that other folk met not be. And he was very deep in considering over whether Jancis or the big house and the maids and men were best. So it all went by him. The lady ran to the squire's son and clapped him on the shoulder, which made him frown because of his dignity. And she says, So you've come Christmasing like a good lad. Who's the woman with the hair shot and lip? He made a sign to warn her to talk soft, and nodded towards Gideon ever so little. Why, if yonder isn't young San of San, she says, flushing a bit and coming running across to where Gideon sat, very handsome in the blue coat with the brass buttons and the black band for father on the arm, and his eyes darkling over the thought of Jancis. I nudged him, and he stood up, and looked all the better for it being such a fine figure. She held out her hand, for the gentry were always friendly to the farmers, in especial to voters about election time, and she sparkled at him out of her black eyes and said, There's to be an election soon, and father's got some work for you, San. So you'd best come and see us one day, and take bite and sup, if your sweetheart can spare you. She looked very spitefully at me. Seemingly she thought Gideon was an only child, and so she chose to take me for his acquaintance, or else she chose to mock him, lashing him into her slavery by making him look a fool. Now Gideon was altogether with the squire as to politics, because of the corn tax, but he hadna made up his mind in good sadness whether he meant giving all those things up and settling down contented with Jancis and a crowd of little uns till death them parted. So he hummed and hawed a bit, 
and not being used to ever hover from a common man, she lost her temper. So, so, you've no time, San. You've no time, I see, she says. You'll be dancing on Deerfall Mountain next Thomas Tide, no doubt. Oh, fine you'll look, San, with your missus here, and broomsticks all round and the moon shining. She laughed like a tinkle of jangled bells, and Gideon came to the knowledge of what she meant. He was ever slow, but sure, eh, terrible sure. That was one of the times I spoke of when I saw Gideon angered. His face had gone dark, and his eyes had the look as if the mere was running behind them, cold and bitter cold. He looked down at her so that she blenched, and he said very slow, Ma'am, this be my sister. If I've a mind to dance on the Deerful Mountain along of witches, I all. And if I've a mind to dance upstairs at the Ant Ball along of the gentry, I all. But I want to ask you for a partner, and I doubt I want to be able to vote for Squire neither. For can a man govern the land, as can a govern his own womankind, but lets his girl go about like a ripstitch rantipole? He should have given you more stick, ma'am. Dora Bella, calls her brother, very much put about at her being in such a brawl. They went out, and Gideon sat down and went on with his victuals. Nor did he eat a bit less hearty for it all, though I could scarce touch a morsel. So soon as he went off to buy the oxen, I made haste to go from the place. There were plenty of errands to do, what with malt and sugar and tea to buy, and boots for us all, and Tivy's present, and a bit of backy for Gideon, for he never bought any himself, since if he was near with others, he was near with himself also. When I'd finished, and bought it to three extras for Christmas, and packed all into the panniers, Gideon was ready to go and see the house. He was pleased with the cattle. Brindled longhorns they were, and very strong. With so few people using oxen for farm work, they were cheaper, a power, than they used to be. So he was cheerful, since neither then nor at any other time did he seem cast down by my sorrow. How could he know, indeed, that my heart was bleeding because of Miss Dorabella and the old men on the bench? He was angered because he thought it disgrace to himself that a hair shotten lip should be cast up against one of his family, and a scent of witchcraft into the bargain. But for me he took no thought, any more than if I was one of the new-bought oxen that somebody prodded in passing by. He whistled under breath as we went along the by-road that led to the house he'd set his mind on. I'd never been along that way, for it lay outside the town on the other road from ours, and when we did come in we hadn't much time for gadding about. We soon left the coach road and were in a lane with deep frozen ruts in it and high hedges white over with rime. The evening was closing in a bit, but Gideon said never mind, we'd manage the beasts all right, for it'd be light as day when the moon rose. He was very wrought up about the house, I could see, so I agreed to all he said, for I never liked to dampen down anybody's pleasure. Lord knows there's little in now in the world, and Gideon was ever one that took life hard. So when it turned out that he'd planned to treat me to a dish of tea after at the mug of cider, and have a chat about all we meant to do, seeing we could know when mother was by, I said naught again it, though I thought I'd liefer have gone into hell's mouth than face it. But Gideon wanted to talk while the holiday feeling was on him, afore the dumbness of San got the better of him again. For it was a most peculiar thing, how you couldn't a speak your heart out at San, and I never knew whether it was the big trees brooding, or the heavy, rheumatic feeling of being so close to the water, or the old ancient house full of the remembrances of old ancient people, or that there was somewhat foreboded. 
So Gideon kept his thoughts and turned them over and over in his mind like a snowball, till at last the snowball was too much for six strong men to shift, and nigh big enough to bury anybody. We went through a gate into an avenue like a carriage drive. At the end there was another gate, with balls on posts, very grand. Within was a carriage sweep and flower knots trimly capped. We stood there looking through the wrought iron gates at the place that Gideon said was to be ours. It was new, built since Queen Anne died, and it was a desperate big house, very solid, with four windows each side the door, and over the door a porch of stone. Above the eight windows were eight more, and over them dormer windows that Gideon said would be the windows of the men servants and the maid servants. There were steps up to the door, and a stone mounting block with steps also, and a walled garden at one side, and a round pigeon coat. No light showed, and the place had a melancholy look, so still it was, so dark, in its dark still trees. I'd leaf there was a light, I said. Dear to goodness, a light? It wanna be dark this hour, to call dark. What do they want with a light? The housekeeper can spin by firelight, I hope, and an old chap can sit in the chimney corner and set his mind on a better world without wasting tallow, let alone wax. Gideon had taken over the management already, seemingly, and I was bound to laugh. You seem pretty anxious. The poor gentleman should set his mind on a better world, I say. Why, so I am but not too soon. It'd never do for the old chap to go out all of a lantern puff afore we've got the money together, say, in about ten year. So he's to order his coffin in ten years' time? Poor gentleman. You be very sharp today, Prue, says he, but he's bound to go some day. No danger. We mun bide our time. He's Miss Dorabella's great-uncle, inna he? Ah, one of they want it for young Mr. Camperdine? Laws, no, he's after a bishop's palace. Nor yet his cousin? Dear, no, he'll never bide long in a place, that lad wanna. A rolling stone he be, and a caution. No, it be put up to auction when the old man goes. And you and me must mind to get the money ready. Why, look ye a light, I says. Where? Why, there, in that lower window on the garden side. I saw it as well as could be, a large pale light, wandering from window to window downstairs, and then sliding up, in a long window that seemed to go down the stair, and beginning over again in the upper story. One window would shine for a minute, then go black, then another shine. It had a very strange, uncontented look, wandering like that. There's nothing so contented as a steadfast light, but a flickering light going to and again in a void is a sad thing to see. It went on like that a long time, and the cold strengthened. There was no sound at all. We stood there like beggars outside the gate, and the unquiet light wandered in the dark. All of a sudden it went out. Oh, it's gone out, I says. Oh, dearie, dearie me. What of that, says Gideon. I wanted it to steady and come to rest in a window, and shine out with a heartening glow, I said, but now it's gone out. It distressed me mightily that it should go out, so that I wrung my cold hands together, though why it should hurt me thus I couldna say. It was but the housekeeper looking for her knitting needles, or old Camperdine seeking his snuff-box, and now they've found it, they've doubted the light. Very sensible, too. No, I said, no, it was love, lad, wanting to steady and shine. But the house was too much for it. The dark's closed in now, the lights doubted. And I began to cry, which was a foolish thing to do. 
But Gideon wasna so angered as he met have been, for he was in a good temper about the oxen and the house. You're sickening for summat, he said, for you be no crybaby, Prue. Come on to your tea now, while I tell you all that's in my mind. I've a deal to say, for that little vixen of Camperdine's has changed my mind for me, so I must tell you the new plans as well as the old. We turned away from the shut gate as dumb as stones, and we left all the twenty-four windows with no light in them, and the dark trees with no breath of air in them, lying there in the vast of night. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Book Two, Chapter Three of Precious Bain by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Or die in tempting it. It wasn't a near so bad as I'd feared at the inn, for the old men were gone with their droves, and the Campertines were, by this, at their dinner. It is often so, if you are in heavy dread of summit, and yet brave it, and behold, it is naught. The landlord and his missus, thinking little of us, sent the maid-servant to wait on us, a frightened, simple creature like Miller's Polly, and nothing to be feared of. We had the parlour to ourselves, for folk go home early from Lullingford Market in the winter, seeing what the roads are, even to this day. I was glad of the red fire and the steaming tea, after the sadness of that house with its dead light. Gideon began to talk after a while, very slow, and as if the words cost gold. Now, Prue, I've gotten a deal to say, and if we don't want to be benighted, I'd best start. You know as me and Jancis have taken up together in good sadness. Ah. Uh -huh. I did nothing to care about any wench like I do about that girl, Prue. Catches at a chap's vitals, she do. I never meant to go further than a bit of fun. I didn't reckon to marry, nor yet I didn't mean lawless love. I meant fair by Jancis, and so long as we had our Sunday evenings, it was all right. When there's no gainsaying, there's no burning in the blood. Gainsay, and the blood's on fire. Afore old Beguildy found us out, we were contented enow, and as innocent as two pinks on a stem. And still be that last, I says. Ah, he looked strangely on me for a while, and said, You've got the second sight, seemingly, how prue? No, only a bit of sense. Well, now as the old man's given me the go-by, I do hunger and thirst after Jancis pretty near as much as I do after the place yonder, and the money, and all as goes with it. Not more? Laws, no. Then you done a love, Jancis, in good sadness, Gideon. You do but lust after the girl in carnality. Dear to goodness, it met be parson preaching. That's what the book learning does to a woman. He laughed a bit, awkward-like, and began stuffing backy into his pipe. But I knew that if I'd got any wisdom, it was never book-learning as gave it to me, but just the quietness of the attic. Well, big words or not, it's no matter, he says. I want the wench. I want her so bad that I'd very near set my heart to give up all and bring her to San and order one of them rush cradles off Mrs. Beguildy. So, then, to conquer the longing, I plan to bring you to see the place and talk about it, and maybe begin to buy some bits of things again we furnish, to harden your heart the more. Ah, and I plan to get some education of you after a while, and gather power to me at election times, and be so well thought of that I could even put my heart on the squire's girl. Miss Dorabella? No less. What be she after all but a woman? 
she hadna got more to give than any other woman, and what would any man, even the lord of the manor, do more for a girl than get her with child? Hushed! They'll hear in the kitchen and be angered at such wild talk. True talk. May be true, but nobody'd like it the better for that. Ever since she threw me that first saucy look, I've had it in mind. She angered me and pleased me both. So I thought, if so be I could bring myself to give up chances, for either I mun give up chances or I mun give up all thought of the other, then chances might have taken up with Sexton's Sammy. It would nigh kill the girl, Gideon, and Sammy's no woman's man, and he's pretty well crazed with learning texts into the bargain. Oh, he'll take her if I'd let un. She stirs him to anger with her flighty ways, and being a wizard's wench and all. I see a look in Sammy's face time and again. Wed with her and tame her, that's what Sammy'd do. But that would be a cruel thing, Gideon. Well, I'd a mind for it when we set out for market. I thought to throw chances at the fellow's yard like I'd throw a crust to Towser, for it mun be one thing or the other, and she'd have been contented enough when the children came, though, Lord help em, they'd ha had Sammy's scowl and been born with their mouths full of Texas. But she'd have seen naught wrong with them. Anyway, that's what I'd settled in my own mind. Dear to goodness, what a God Almighty, I says, mocking a bit, though I knew he could have done it if he'd her mind. He was ever a strong man, which is almost the same, times, as to say, a man with little time for kindness. For if you stop to be kind, you must swerve often from your path. So when folk tell me of this great man and that great man, I think to myself, who was stinted of joy for his glory? How many old folk and children did his coach wheels go over? What bridal lacked his song, and what mourner his tears, that he found time to climb so high? But now, said Gideon, my mind set, and I shanna change again. I want to give up either Jancis or the place at Lullingford here. I'll have both, and I'll lead Jancis out in a gown as would stand of itself, with her bosom bare as a lady's at the aunt ball in front of Miss Dorabella. Not only that neither, but when you and Jancis be at the grand place, and the gentry calling in their carriages. And mother, you've missed out mother. And me, a man of standing, more looked up to than squire, and not yet old, nor near it, then... He was quiet a long while, thinking. Well, Gideon, I says, what then? Why, then, if Dorabella Camperdine comes across my path with them black eyes and that red smile, let her look to herself. I'll take her, out of wedlock, I owe, for what she said to you and me today. And when the poor wizard's wench is my lawful missus, I'll make Squire's girl a whore. With that word he banged down his fist on the table, so that the tankard of ale rolled on the floor. If you be so set in your ways, I says, there'll be more than a flagon of ale spilled, my dear. You talk like an old ancient woman, Prue. I be as I was made. None can go wid a shins to that. I can hear Gideon say that now, gruff and short, with a kind of broken-hearted sound. It was as if he'd given all to be as he could never be, as if his soul in that hour, away from San and all its ancient power, wrestled mightily to be free of itself. Maybe you've seen a dragonfly coming out of its case. It does so rustle, it does so wrench, you'd think its life would go from it. I've seen em turn somersaults like a mountebank in their agony. For get free they mun, and it causes them a pain, like the birth pain, very pitiful to see. But in our Gideon it was worse to watch. 
There he sat by the comfortable fire, with the spilled beer gleaming on the quarries like dark blood, and he said no word for above an hour. I know it was that, for when he went into his trance, I heard the missus of the inn call to the maidservant to turn the spit and hasten on the meat, for supper must be served in an hour. Then all was still, and I sat with folded hands, seeing Gideon's dark face there opposite when the fire blazed up. I sat as mum as a winter blackbird. It seemed to me that the mighty hand was upon him, striving with him to make him go widdishins to what he was, to what father had made him, and grandad, and all of them, back to Timothy, that had the lightning in his blood. I could see in his mind Lullingford New House, and the light wandering, as if it wanted to steady and shine. I wished it might be well with Gideon, and that he might take chances, not for vengeance, but for love, and because she was the candle of his eye, and his dear acquaintance, and not for lust. And I wished he might take thought for mother, and even for me, that I be not like his dog or his bought slave. After a long pause of time, I heard a voice outside say, Is all finished? And another voice answered, Ah, all's done. It had a solemn sound, though I knew it was only the dinner they meant. Gideon stirred and muttered to himself, Or die in tempting it, he said. So I knew we were all set out on a dark road, Gideon and mother and me, and now Jancis. We went out and saddled the nags, and set forth for home through a world as stiff as a rock, driving the oxen afore us. The dumbness had come back upon Gideon. The outing was over. The road puddles were gone beyond crackling stiff and were iron, and the hedges were even as the wrought iron gates of Lullingford New House. It was the middle of the night when we came past Sarn Mere, and saw the ice a deal further out, and the lily leaves frozen under. Well, it's been a very costly day, says Gideon, and I'm in behopes you've enjoyed yourself. I knew it hurt the lad sore to spend. It was a crust in pocket, and a sup of water mostly, on market days, so I put the old men and Miss Dorabella out of mind, and only said, Ah, it was grand, and thank you kindly, lad. And you'll agree to all? Ah, didn't I vow it? But that was a for Jancis. I agree to Jancis, but it would be all one if I didna. Not if you wouldna work. Oh, I'll work. I never was afeard of work. All of a sudden, a sweet scattered whistling came falling from the dim moony sky. Hark, he says, the seven whistlers. But I said, I thought it was only some magpie widgeon we'd disturbed at the end of the mere, being mortally afeard to think of those other ghostly birds. No, he says, no, it be the seven whistlers, sure enough. It bodes no good. This was a strange thing for Gideon to say, for he mostly laughed at signs and bodings, and I could not but think of it up in the attic after. Mother and Tibby were sitting up for us, and seemingly Mother had seen us in the tea leaves, drowned in song. She'd scarce believe in us for a long while, but cried and wrung her hands and said, They've been a real, it's only the no of them. So I was bound to give her one of my Christmas presents to comfort her. She was ever a child in heart, was poor mother. She was so simple and trustful that I always thought it would be as wicked to hurt her as to hurt a babe in swaddling clothes, or a poor moth flittering in the dusk. Ah, an evil thing, a devil's trick to betray such a trusting heart, such trembling, praying little hands. I be to lie in your chamber, Prue, says Tivy. I be glad, for it's cold lying alone in black frost weather. 
She looked slanting at Gideon, and I could see she was nearly wild with jealousy of Jancis. And indeed, Gideon did look a proper, fine man, with his face all frosty red, and his eyes lit up with the day's doings. He'd but to nod, and Tivy'd follow. But he was never one to chop and change, and his mind was made up, so I knew it was Jancis or none. I did not want Tivy in my bed. She did so snore and snuffle in her slumber. So I waited till she was fast, and then I took the lantern and father's old sheepskin coat that lapped me up feet and all, and I went to the attic and wrote in my book. It was always my custom, if things grieved me or gladdened me, to write them down in full. Also, I had much need of the peace that was in the attic, after such a bitter dose of the world beyond San. Because I had no lover, I would lief have been the world's lover, such world, that is, as I could reach. I was like a maid standing at the meeting of the lane ends on May Day, with a posy not as a favour for a rider that should come by. And behold, the horseman rode straight over me, and left me posy and all in the mire. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of Precious Bane by Mary Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian the Wizard of Plash Christmas went by us, and naught stirred the quiet, unless you count killing the pig. Nobody came Christmasing, for there was nowhere for them to come from, and nothing for them to come for. Mother was very middling with a cough, and took to her bed, so I didn't go for a lesson till the new year. But on New Year's Day I went. And, as I ever liked to pay first, I took the oxen straight away to the field I was ploughing for Beguildy. He could not abide ploughing, so for every lesson I did so many furrows. I could plough nearly as well as most men, though not so well as Gideon. He drove the straightest furrow I ever saw. It was impossible for him to do anything ill. What he did whether it was to be seen or not, whether it was done once in a way, or every day, must be done as if his life was on it. He'd have no makeshifts. He'd thatch the ricks, even though they were to be cut into straight away, as well as if he was working for the thatcher's medal. Working by his lonesome in the fields, hedging or binding sheaves, with only the tall clouds for watchers and the woods floating on the summer mist, he'd still labour like a man showing his mettle at a hiring fair. Times I thought it was pitiful the way he gave himself no rest, and times I could almost see the crowd of folk, the farmers watching, the judge sitting in his wagon or trotting to and again on his cob. I could almost hear the muttering of the folks, the jeering when Gideon bungled, the roar of cheering when he did well, and the judge saying in his loud voice, I give the prize to Gideon San, best man in the hedging, the binding, and the ploughing. Then I'd come to myself and see only the tall clouds that hadn't stirred, the tall hedges with meadow sweet below the woods and hills and the sweet blue air with larks hanging in it, as if them above had let them down on threads, and shaking so with their joyful song that they threatened to break their threads. Not a bit did they care who won the prize, nor which of them sang best or loudest, so long as all sang, so long as none lacked nest or crop full, drink of dew and space to sing in. These things I thought while I was ploughing the five-acre field at Plash with the white oxen that looked yellow in the deathly white of the hoar-frost which lay over the earth like a shroud, though not too hard for ploughing. 
As the share went onwards, the reddish turned earth shone richly, and the rooks followed, for they were sore clemmed poor things, walking stately in the furrows. In a while, Jancis came running across from the house with her mother, all agog to tell me of the hand-fasting of her and Gideon, and of how angered beguiled he was. Jancis did truly look as lovely as a fairy, with her rosy face and yellow curls. Mrs. Beguildy came panting after, apron flying and loaded with news, like one of the French frigates folk tell of. But we want to starve here like crows, she said. Come you in and have a sup of tea. San brought me a pound canister, no less. I knew he must be very deep in love to bring more than a quarter, but I said naught, only finished my furrow and unspanned the cattle. We can have a nice chat, for Dad's busy in his room curing Miller's Polly, says Jancis. What's to do with Polly? It's what inner to do with that child, says Mrs. Begayardy. First she got the chin cough, and now she's got the ringworm. She's always got summat. He's put her in a chair with a string of roasted onions round her neck, and I'm sure I cried quartz getting them ready. Dunna you ever be wife to a wizard, Prue. It's like what it says in the good book. And I wish I could go to church, Christian, and hear it. It be like it says, I die daily. Ah, it's like that, being wife to a wizard. If it inner onions, it's summat else. I'm sure I near broke my neck fetching bletch from the church bells for this very child to cure the chicken pox the maester being a deal too bone idle to fetch it himself. Never you mind, mother. When I'm married, I'll look after you, says Jancis. I could not but sigh to think what a many plans they were all making, and each plan cutting the throat of the others. I put the oxen in the shippen and came in. There was a good fire and a pleasant scent of tea and I was bound to feel a bit glad that Polly was such a measly child, though it was unkind, for I knew beguiled he'd be a long while curing her. Mother always said the mill children were measly, because the water fairy in the pool under the mill race put her eye on her mother afore they were born. But Gideon said it was because they were fed on the flour the rats got into, and Mrs. Beguiledy said, it was because they sent them to Beguildy to be cured. A dose of brimstone and treacle, that be what she wants, and some good food. But the mill's no place for good bread, no more than the farm's a place for good butter, seeing it means cash, and the home folk get the leavings. Just then Beguildy popped his head in, and looking dreamily at his missus said, I want some may butter. May butter? You met as well ask for gold. How don't you think I've got any may butter, nor June nor July butter neither, when we sell every morsel of butter we make, almost afore it be out of the churn, and never taste naught but lard. I'm bound to have may butter, or the charm wanna work, says Beguiledy in his husky voice. What be it for? to fry the mid-bark of the elder and cure the chin-cough. Well, for all the butter, May or December, as she'll get in our place, she may die of the chin-cough, shouts Mrs. Beguildy. And with that, a loud roaring came from the inner chamber, because poor Polly thought she was at death's door. Go and read in your old books, and find some at easier, says Mrs. Beguildy. I've some it better to think of than charms. You be above yourself, woman. You think to see our Jancis wedded and bedded and rounding to a grandchild all in a lantern puff. But I tell ye, not every troth ends in church. Not every ring holds a wedlock. Not every bridegroom takes his vargin, and I dunna like the match. Old San still begrudges me that crown, though he be where crowns by naught. 
And, I tell you, young San was born under the threepenny planet, and he'll never keep money. Sleeps on his face, too, and them as does that drowns. My girl's not for San. You may ride roughshod over my wish and will. You may send out bidding letters for a love-spinning, which is all to the good. But still I'll bide for a higher bidder. Why, she be as white as a lady, and as sound as a well-grown tater. No squire, nor lord even, but had take it kind to be asked to lie beside her. But not to wed with her. What of it? He'd pay, wouldna he? By this, Jancis was roaring crying as well as Polly. Beguiled, he popped into his room again, and we set to work to comfort her. We drew close into the fire with our tea, and planned for me to write the bidding letters for the love-spinning. And a caking into the bargain, says Mrs. Beguiledy. You make money by a caking. And Weaver shall come, and stop a two-three days, and make up all we've spun. Jancis clapped her hands. Oh, I dearly love a do, she said. Ah, so do I. But a caking be the best of all. Oh, I love Gideon dearly for asking me to wed. All the while, as we talked, we could hear poor Polly coughing and whooping sore, and beguiled his shouting, Quiet now, hush your noise, I say. Curse ye, you're cured. Then Mrs. Beguiledy asked me to write down the biddings for them to see. So I did, and they were mighty pleased, for all they couldn't read what I'd written any more than two butterflies in the hedge can read the milestone. Put down, says Mrs. Beguiledy, as Jancis, only daughter of Mr. Felix Beguiledy, and Hepzibah, his wife, is promised and trothed to Mr. Gideon San, farmer, living on his own land at San, and put down, as they'll be wed as soon as may be, and that Jancis invites them to a love-spinning. And put down, says Beguiledy, popping his head in again, that you're a parcel of fools, and that this marriage shall not be till Sarnmere goeth into the earth whence it came. For I've seen in a glass darkly a young squire that rides this way with his pockets full of gold. When Polly was gone, coughing as bad as ever, and I went into the other room for my lesson, I gave Jancis a little pat on shoulder, for I was sorry for the child. She looked more than ever like a petal of the May on a day of cold rain. Well now, says Beguiledy, I make no doubt you've ploughed a tidy bit. Ah, well, what'll I learn ye? Learn me to write, marriages be made in heaven, mister, and whom God hath joined together, let no man put us under. He chuckled a bit. Clever wench! But you'll not get the better of me. Rather shall you write, Intermeddle not with high matters. Dunna a wizard, as knows the fortunes of a parish, know what's best for his own? Leave be, mister. There's enough again, the poor child, what with fate and such a pig-headed man as Gideon. If you meddle, maybe you'll do harm as you can amend. No more. No more, I've said my say, done a weary me. He beat lightly on his little music, which was a sign that his patience was over. As the notes tinkled out, I knew it was useless to argle any more, for, as there was no power or sweetness in his flinty music, such as there is from harp and fiddle, so there was none in his soul. It gave a small flinty music, because it was a small and flinty thing. He'd got no pity, because he'd got no strength. For it inner weaklings and women that pity best, but the strong, mastering men. They may put it from them, as my brother San did, but even so it will come upon them some day, and the longer they deny it, 
the stronger it will be when it comes. Ah, it may even be such an agony as will make a man hate his life. End of Book 2, Chapter 4book two chapter five of precious pain by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the love spinning it took a long while to get ready for the do it being a caking as well a good few of the religious sort held that cakings were wickedness being in the nature of gambling but for us women, leading such lost and forgotten lives, they were a bit of enjoyment, and even Sexton's wife said she'd come and bring Tibby. She got Mrs. Beguildy to fix it on a day when Sexton was going with Parson to a place a long way off to look into the case of a woman taken in adultery. She knew Sexton had stayed till the bitter end and would not be wrought back till the small hours, and even if he found out, He'd be so contented at the punishing of a sinner that maybe he'd not be more than grumbling angry. The name Caking was given because we played cards for cakes. To tell the sober truth, it was real gambling. The woman who gave the do made a big batch of cakes, saffron or rich sponge, and sold them to the guests at a penny each. Cakes were what we played for and the losers were bound to buy more whereas a good player could go away with a big basketful or she could sell them to the losers at two pence each mother was not to hold or to bind but she must come gideon promised to look after our jobs for the day so we set out early we were to make a day of it spinning all the forenoon and then after the noon spell, settling down to cards. It was a fine, fresh morning, with a damp wind full of the scent of our ricks. There's no scent like it for bringing summer in winter. When I smell it now, I see the long, gleamy waves of grass like green silk, and the big red clover bobs, and corn crakes running low in the thick grass, dark with dew. But at that time, the first thing it put me in mind of was how hard got it was, how we'd sweated and laboured by moonlight, and got up again afore we'd had time for a dream, to sweat and labour once more. Still, it smelled pleasant, and so did Gideon's bonfire of old hedge brushings and the deep floor of leaves in the wood, and the pine trees where there were always canbotlins cheeping and playing. Mother looked well in her big poke bonnet and frilled tippet, like a bright bird with her quick brown eyes and red cheeks. We only took the little spinning wheels, seeing we were to spin flax and hemp, and not wool, so I could carry them easy. The mere was a bit cruddled with ice at the north side still, but you could tell that spring was afoot, though it was but February by the mating games of the water owls and the nesting core of our rooks. There were green tongues on the woodwind sprays too, so bright they minded me of the tongues of flame that came down from heaven. In that dead time, coming so quick and fresh, they always seemed more to me than all the honeysuckle blossoms of the summer. When we came through the oak wood, Mother smoothed her mittens very complacent and said, I've been attending swine this day, I be a lady. Indeed to goodness you be, I said, for I did dearly like her to enjoy herself. I said I made no doubt she'd win enough of cakes to keep us all for a week of nine days. Will Jancis be a good daughter to me, think you, my dear? I make no doubt of it, mother, I said. Will she leave me my own place by the fire and speak kind? Ah, she all, I know. But you needn't a fret, for it'll be many a long day afore those two are shouted in church. I'd leaf not. I'd leaf be a granny prue. Will the babe favour Gideon or her, don't you think? 
I said, not having the second sight, I couldn't tell, but I thought it'd be the very spit and image of its dad. Maybe, maybe, it'd be better a power that it should favour us than the beguiledies. It's bad for a babe to have a preached against grandad. Oh, there's not much harm in beguiledy, nor yet good, I said. He be just a pleasant painted show, like a blown egg. I be glad he'll be away today. Mrs. Beguildy had sent a message by Gideon to her cousin at Lullingford to tell her to send for Beguildy on that day to come and cure her man's toothache, for seemingly he'd had one taken out by the beast leech, and he parted so hard with it that the beast leech, being a terrible man when his blood's up, loosened all the others lugging it out. So he got the toothaches shouting bad, and it was a good amusement for Beguildy to go and cure it. He was always very proud of that charm beginning. Peter sat a-weeping on a marble stone, and he'll go on saying it over and over till the person cries for mercy. Then he claps on a bag full of salt, fire hot, and whether it's the salt or the charm, the person most always says he's cured. They'll keep him late, not to spoil our sport, says mother, clapping her hands softly like a child. We came out into the open fields, and I thought no day had ever looked so fair, yet knew not why. The hills, Lullingford way, were blue as a summer sky, a deep promising blue, and there was a richness on the world, so it looked what our parson used to call sumptuous. There were the red ploughlands and the old yellow stubble in the sun, and plash pool glassy blue, and the mill roof in the valley red. All the grassland was clear green like the green in church windows, or like the green hill far away where no herb grows but the calvary clover. Even a summer day can seldom match such a day as that when the snow is but just gone and the waters freed and when there is a clear shining above and below you could tell that there was summit out of the common at the stone house by the great blaze of firelight in the window jancis came running to the door and made her obedience to mother very prettily we were the first saving for miller's polly and her mother they were always first everywhere, for they said an hour from home was an hour in heaven. They would not explain more, only if you drove them hard and asked them for why, was it the mill us, or the water, or what? Then they'd say, the miller. And if you said why, what ailed the man, they'd say, was he ever known to smile, leave alone laugh? And indeed he never was. He'd got a latence in the speech as well, and what with the two things he was very disheartening to live with. There was a foolish tale that he'd had a bogey out of the water for sweetheart, and that when he got married she'd put silence on him for a curse. Mrs. Miller was a poor creature like a mealworm, but very pleasant spoken. Sexton's missus was just the opposite. She always made me think of a new painted coach, big and wide, with an open road and the horn blowing loud and cheerful, and full speed ahead. She was as gay in her dress as a seven-coloured linnet, and if she could wear another shawl or flounce or brooch, she would. She wore so many petticoats, it was a wonder she could walk. And once Tivy said to me that to watch her mother undress was like peeling a big onion down to the core. Tivy wasn't a one ever to make a joke, so it shows what a great thing it must have been to watch. I was used to think myself, seeing her and Sexton together, that she was like a big hank of dyed wool, and he was the thin black distaff it was to be wound off on to. When she and Tivy were come, we were eight, and our wheels made a pleasant humming in the warm room the while we talked. The ox-driver's wife from Plash Farm came next, with two tall girls, very quiet and meek for all their size. 
folk said their father tied them to the ox trevis every saturday night and beat them to keep them in mind of their manners they'd always stand up if their mother spoke to them and bend their long necks like meek swans the twelfth was the shepherd's wife from the moors beyond plash she was a strange creature but fair to look upon enough to make a man's mouth water she'd got sloping shoulders and long hips and her hair was like a blackbird's wings her eyes were clear green and her face was flushed like a ripe peach and she'd smile in secret to herself like a fairy it was said but whether with any truth i know not that the shepherd paid no money for the moors that belonged to a tavern keeper in silverton but that every midsummer felina which was his wife went up to the rocks at the hilltop and spent the night with the tavern keeper there were wilder tales too about her being seen dancing by moonlight in a ring of cattle and sheep mother naked and how a shaggy creature with ram's horns that could only have been satan came and danced along with her mopping and mowing while the ring of beasts made a low moaning but to me she seemed a pleasant harmless creature and very handy in all she did i could see that the oxherd's wife didn't care for her girls to be spinning with felina she was so respectable and high-minded that she never spoke of anything between bands up and baptism if she could help it and took no notice of young couples during that time she said naught to felina and it was mother ever kindly who said you spin like a fairy mrs felina there's naught else to do in the mountain said felina in a low singing voice but spin and spin and spin morning noon and night save on midsummer night my girl raps out mrs sexton and then i'm told you've enough to do and plenty felina turned scarlet and hung her head and suddenly moll and suki burst out as if they'd wanted to say it for years and years oh mrs felina is it true as you lie with the tavern keeper and dance on the heath mother naked never did i see any woman so angered as their mother was suki and moll she says honoured ma'am says they all of a twitter out with your hands says she and stooping down she took off her sandal shoe which she wore because it was a party and slippered em both on the hands right soundly till they roared again i heard after that one married a farmer and the other a retired coachman and both did well it wasna for lack of correction if they did ill they went on with their spinning meek as mice snuffling over their wheels mrs beguildy was very put about for it seemed like being a melancholy party so i asked jancis to sing green gravel to liven us up we all joined in even polly whooping the while felina sang in a cool sounding voice and sexton's missus sang very loud and mother quavering and mrs miller like a bird new come from the cage so what with the singing and the whirring the kitchen was like a tree full of starlings it was getting on for time to stop spinning when mother said should we sing the lord's my shepherd and afterwards i spoke for having he brought me to his lordly house his banner it was love and just as we were singing that and the wheels going like churn owls there was a quick footfall without and a rush of fresh air and a long ray of sunshine from the door to me and he stood there in the light looking upon us he i say as if you'd know him out of the world as i did he stood in the doorway and i rose up from my seat in the shadows at the back of the room as if he was my own bidden guest end of book two chapter five Book Two, Chapter Six of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Game of Costly Colours How did he look? What was he like? Was he well favoured? It be hard to say. There are no looks in love, no outward seeming, no telling over of features. When you are but a moth in the candle of his eye, can you tell his stature, or if he be dark or fair? Did Magdalene, who was like Felina, know when she lay at the feet of the only man she ever loved, yet never loved, whether the carpenter's son featured his mother or not? whether he was big or little in stature. Shall we know, when we be come into his presence that made us, what outward seeming his majesty has? No, only our hearts will tremble in the light. I could never tell you how he looked as he stood there, but I can tell you how the woman looked that glassed him. Tivy and Polly gaped in wonder, finger on lip, Mol and Suki leaned forward, as you lean to a fire in winter, and their mother gathered them to herself jealously. Mrs. Sexton spread her flounces, and Jancis coloured up and said, Oh, and set one of her ringlets straight, and said, Oh, again. Mother smiled at him, and Felina, well, Felina's eyes settled on him as a brown owl drops to its prey. I sat down farther back in my corner, and a faintness came over me, for here was my lover and my lord, and behold, I was hair shotten. The room was all so still you could hear the drip of water off the roof. All of a sudden he laughed out, and indeed it must have been a comical thing to see us all like mice when pussy goes by and to hear us one minute making such a to-do, and the next making no to-do at all. He off with his hat and made us a little bow, and said, Servant, ladies, the weaver, if you please. If we pleased, as if we would not be pleased with anything he might say, so he was the weaver. Well, it made no manner difference to me. If he'd said he was the king of fairyland, or a murderer with the bloodhounds after un, it would have been all one to me. Castor wood sieves, if you please, missus, he says, in a kind of merry mockery, looking towards Mrs. Sexton, she being the biggest, both in tallness and roundness. Then Mrs. Beguildy brought him to the fire, and made him take bite and sup. But I kept out of sight. Be you from far, sir? asks Felina in her lingering way. Her lips were red and pleasant, though not kind. Lullingford, missus, he made answer with a measuring look, neither very near nor very far. As the crow flies near, she said, as if she pleaded. Only we bayn't crows, missus. I live on the mountain over yonder, she says, and I'm nigher to Lullingford, a power, than these. A longish ride? Not far. It be on your road to almost everywhere. I thought she says all I'd like to say. By gum, missus, I doubt it's on the way to hell, he made answer. They were like folk wrestling, but we did not know their quarrel. Oh, I be glad it's you that's to weave my wedding linen, and not the ugly hired man, said Jancis. So, you're to be wed, child. Ah, to Gideon's son, sir. Then you know Gideon. I've heard tell of him. I wondered what he'd heard of Gideon. All in a minute it was more to me that he should like Gideon and mother and me then I should master the reading of Revelations, which beat me still because of the strange words and the roundabout way of the telling. I'd laboured over it a long while, and labour brings the thing near the heart's core. 
Above and beyond that, I wanted to know the mind of John, he being lonesome on his pilot in the sea, as we were at Sarn, and having many thoughts in his mind, both deep and bright. Now, one like Tivy had no thoughts at all, and you soon tire of looking in an empty porringer. And Mother had two thoughts, or three, and Gideon, two. So the mind of John had drawn me, as none other did afore. But now the book of Revelations was but a windle straw to this man's whim. Oh, Mr. Woodseaves, will you come to my wedding if Prue writes you a bidding letter? asked Chances. Maybe I will, he made answer, looking at her mother as much as to say that she could give him the go-by if she would. And who's Prue that can write bidding letters? I was in a swelter, but just as Jancis was going to rush on me and drag me out of hiding, Suki and Mole, who could never be quiet for long, burst out, Please, mister, will you come to our weddings too? And they giggled mightily, and put their heads together, shaking their curls and bending their long necks. Then they put their hands afore their mouths and ran across the kitchen to him, and one whispered in this ear, and one whispered in that, and then they ran back to their bench, two double with laughter. Jancis, being near, heard Suki whisper, I'd leave you were bridegroom. I hoped their mother wouldn't get to know, and slipper them again, for they'd save me from being seen. I couldn't bear that he should see me, for fear of a cold look or scorn. I'd leave a stay down under, like the daffodilly, lest the weather be winterly. For if she too eagerly comes up, desirous of the sun, she can but stand and shudder in the bitter frost, torn by the fangs of the winds. So she has lost her warmship, and yet Hannah won through to summer. Sir, be you wed? asked Felina, and her voice was pretty and slippery like a grass snake. Why, no to that, missus. Nor handfasted? I'm thinking you were an attorney once, he says, and stuck questions into poor men like skewers before you put them out of their misery. She took no notice, but only said, You be not of this country, you come from afar. Oh, indeed to goodness he is of this country, Mrs. Felina, mother chirped up like a little bird. He came back from being prentice, after his uncle was drowned. It was his uncle wove the morning, when my poor maester died, falling down in a fit and dying in his boots, on the Sabbath the bees did play. And now he's dead, and your auntie's dead. You live by your lonesome, I suppose, says Jancis. Well, I do and I don't. Dear to goodness, mister, have you got a kept woman? This was Felina. Your thoughts be all beaded on one string, says Castor. Then Suki and Mole burst out. Who cooks for ye? Who sweeps for ye? Who sews your buttons on? Who knits your stockings? I do for myself, my dears, and my thoughts be my company. He looked round very contented, and I could see he was thankful that none of all these women had a right to come over his door sill. Well, thank you for me, missus, he said, putting down his mug and plate, and now for work. The loom's in the attic, I suppose. Ah, I'll show you. There's a bed there, too. You want to finish for two days or three. There's a plenty for you to do. But come down and get your supper along with us, for it in a every day we have a randy. By the time she came back, every tongue was at it. Suki and Mole were quarrelling as to which of them, if they could do as they willed and go and work for him, should pour his supper ale and fill his pipe. It was enough to make an owl laugh. A nice young fellow, says Mrs. Sexton, and a God-fearing, I'll lay, if the woman let un alone. She looked very meaningly at Felina, but Felina was fallen into a muse. I like him better than Gideon, a power, though Gideon be your brother, Prue, says Tivy. Mrs. Miller spoke for the first time. 
He's as different, she says, as different as mortal man could be from the miller. It was the greatest praise she could give. Polly gave a loud whoop, as if to say that she agreed. Well, time goes by, and even a toothache must be cured some day, says Mrs. Beguildy. So we'd best set to at the caking afore my maester comes back. Thank you kindly for the spinning. We've done enough to keep that young man busy for above a bit. She brought out a big willow pattern dish stacked with cakes, saffron and sponge fingers, and gingerbread babies. These last are little men of gingerbread, with currants for eyes. Suki and Mole screamed with joy to see them. I dunna care about the others, if so be I can win a gingerbread man, says Suki. I'll win six, says Mole, six currenty babies for me. You'll need more gumption than you've got then, says Mrs. Sexton, for there's no game so hard as the game of costly colours. I've played it at every randy since I was a maid, and I'll lay that your ma has too, and Mrs. Sarn, and Mrs. Miller, yet it's a difficult game to us still. And for you that have played it seldom or never, it'll go hard, but you'll lose every cake. Tell them the way of it, says Mrs. Beguildy. You've got such a head. Though she meant it in good sadness, it made me laugh, for indeed Mrs. Sexton's head was marvellous to see, with oiled hair in rolls and bobs and bands, and a high comb and ribbons and a vasty cap on top of all. She went across the kitchen like a coach and six and stood by the fire, telling us about the game of costly colours, how you counted, and of the trumps, and how three of a suit was a prile, and four of a suit was costly, and how you could mog or change your cards, and of the deuces and jacks, and two for his heels, and how, if you make naught of your hand, it was called a cock's nest, and you were bound to give a cake all round. I canna mind a word, says poor Tivy. Nor me, says Polly. So they stood out and left us ten, and it was only eight we wanted for two tables, so I offered to stand out. Why, you be the best player of all, says Jancis. And the mother of Suki and Mole settled it, saying, Stand out, girls. You can play Turn the Trencher with Polly and Tivy, but no noise. They burst out crying, wanting to win the cakes. But their mother said, Did they want more slipper? So they hushed. Then she bought them each a gingerbread man and promised them some more at the end. Felina drew the same table with me. That is to say, it was the pig-killing bench with a board and a white cloth on it, for they had but one table. There's not one of us women but had like a gingerbread man, is there, Prue San, says she. So us being too old for cakes, shall us make believe to be playing for the soul of the weaver? As you please, I says, but it seems to me to be none of our business. Why, Prue San, you're as white as a shroud one minute, and as red as a peony the next, and such burning eyes. What ails you? I was angry, yet there was a warm ship in this one thing, that she seemed to be counting me as one like herself, and not as one that was set aside from the game of love. I suppose, being under suspicion of dancing with the devil, she had a fellow feeling with me for being mixed up with tales of witchcraft, for they'd even begun to say of me that I took shape as a hare on dark moonless nights, and went loping across the hills, and had a muse running under the churchyard. Such things were first said in idleness or mischief, or to scare children, and then in the loneliness of old farms, full of creakings and meanings on windy nights, they grew. And none can tell what such things will grow into at long last, nor what harm they may do. I didn't like it much when Felina took his name on her lips, 
for all on a sudden it was a precious name to me, and it seemed to me then, as it ever has, that he was not a man to speak of lightly. Watching him out of my darkness beyond the settle, I had thought his wrath would be like a cloudburst, though his smile was a spring day full of warm gillyflowers. Felina drew me farther from the rest. A man, she said, whose like I've not seen afore, neither on the roads nor at market. The others are gorbies to him. Did you see the colour of his eyes? No. Nor could I see. His eyelids cut across them so straight, and the candle of his eye is so big and black, you canna see the colour. I'd leaf be nigh him to see. Her glass-green eyes misted, and a rich swooning look came over her. A man to gamble for, she said. Take your places, take your places. Cut for first deal in the game of costly colours, cries Mrs. Sexton. As I sat down, I twisted the words of Felina in my mind, and said in the deeps of myself, not a man to gamble for. A man to die for. We gave our minds to the game, and the four girls having been sent into the yard, the room was as silent as a dream. I could hear them singing Barley Bridge out there. Shift your feet in nimble flight, you'll be home by candlelight. Open the gates as wide as the sky, and let the king come riding by. After a while the singing died away, and I wondered what mischief was brewing. But I'd enough to do, for I was determined to beat Felina. And as Mrs. Sexton was her partner, and Mrs. Miller was mine, I knew I should have my work cut out. The fire, mended with pine wood, gave a good, sweet smell and a warm light, enough to play by. It lit up the walls and the sticky gingerbread men on the blue dish, and Jancis, as fair to see as if she'd been made out of solid gold in old time for an altar. In the quietness, with Barley Bridge in my mind, a sort of waking dream came to me. I saw a great crowd of people beside the troubled water of San. They were dressed in holiday colours, but their faces were evil. Then one came riding through them on a tall horse, and his face was the face of the weaver. A woman stood forth from the crowd. She had a necklace of green glass beads and green blazing eyes. She cried out, My body, my body for a ride on your saddle. But he turned aside from her to one who stood hidden in a torn, sad-coloured dress with a hair shot and lip. He stooped to her, saying, Ah, my dear acquaintance, and she gave him a sprig of rosemary. She said no word, and she supposed he would go by her. But he set his arms about her and gathered her up before him on the saddle, and his right arm was strong around her. So they rode away, and the sound of the people died till it was less than the hum of a midge and there was nothing but the scent of rosemary and warm sun, and the horse lengthening its stride towards the mountains, whence came the air of morning. Two for his knob, cried Mrs. Sexton. Your deal, Prue. So I tucked my legs under the bench as well as I could for her fur billows, and went at it with a will. And I may say that Mrs. Miller and I won, out and out, to her everlasting astonishment, for she seemed to think it an impertinence on her part to beat Mrs. Sexton. You played like a demon, Prusan, said Felina. It was late, so Jancis opened the door and called supper, and in rushed the four hoydens, who seemed children to me, though I was nearly of an age with them. They burst out with their doings, though they had better have kept them to themselves. We've been in the attic. We sat on the bed. He can whistle like a throstle. He weaves as quick as ninepence. 
He's got a green coat for Sundays and a Bible with pictures in it, and he can read the Bible. He's got a watch and a pipe with a silver band, and he won the wrestler's medal at Silverton. He canna abide bull-baiting nor cock-fighting nor shameless women. He likes a good song and home-brewed in reason, and a dance in the meadow and the sound of bells. He's got a great lump of muscle on his arm, like a frozen snowball. We measured un on the attic floor, and found the inches with the weaver's measure. He be thirty-eight inches round the middle, and five foot ten inches high. He's got a pair of Wellington boots, but he dunna wear em much, being above his station, and a domed lot of trouble to clean. He said domed, we didna. He likes children and dogs, and a quiet life. He would na mind a missus of his own, if she was biddable. Only he's never seen the woman he'd leaf have yet. His eyes be watch it blue, what you can see of em for the black middles and the lids and the lashes. And if so be he's got any sisters, he'd like em to favour Suki and me. God bless me, says the mother of Suki and Moll, and I could see the slipper threatening. God bless me, not a thousand starlings in the reeds make such a din. It was lucky for the girls that their mother happened to have won. Get your tippets on now, this instant minute, she said. Call un down, Jancis, they pleaded. So she called him to supper. The sound of the treadles and the thud of the batten stopped, and he came down. Suki ran to him and put Summit into his hand. Then they made their curtsies and said, Thank you for me, and followed their mother. But Suki put her head in at the door again, and gave a bit of a giggle and whispered, I get him my gingerbread baby. Out, girls, ordered their mother, and off they went with the lantern to light them, and the ox goad, in case of gentlemen of the road. I went out to the barn that Kester Woodseaves might not see me, and when I came back he was gone to the attic again. Felina had gone early, with a luring smile and a word for him. If you come our way, mister, I'll learn you the story of Adam and Eve. The two from the mill were very unwilling to part, but at last they went, and we made ready to go also. A right good caking, says Mrs. Beguiledy. I've made enough on the cakes to pay Weaver, and we've spun a deal. A love spinning's a great salvation. So now you can tell your son, Mrs. San, as we shall be ready with the bride and the linen as well, when he gives the word to make the bed. Beguiledy wrought back as we set out. He was a bit peart, but not drunk. He said he'd met Miss Dorabella's cousin, and that he wouldn't have believed Beguiledy could raise Venus. So he told him to come and see for himself. Venus? Where is the baggage? says his wife. How can you raise her if she inna here? But he'd only sing, Peter sat a weeping, and play very dot and go one on his little flints. End of book two, chapter six. Book two, chapter seven of Precious Bain by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Maester Become. Well, San, says Mother, when we wrought back, we've spun a deal and had a good randy, and now your wedding sheets be on the loom. Gideon looked bashful and said it had be many a long day afore enough of money was gotten together for that. I'll prove one at her table. Eh, did she now? Well done. He could understand that and respect it, for it was what he liked to do. Cake's enough to keep us a week of nine days, says mother. 
She was thinking of the salvation, I make no doubt. No, I wanna, mother, I said. Why, what was it then? I dunno. I just wanted costly colours, mother, I says in a foolish way. But what use be they if you get no cakes with them? I said I supposed they were no use, but all the same I wanted them, the costly colours. She's sleepy, says Gideon, that's what she is, else she'd talk sense. Best go to bed, both. Shanna I bide for the lambs? For at lambing time I was used to sit up part of the nights to let Gideon get a wink of sleep. But he said no, I'd had a day of it, and I might as well finish in style with a good night. I've been as lazy as a lord all day, he says, being obliged to be about the place to do the little jobs. He was a good-hearted lad in spite of all, and if he missed to do a kindness, it was only because he did not think of it, or because his mind was so set on one thing. And times, if he'd been callous, and it was brought home to him, he'd take it very hard, though often it was a long while after. Well, bed then, Prue. Mother hopped about with her stick like a robin with the rheumatics. It's been a grand day, a day to think on and talk over. No wrong neither, for if we be still in our blacks, it was a kindness we were doing. None can blame for a kindness. Did I demean myself well, Prue? Why, yes, mother, no danger. Did I spin well? You spun grand. She ever had this way of asking, like a child, and she wound herself round your heart like a child, too. And such a nice young man, the weaver bee, son, a man any woman had like for a son. Be that wood sieves? Ah, a fine wrestler, they say, a deal of book learning for one of our class, too. Squire offered un a clerking job at the hall, but he wouldna take it. Said he'd liefer work with his hands, and that he couldna abide politics, for they were all lies, and he'd sooner keep clear. I'll weave white linen rather than black lies, he says. And the old squire was very huffy. He'd like to have given Woodseve's warning to leave the place, only the house is hisn, willed by his uncle. Mother wanted to know if I liked the weaver. I thought you didna, my dear, for you never spoke, but went beyond the settle. Like him, I said. Oh, uh, like him? Why, look ye, Prue, you be asleep on your feet, said Gideon. Off to bed now, or you'll do no work today's morrow. But indeed, I was not asleep, but moithered. For it is a strange thing, and very strange, when the maester is come, and you would lief fetch him in and bring out the best fresh butter and cheese in large dishes, and new milk, even to the top of the big steen, and when you've put on your sabbath gown and a posy, and smile at him with a yes for all his askings, and behold, all is nothing, for you have a hair-shotten lip being under the ban of witchcraft. The maester be come, and calleth for thee. The maester be come. All night in the attic I could hear those words, very triumphing and yet sad. And when the dark thinned and shapes began to steal out from the blackness, and the smell of dawn came in, and our gamecock crowed loud and sweet, because it was the beginning of spring, I still heard those words with kindness in them, and a shiver of dread. The maester be come. The words made such a murmuration, and were so piercing sweet, that they wrote them in my book. Of all I had thought to write of the love-spinning and the game of costly colours, and of his coming, I wrote little. Yet when I open the book and see those four words in the very best tall script I could do, 
it all comes back to me so clear as if it was today. I looked at the loom and saw him there, weaving. I looked at my copybook and wondered if he could do the tall script and the short, red and black, plain and flourished, and I was very sure that he could do them all, and more. Next morning, Jancis came running down the path, and I wanted to say, is he well? For it seemed to me that anything might have come to him in the dark hours. But I could only say, when does the weaver go? Oh, tomorrow, she said, as if it was no matter. Then she cried and begged me to help her, for Beguildy was determined to raise Venus to confound the young squire, come what might. And it be me as is to be Venus. Oh dear, oh dear, and it's the day after tomorrow. And I'm afeard, Prue, for if Sa knew that I'd stood up in a room all naked, with a pink lighter shining on me, and a strange man there, Never would he speak to me again. No, I said, for I knew Gideon pretty well. And he'd be bound to find out. Ah, he met. But Feather's mad about it. Raise Venus Yule. He says young Mr. Camperdine laughed so, and clapped him on the shoulder, and said he'd give un five pounds to do it, whatever he raised. Five pounds, Prue, and when I said no, he beat me, and he said if I want to do it, he'll put me to the field work, and beat me every Saturday for a year. Oh, Prue, whatever is to be done? How's he going to set about it? Oh, I'm to be in the cellar under his room, and the trap-doors to be open, and I'm to have a rope under armpits on a pulley to the roof and mother's to be in cellar to light the smoky stuff and put the rope round me proper. Then Feather'll pull the rope in the kitchen under the door, and I shall come up slow under the red light. He says it'll be too dimmery to see my face. But that's poor comfort. It wouldn't be any excuse to San's mind. No. Be you very fond of Gideon, Jancis? Ah, I be. Do ye mind that text, the maester be come? In the Bible? Ah, I mind it. Do you feel that way about Gideon? The pretty colour came in her face. Oh, yes, indeed, San be maester. And the other? Goes to-morrow, you say? What other? Why, Mr. Woodseaves. Oh, he goes to-morrow. Well, look ye, Jancis, I'll do it for you. You? Her mouth was so round and so red in her astonishment that I could have hit the girl. Yes, me. I know it's a funny thing for me to be Venus, I said bitterly. But Feather at no. You say he's to be in the kitchen. And the young man... You say he inna to see your face. It'll be dark, and I'll turn aside, and I'll put the muslin of the currant bushes over my head, so as he wanna see my dark hair. He'll see what he's come to see, the gallus young wretch, a naked woman. Then he'll pay the money, and you'll go free. Oh, Prue, you be good. I love you, Prue. I'll make it up to you some way. The best of it is that it won't matter for you, seeing you'll never have a lover. So cruel can folk be, and mean nothing. This was the reward for my kind act. But those that say good doings are rewarded are wrong. I'd like to have strangled her for that saying. The angry blood was roaring in my ears. Go away now, I said. We'll talk of it tomorrow, but go quickly now out of my sight. And with a puzzled and frightened look, she went. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven
Book Two, Chapter Eight of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Raising Venus. Serious minded folk will need to pass over this raising of Venus, but I will shorten it as well as I can. It seemed a dreadful thing to me as I set forth when the evening came that I should be going to show myself stark naked, for though I knew that Miss Dorabella and other grand ladies did take off the tops of their gowns evenings and come forth half bare and think it no shame, yet women of our sort have more chariness of themselves. As I went in by the garden way, through the door on the low level, not to be seen, I was all of a tremble, and it was only the pitifulness of poor Jancis that made me go through with it. We could hear Beguildy moving about up above, opening the trap-door, and putting all ready. I thought what a silly old man he was, to think anybody believed in his May games. Then we heard young Mr. Camperdine's horse, and there was a shuffling of feet above, and Beguildy pulled on the rope to show all was ready. Oftentimes it is easier to die for love's sake than to be made a fool of for love's sake. So I thought as I was lugged up into the dark room in a cloud of smoke that made me gasp, holding out my hands to keep me from knocking against the sides of the trap and not knowing whether to laugh at the foolishness of it all, or to cry at the sorrowfulness of this play-acting, which so mocked me. For here I was, pretending to be the most beautiful woman that ever was, and a goddess into the bargain, and yet I was cursed, as you know. All was dimmery in the room. I could but just make out a figure at the far side. Beguildy was singing some queer kind of spell in the kitchen, and the young man's horse was stamping and shaking its bridle outside. As I came up clear of the trap, and hung there in the rosy light, the young squire started forward in his chair, and held out his hands like a child at a pastry shop, but I knew he was under solemn oath not to stir from his chair. I thought it must be a strange thing to go through life, with men holding out their hands on this side and on that, to be always the pastry cake in the window with hungry eyes upon it. Then all of a sudden I heard a movement on the other side of the room, and turning that way I could have cried aloud, for there sat Kester Woodseaves. Did ever fate play such a trick? Here was the one man out of all the world that I must hide from, since already I loved him so dear, and so must never hurt him with my grief. And there he was, so close in the small place that two strides would have fetched him to me. He was leaning forward like the young squire, and he made to hold his arms out, and then drew back and gave a sigh. And I know now that the desire of woman was stirring within him. It came on me then with a great joy that it was my own self and no other that had made him hold out his arms. For in that place he could not see my curse. He could only see me gleaming pale as any woman would. Often since I have wondered if he'd have been so stirred if it had been Jancis hanging there, crucified in nakedness, instead of me. Was it all of the flesh as it was with the young squire, or did my soul that was twin to his draw him and wile him, succour his heart and summon his love, even then? For I do think that the spirit makes herself busy about the body, and breathes through it, and throws a veil over it to make it more fair than it is of itself. For what is flesh alone? You may see flesh alone and feel naught but loathing. You may see it in the butcher's shop cut up, or in the gutter drunken, or in the coffin dead. For the world is full of flesh, as the chandler's shelf is full of lanterns at the beginning of winter. 
but it is not till you take the lantern home and light it that you have any comfort of it and i have ever seen that the women with fair mounded cheeks and breasts like the round piat where felina danced yet lacking any soul to laugh or weep in them be not the ones that draw men the ones that lure men to them by the two three the score and the hundred as folk draw towards a lighted church when the easter supper is ready be often those that care not much for their bodies this is a strange thing as true things are often but not so strange as this willing and summoning of a man by a woman flawed and cursed a woman to whom it was said you'll never have a lover two men would have been my lovers that night if i'd willed it so and as i saw the squire's shoulders stoop forward with the weight of his longing i knew for the first time that whatever my face might be my body was fair enough from foot to shoulder i was as passable as any woman could be under the red light my flesh was like rose petals and the shape of me was such as the water fairies were said to have lissome and lovesome i hadn't a cared so much nor been so dismayed at playing this foolish game afore a stranger but now i was all one blush from head to foot and cold as ice as well every second was an hour and i was shamed as if i had gone whoring yet i couldna but rejoice to have given my body in this wise to the eyes of him who was maester in the house of me for ever and ever i pulled the muslin over my face and looked slanting through it towards this wonder for indeed he was a wonder to me then and always not for his looks nor for anything that he did but for the silent power of what he was the power gathered up in him as tremendous as a great mountain on the sky that you could na measure nor name but only feel in the thinning smoke i could see him with his face set beneath the shock of bodily love for whether or not he loved me after he did in that hour and with the wounded look that is ever on the faces of men between the coming of the lust of the eye and its satisfying it takes a long while to write down but i was only in the room as long as mrs beguiledy could count sixty beguiledy was afraid they'd find him out if he allowed them too long never dreaming poor simple fool that neither of them believed a word of his tales while i was still fainty from the shock of seeing kester woodseaves beguiled he called from the kitchen well well gentlemen have i yearned my five pounds ay ay says mr camperdine with his look heavy on me and more and more beguiled he began to sing another foolish rhyme which was the sign for me to be ready to go down never was any woman so glad of a cellar as i was when i wrought back there i got into my clothes as quick as might be for we could hear the squire argufying with beguiledy in the kitchen what now what now speak with the bogey beguiledy was saying now how can ye speak with mrs venus and she dead and gone this thousand year i fetched her back for ye through the grave and gate of death for five pounds in cash but i canna keep her she comes a-walking on the air in a cloud for the time you can count sixty and then she's gone for she is but a beautiful bogey sister and she mun be wrought home by candlelight there was a great burst of laughter at that and as mr camperdine went out to his horse he called back i'll have another look at venus one day beguiledy she's got a very tidy figure by gad wherever she's from as i crept home under the close net of winter boughs my heart was all dumbfounded even as the heart of a bride when first her lover looks upon her beauty only there was shame in this and a great distress 
being that I was no bride, and that I had been stared upon and longed after by a strange man, as well as by him that was the world and all to me, though I had seen him but once afore. It was strange to think that while I went about my housework and out-of-door work to-morrow, slaving like a man at men's jobs, I should be in my own soul the bride of the weaver. While I ploughed with Gideon, turning up the frosty earth, while I cleaned the shippen in my sacking and clogs, while I stood in the mucky fold giving the ducks and fowls their meat, looking more like a man than a woman, and more like a mawkin than a man, all this time I should be woman to him, dwelling beneath the light of his eyes, warmed by his smile, his banner over me being love. While I strode but half a furrow or so behind Gideon, I should be lying trembling in my lover's arms, fainty as I was at Beguildy's. Though my hands were hard and chapped, and my face red and coarsened with weather, I should be, while I thought upon him I loved, a flower and the petal of a flower. For love is a maid you that can turn the swartest woman to a jancis. And though I had but the shadow of it, yes, the shadow of a shadow, as when you see the reflection of a water lily in the mirror, not still but in ripples, so that even the reflection is all distraught and is not wholly yours, yet it has made the world all anew. I wondered if aught could have happened to me in my outward life by the time the water lilies came again, lying along the edges of the mere like great gouts of pale wax. There was but a mockery of them now, for amid the frozen leaves lay lilies of ice. Yet, as I thought of Gaster Woodseaves and what he had come to mean, I seemed to hear and see on this side and on that, in the dark woods, a sound and a gleam of the gathering of spring. There was a piping call in the oak wood, a bursting of purple in the treetops, a soft yellowing of celandine in the rookery. When I was come into the attic, spring was there afore me though it was so cold that my hands could scarce write. Nonetheless, I put down in my book the words, The First Day of Spring, and I wrote it in the best tall script, flourished. So I should ever call to mind the second time of seeing him I loved, and the first time of his seeing me. Not only had he looked at me, but he had looked with favour and longing, and though I knew it was only because the truth was hidden from him, yet I was glad of what I had, as a winter bird is that will come to your hand for a little crumb, though in plenteous times he would but mock you from the topmost bough. I took my crumb, and behold, it was the Lord's Supper. End of Book 2, Chapter 8「Book 2, Chapter 9 of Precious Bane by Mary Webb – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Game of Conquer In the morning Ploughing one of the far meadows with Gideon, I saw yellow nut catkins in the hedge, and brought them home and set them in a jug on my locker in the attic. I plucked them early and tied a bunch to each of the ox's horns, so all that day of sad-coloured weather the white cattle went up and down the red field, which was white over in parts, so that they looked yellow with nodding gold plumes on their heads, as if it was a fair. When we unspanned, Gideon said, What n you been after, bedizening the cattle? It's May Day, I says. Gideon looked be puzzled, but he said, Well, he supposed I liked my jokes, and he didn't complain, so I worked well. When'll this weary old ploughing be done, Gideon, I says, for of all things I hated it, 
not for itself, but because it spread out over our lives till there was no room for anything else. He was in a fever to plough, dawn and dark, frost and rain. He'd be on the land hard at it, and often when it did the land more harm than good. All the farm was to be corn, all the rickyard was to be full of corn. Only grow no corn, he said, and we should be rich afore we knew it. I couldna abide the new law, which made it pay so well. As soon as we've got enow, off we'll go, Prue, and never see the place again, he said. I canna understand that, Gideon, I told un. If you were land proud, I could. But it do seem so queer to spend every bit of time and strength on the land, like a mother with a child, and then not love it. It's as if the mother cared naught for the child, but only cared to sell it. Ah, that's the size of it, Prue. I dunna care a dom for the land, nor yet I dunna care for the money, not as money. Well, what is it you do care for? To get me teeth into summat hard and chaw it, to play conquer, till there inna a cob nor a conquer left but mine, to be king o' the wick and the only apple on the bough. But for why, Gideon? You be always asking me for why, because I was made like that, and I canna go again it. We always came back to that. The thing is to keep the right men in, so as they canna change the law afore we've made our money, he said. It was just as if the country was his momet, to do his will and put crowns in his pocket. Which be the right men? Them as keeps up the price of corn. But the poor folk that clem would leaf have prices down. They mun grin and abide. Let em work. I work, dunna I? Indeed to goodness he did work. He was naught but bone and muscle, and if he was a merciless man, he was merciless to his own self first. I said would he side with Squire at elections, in spite of what Miss Dorabella said? Ah, I doubt I mun. He's got a deal of corn land. He'll never let prices down. And when'll you leave ploughing? Not till we've bought the place, and there's money in the bank into the bargain. But when we've ploughed up all the farm, save what grass we're bound to keep for the beasts, then you'll be bound to stop. No. If we hanna got enough of money, I shall start on the woods. Oh, dearie, dearie me, I said, for I was like to cry. It was the unkindest thing that he should think of the woods. For now there'd never be any rest for any of us, since the woods were ours all round the farm, and there was work in them world without end. The tears rolled down my face, and I could feel them cold and slow as the cold evening light. Why, what ails ye, said Gideon, crying? Bless me, what a wench, look ye girl, we be working for the future. I mislike the future, I said, it's like the bran pie they give the Lullingford children Christmas. You may get summat, but most likely you'll only get a motto, and if you get summat, ten to one, it inner what you want, for what you want inner in the pie. Dear to goodness, what a mort of idle words. The future's as you make it. Why, no, I says, it be like the blue country a traveller sees at dawn, and he dunna know if it'll be a kind country with farms sending up a trail of smoke in the sunset, and a meal for the asking, or if it'll be a wild, savage moor where he'll starve to death with cold afore morning. Why, there now, says Gideon, you're starved with cold, that's what's the matter. You want a cup of strong tea and a good plate of taters and bacon. And hark ye, if that in the mother banging the tray, I'll be donned. 
Poor mother set store by the evening time, being one that liked company. She said the days dragged so in the silent place, and she was timid, startled at the fall of a leaf or the creaking of a door. She was used to plead with me time and again to leave ploughing and bide with her a bit. But I was bound to do Gideon's will, so I made up comfortable tales for her of the day when we'd be well to do, with men and maids and a kitchen girl and no pigs. She'd brighten up a bit, but soon she'd sigh and shake her head. A far cry, a far cry, Prue. Maybe I won a last. I'd leaf things were a bit easier now, my dear. I canna abide tending pigs in the woods. My poor legs do ache, and if I set down, I get the rheumatics. And the pigs do go daggling about down by the water, so my feet be always wet. I'd leaf a less maids and men in the years to come, and less pigs now. I'd leaf a less company then, and a bit more now. All that's a long way off, and no more satisfying than the many mansions of paradise. Tell un that, Prue, tell San, my son, I'd liefer have a few things now, and not so many in the years to come. Ah, I'll tell un, mother, and you must think of the times when we'll leave ploughing. San'll never leave ploughing, or if he does, he'll do summat else. It's this away with un, he canna rest. He's like a man I heard tell of, riding post across the land with dreadful news, foundering nags and buying fresh uns, with no thought but to get there. So when he got there and told the news, he was so fixed in mind he couldn't stop. But rode and rode with no rest, crouching down and cutting the horse by day and by dark, going with no news to nowhere. They sayin' he rides still. I tell you, Prue, it had been better, a power, for us and for him too, if my son San had been born an idiot boy, to play with coloured stones and put daisies on a string. She looked so strange standing there in the fold, with her long staff and red cross over shawl, with her mouth a tremble and her eyes shining like a prophet's, and the great lean pigs grunting and snouting around her and San Mir standing up beyond her, like the blue glass round a figure in a church window. I wondered if ever they put pigs in church windows, in pictures of the prodigal son, and I couldn't help but laugh a bit, in a kind of pitiful way, thinking that this here was the prodigal mother, and how glad we'd be if Gideon was a bit prodigal too. What ails you laughing, she says, only to think as you be the prodigal mother. I dunna understand. I canna understand ever a one of my two chillin. Oh, dearie me, but I take it unkind in you, Prue, to laugh when I be crying. Poor mother, she said true things times. She put words to my own complaint about the world, that laughed, though I cried. There, there, I'll tell Gideon, I said. It was one of the queer things in our lives that I was the go-between, taking messages from mother to son. She could never get courage to begin, nor to face his cold, steely look. Next morning I spoke to Gideon. He was in the field afore me, as always. It was frosty and misty, so the ploughed land looked like tarnished mirrors, or like the mere in overcast weather, sheeny and not solid. Where the frost held and the sun shone, the fields were polished like water with a gleam on it. Gideon and the oxen came on slow, making a little solid dark picture in the lonesome fields. It put me in mind of the black oak figures carved on the peak of the gables on some of the Lullingford houses, and always looking very dark on the sky. The breath of the oxen and the steam from their bodies stood up about them and hemmed them in, 
so as they went up and down they seemed like a picture round and all to itself that somebody was moving about in the waste of fields gideon i says mother be very middlin she wants rest get a lad to mind pigs in the woods a lad dear to goodness what lad there's miller's tim he's not but seven but he could mind pigs and i'd give un his tea what feed a great lad of seven every day of the week save sunday be you mad prue mother's very moped and middling she wants rest and she wants company in the going down of the years and a bit of comfort am na i working for that in is she going to have maids and men the best of good things a pew in church and real chaney to eat off ah in the years to come if she lasts but she met not it be now that matters there's naught ails mother she can go on very well she gets good air minding pigs and she can croodle over the fire after dark to ease the rheumatics and she's moped lad she wants me at home more well you will be when we leave ploughing that's a long day any road you mun get a boy to mind pigs mun mun who be you to say that to me i be maester of san you've no right to drive mother to death when she's old and ailing gideon gave me that withering look may be he says very slow and bitter Maybe you'd like to get wed and bring a lad to sand that away to tend pigs. That is, if anybody'll have ye. He picked up the plough handles and went on down the furrow. It needed a long while in the attic to wash out those words, but the power that was there washed them away in a while. I made allowance for Gideon since he lost so many nights of rest, it being still lambing time, for lambing time is the shepherd's trial. In the black of night, in the dead of the year, at goblin time, he must be up and about by his lonesome, with mist like a shroud on him, and frosty winds like the chill of death, and snow whispering, and a shriek on this side of the forest, and a howl on that side, the shepherd must be waking. Though the pleasant things of day are fouled up and put by, and the comforting gabble and busyness of the house and the fold are still, and the ghosts are strong, thronging in on the east wind and on the north, with none to gainsay them. So when Gideon was short with me, I only took a bit more time in the attic. It was pleasant there when spring drew on, with a dish of primy roses on the table and a warm wind blowing in. When April came, we were still ploughing, and I was so used to it that I'd given over being tired and enjoyed it and sang to myself the while. It was grand to go down the red furrow with the share cutting strong into the stiff earth and shining like silver. It was fine to look away to the blue hills by Lullingford, and see the woods of oak and larch and willow all in bud between, as if a warm wind blew from there and called the leaves. It was pleasant, too, to see the rooks follow in a string at my heels, looking as if they'd been polished with the andrian brush, and to see the birds again that had been away, and to hear the water owls sing wild and sweet and the lapwings changed their winter cry for somewhat warmer. There were violets now to pull for market, and daffodillies in the corner under the ivy hedge, and tight pink buds like babies' little fists in the apple trees. Mother cheered up a bit, and one day, when we were having our tea by the window with a bunch of gillyflowers on table, she said, We'll have the weaver. I gave a gasp and a choke, and mother wanted to know what ailed me. Nought, nought, but why not the weaver's man? It'd be cheaper. I like the best weaving. 
I fell into a dream, for if Kester was going to weave for us, he'd have to come into the attic, walking to and again round the weaving frame, looking out of my little window, making the place his place, so I should have him there for ever after. Yet still I could not abide the thought of him seeing me, and I argued for having the weaver's man, till Gideon thought I was in love with the fellow, though he was said to be simple, and had got fourteen children into the bargain. But mother put on her spectacles and looked at me, and pushed them up and looked again, and settled them in place to look a third time. We'll have the weaver, she said, and that was all. It was the day after this that Jancis came rushing in all wild to say that Beguildy was going to take her to the hiring fair on May Day, unless Gideon could stop it. She came into the dairy where I was churning, and she said, Oh, Prue, the young gentleman's been again, and have me he will, leastways you. She gave a giggle in the midst of her crying, and father says it's that or the hiring fair. It'll be three years, Prue. I'll be bound for a dairymaid or a kitchen wench for three years. That is, unless Gideon offers to wed with me now. Gideon wanna, my dear, he's fixed in mind about the ploughing. Nought'll turn him from that. But I shouldn't a stop it. You'd be another mouth to feed, and if you ailed... I shouldn't a, I'd be stronger than I look. You couldna tell, Jancis. When you wed, you begin a game of blind man's buff that ends you canna tell where. And if little uns came, what about all that money Gideon set on making? Oh, dearie me, oh, I canna bear it, Prue. I do love Gideon right well, and once parted, may be as bad as never met. Well, you talk to Gideon. And will you put in a word, wise-like? Ah, I'll put in a word. But what he wanna do for you, that be his dear acquaintance, he wanna do for me, that be naught but his hard-drove sister. Just then Gideon came across the fold to fetch the buttermilk for the pigs. He stood in the dairy door, and I thought it small wonder she was sweet on him. For in his smock and leather breeches, with his black head bare and his eyes blazing on Jancis, he was as well favoured a man as you could meet in ten parishes. And I thought, as I looked round the dairy, that it was as good a place as anybody could wish for, asking to wed. The sun shone slanting in, though it was off the dairy most of the day. The damp red quarries and the big brown steens made a deal of colour in the place, and the yellow cream and butter and the piles of cheeses were as bright as buttercups and primy roses. Jancis matched well with them, with her pretty yellow hair and her face all flushed at the sight of Gideon. She was like a rose in her pink gown. Outside the window, in the pink budded may tree, a thrush was singing. I mind it all so clear, and should, even if it were not written in my book. You be early, says Gideon. And welcome? Oh, ah, you be surely welcome. She looked at me mischievously, as if she was asking me if I did mind, and stood tiptoe for Gideon to kiss her. I've got news, she says, good news or bad, as you do make it. Me? Ah, it's this away, San. Feather says I mun. She looked at me helpless like. Beguildy wants to sell the child, Gideon. What's the use of mincing words? He wants to sell her to young Camperdine for his pleasure. Jancis hid her face in her hands. And if so be, she says no. She's got to go as a kitchen wench to the May Fair, and be prenticed for three years. What? Sell my girl? Beguiled he'll sell my girl? Dang me, I could drown him dead for that. He's not sold her yet, Gideon. The better for un. 
but she'll be bound prentice for three years away somewhere beyond Lullingford. Gideon stooped and pulled away her hands, looking fiercely on her face. Be you a true wench to me, he says. Dang me, if you've lost your maidenhead to young Camperdine, I'll lay an out with the polax, ah, and you I'll strangle. No, no, son, I hanna, I hanna, she cried out. I be a good maid to you, son, indeed I be. But what's she to do, Gideon, for unless she be the young man's light o' love, she's bound to go away. I canna a bear to go away. She burst out crying again. I waited for Gideon to speak, but he said naught. There's one other way, Gideon. I said it coaxing, for I knew it was his hour of choice for the two of them. The good road for both was in their power to take this day. It was one of the times in Gideon's life when he might choose his blessing, the path of love and merry days, where the pretty pagel grew, the keys of heaven, or the path of strange twists and turns, where there were things of dread, the bane, the precious bane that feeds on life blood. Jansa seemed to know also that their lives in some fashion hung upon this hour. She stooped down and kissed his hand, and she said in a soft, hoarse voice, Oh, be my sweetheart, son. Gideon gave a kind of groan. I know where you be dragging me, Prue, he said, with your eyes so strongly upon me. You be pulling me down to poverty and the loss of all I've dreamt of. I'd work double, lad, I said. What use? You know right well what would happen. Could any man do other with a pretty piece like that for missus? Mouths to feed, mouths to feed. Never no grand house, nor maids and men, nor pew in church, no money for you, no aunt ball for Jancis, no hail fellow well met with the gentry for me. If ever we make any money, it wanna be for years and years. We shall lose the house and go pottering on, eating up all we make. A man with a wife and family never gets on. He mun make his money first. But wouldn't I you work better if you were happy, lad, with Jancis happy too? Why, no, happiness and idleness be twins. If you want to work, you manna be happy nor miserable. You mun just think of work and naught else. Another thing, if I take Jancis now, in the teeth of young Camperdine's longing after her, he'll be again me himself, and he'll set all the gentry again me. Whatever made the man so mad in love, it's done now, and we mun take care. He looked at Jancis suspiciously, and she prayed me with her eyes to explain all. But that I could not do. I'd done a deal for Jancis, but that was too much, for I was afraid that if I spoke at all, it would get round to Kester Woodseaves. Jancis was under promise that none should know, saving only in the utmost need, Gideon. So I kept silence. And I canna see that it made any difference, for speaking would only have put it off, and Beguiledy had made up his mind about Jancis, and if it wasn't the young squire, then it would be somebody else. It was best for Gideon to decide once for all. Then, if he chose right, he and Jancis could be wed, and it would be out of Beguiledy's power to make any more plans. It'll only put off the riches for a bit, Gideon, I said. No, it'll put them off forever and ever. The best thing to put off is getting wed. We'll wait three year. That'll give us time to turn round. Not as I want to put it off. He fell silent, looking at Jancis. I could see the longing in his face, and he was all of a tremble. It was strange to see such a great strong fellow shaking like a woman that's seen frittening. 
He took a step towards Jancis, and I made to go out, for I thought he'd take her in his arms and all be well. But all of a sudden he muttered, No, no, and drew back. Then he said, There'd be no satin gown for ye to dance Sir Roger in at the Aunt Ball then, Jancis. You'd be sorry for that. Ah, well, if you go for a dairy maid or summit, you'll be yearning for it as well as me. Three year in a long. By the end of the three year, all the ploughlands should be bearing well, and us'll be reaping what we've sown. Dear Lord forbid, I says. Gideon fell into a rage, though why I never could think, and burst out. Why that now? Why that? I'm well content to reap what I sow. But not if it's the bane, Gideon, not if it's the precious bane, as I read about in the book the vicar lent me. You dunna want that amid the corn, lad, what grows in hell? Whatever it is, he says, if I sow it and it bring me the things I'd leaf have, I'll welcome it. There came a little sobbing sound from Jancis. And when I looked at her, I saw beyond her golden head the spring day all o'ercast, and the thorn tree lashing in a sudden wind. You'd best be going home along, my dear, I says. There's tempest brewing. I shall come on Sunday and tell your dad what I think on him, said Gideon. No, no, dunna anger him. What do I care for his anger? Oh, she cried out, everything's all as I wouldna have it. Why can a folk live quiet and peaceful? Why must you be so fixed in your mind, San? Hark at the wind rising. There's summit foreboded. She began to cry again, hiding her face in her apron. Oh, I wanted to send out the biddings and be shouted in church, she said, just as she used to say, Oh, I wanted to play green gravel. Gideon snatched her to himself and kissed her, but he did not change his mind. Once he'd made it up, nothing ever would turn him. I mun go, she said. Come and send me, son. As they went, I saw her wringing her hands and heard her say, Oh, I see a dark road going down into the water and the sun's gone out oh san dunna make me walk that road all in a minute she'd faded away like a ghost in the wild dark stormy woods end of book two chapter nine book three chapter one of precious bane by mary webb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Hiring Fair On May Day, there being a deal of stuff for market, I borrowed the mill pony again and set out with Gideon very early, while yet the purple blossom and the green leaves of the lilac trees were all of a grey blur. I'd pulled some lilac overnight for market. So we rode with the sighing of it and the good smell of it all about us. It was a very still morning. Not a breath stirred the young red oak leaves, and even the silver birches that will shift and shiver in any breeze, like water weeds at the lakeside, were all becalmed like weeds far down where not a ripple comes. Save for our horses' hooves on the wet flinty road, there was no sound neither from the grey fields on either side, nor from the water, the woods, or the sky. So still, it seemed to me some miracle might come to pass on such a day. The dawn could not hold its breath more if judgment was to break that eve, and the dead rise. When the colour came in the hedges, the bird's eye, that was in great plenty, looked upon us very simple and innocent, as if thousands of blue-eyed children watched us go by. The ollern trees that fringed the road dripped with yellow catkins. 
Beyond stood the hills, mounded out of sapphire stones like the new Jerusalem, and all becalmed under a sky without so much as a cloud. Not a bird nor a trail of mist or smoke stirred in all the plain. It seemed to me, as I rode alongside of Gideon without a word, while he frowned and darkened, thinking of beguiled thee, that it was like a great open book, with fair pages in which all might read. Only it was written in a secret script like some of Beguildi's books that he never locked away, knowing they were safe. For indeed, every tree and bush and little flower and sprig of moss, every least herb, sweet or bitter, bird that furrows the air and worm that furrows the soil, every beast going heavily about its task of living, be to us a riddle with no answer. We know not what they do. And all this great universe that seems so still is but like a sleeping top that looks still from very swiftness. But why it turns, and what we and all creatures do in the giddy steadfastness of it, we know not. I said to Gideon that it was like a book. Book, he says, why, no, I see no book but I see plenty of good land running to waste, as might be under corn. So we see in the script of God what we've a mind to see, and naught else. We came beneath a wild pear tree in early blow, and it put me in mind of Jancis. Now, I wonder, I said, where Jancis will sleep this night? At Grimble's. How can you tell? I can tell because I say it is to be. Mrs. Grimble is forever changing dairymaids, and I hear tell she's after one this year. It's a long ways off, Gideon. None the worse for that. She'll be out of young Camperdine's way. She'll be terrible lonesome. You can write me a letter to her now and again. And welcome, but how'll she answer? I thought of that. Gideon spoke triumphing like. It's such a great big place that they have the weaver every month or two. Weaver can write for Jancis. What, I says, with my breath very short, knowing I was going to say that name. What, Mr. Woodseaves? No other. Why, dear to goodness, here was a queer trick of fortune for me. I was to write love letters for him I loved to read, and he was to write letters back for me to read, once in every few weeks. I let the pony go her own pace, and we fell behind, for Mill Pony was like Mill Folk, and took everything sad and quiet, as if she'd been discouraged above a bit. There'd be letters coming in the summer days, written in his own script, with his own wording and turns of speech. His hand would have moved slow along every page, over and over, while he looked down at the lettering with those long, shapen blue eyes that pierced to the heart's core. Of course, they'd be letters to somebody else, from somebody else, and it'd be all the wrong way round for his would be in the name of Jancis to Gideon, and mine would be in the name of Gideon to Jancis. It would all be moithered and twisted and topsy-turvy like the water-lily shadows in the mere, when I'd leaf it met be clear and real. Still, I could speak my heart out, I could say the things I'd thought never to say, I could lay my soul as naked afore him as I myself had been for no eyes but hisn would read my letters. Not that my soul was anything to show, but yet I greatly desired to show it. This is a very strange thing, and never to be found in lovers. I could not help but laugh to think what a figure of fun Gideon would look dizen out in my soul, and how dumbfounded Jancis would be hearing things read out of Gideon's letters that no power of angel nor devil would ever make Gideon say, and how she'd pucker up her face and wonder if Weaver were making game of her, and then think, oh well, folks inner themselves when they're writing. 
I was laughing over it all when I heard Gideon shouting, Hi, hi, where been ye going? Pony'll put its foot in the ditch in a minute and break her leg and all the eggs in your basket into the bargain. What ails you dreaming? It was but just in time. Pony and I got out of the ditch as best we might and went on, a bit crestfallen and very mim and careful. Then it came over me on a sudden that I should see the mind of Kester Woodseaves in those letters as open as the sky. I should know him as if I lived along of him, for it inner by the deal that's said, but by what's in the thing said, that you can know a person, just as it inner the extra length or breadth of a gown that keeps you warm, but the quality of the stuff. In all he wrote, I'd find him. For you canna write a word, even, but you show yourself, in the word you choose, and the shape of the letters, and whether you write tall or short, plain or flourished. It's a game of I spy, and there's nowhere to hide. I thought how Mr. Woodseaves would go tramping home, pleased to have done a kindness, and very pleased to be unlocking his own door, lighting his own fire, and keeping himself to himself. And all the while he'd have shown himself to me, let me into the house of his mind, bid me to sit down by the fire of his great kindness. He brought me to his noble house. His banner, it was love. Prue, shouted Gideon, dang the girl, oh, dang the girl. Pony's got her foot in the reins and her teeth in the grass. And here I've been obliged to come back half a mile. Mark it, day and all. Whatever ails you? Be you sickening for summat? Dear to goodness, anybody would think you were in love. After that, Pony and I were very careful. We kept our thoughts on the road and the market. And as you always come at long last where your thoughts are, so we came to Lullingford and found the hiring fair just beginning. The long row of young folks, and some not so young, who were there to be hired, began near our stall. Each one carried the sign of his trade or hers. A cook had a big wooden spoon, and if the young fellows were too gallus, she'd smack em over the head with the flat of it. Men that went with the teams had whips. Hedges a brummock, Gardeners a spade. Cowmen carried a bright tin milk pail. Thatchers a bundle of straw. A blacksmith wore a horseshoe in his hat. And there were a two-three of them, for a few big farms would club together and hire a blacksmith by the year. Shepherds had a crook and bailiffs a lantern, to show how late they'd be out and about after robbers. Though, as Gideon said, Having a lantern is no promise that a man'll so much as put his nose out of the bedclothes after dark, then it's a promise when a chap agrees to the text, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbour's house, of a Sunday, that he wanna spend all the week trying to compass it. Which was just what Gideon did himself. There were tailors and weavers, wool carders and cobblers too, for the farmers clubbed together for them also. The carders had a hank of coloured wool, and the tailors made great game running up and down the line of young women and threatening to cut their petticoats short. Jancis laughed with the rest, but I could see she'd been crying. She looked a real picture in her print gown and bonnet with the dairymaid's milking stool. They were a tidy set of young women, the housemaids with broom on shoulder, the laundry maids with dollies. It was no wonder that many a young farmer, who wanted neither cook nor dairymaid, would linger a bit, and that it should come into his mind that he wanted a wife. There's Grimble, said Gideon. I made sure he'd come because of the bull-baiting. He's just got a new dog, I hear tell, as fierce as fire. There was most always a bull-baiting after the Mayfair, and it was a thing I could na abide. I looked where Gideon pointed and saw Mr. Grimble, 
a man with a long nose that looked as if he poked it into everybody's business and stirred up trouble. Be that his missus, I said. Gideon looked at the woman. Like a gingerbread doll, flat and baked pale, with currenty eyes, and said it was. Very near, and a driver, I said. Well, chances'll take a deal of driving. The pretty ones be always the idle ones, and she's used to being clemmed at home. She'll see she done a clem too much. He seemed quite unconcerned. She'll be better, a power, at a small place with nice folk that'd treat her kind, I said. What for do you want her to go to Grimble's? More money. They give a better wage than smaller folk. We mun think of that first. The bane, I whispered, the precious bane. For indeed this talk of money was beginning to wear on me like a song sung over and over, and a song misliked to start with. Gideon had spoken to Farmer Grimble about chances. So, as she never dared to go against his word, she beckoned to Beguiledy and said, Mr. Grimble's missus'll hire me, feyther, if you please. Oh, her will, will her? And what'll you give me for the wench for three year? Eighteen pound. Make it twenty and you shall take her. Nay, nay, it's too much. She can work if she's a mind. She's strong. I give you leave, if you make it twenty, to drive if she wanna be led. If you lay finger on my girl, it'll be the worse for ye, said Gideon, and she's to have the money, not you, Beguiledy. Hearken, hearken, did you ever hear the like? A fellow that was born under the threepenny planet, and sleeps on face, and'll come to be drowned. Gideon fell into a sudden rage, and gave him a great clout with the flat of his hand, and beguiled he screamed out, I'll pay ye, I'll pay ye for this, curse ye, the very spit of your dad you be. You owe me a crown, he says, going by me on a blast of air, and you canna leave me and mine alone. Curse ye, in sowing and harvesting, in meadows and housen, by fire and by water. A waxen man, I'll make a waxen man this night and call it San. Slow, slow it'll consume away, San, the sin-eater. Gideon looked at him, making no sign. The people drew back a bit, fearing they knew not what. Just then, elbowing through the crowd, came the young squire, Mr. Camperdine's nephew. I heard, he says to Beguiledy, that Venus was come to the hiring fair. My aunt wants a still-room maid, and I came to see if Venus... If you mean Jancis Beguiledy, sir, says Gideon, speaking quick, she's prenticed already. What, so soon? Ah, to a farmer a great way off. He looked hard at Mr. Camperdine, and Mr. Camperdine looked hard back. It's a great disappointment, says Mr. Camperdine, for my good aunt. Your lady aunt, sir, says Gideon, very dry-like, will soon find another maid. Never faithful to one long, if I may make so bold, your lady aunt inner, sir. The young squire frowned, but looking around and seeing nobody but Jancis, short and plump, he supposed the one he was after had gone already and so thought further argling, but a waste of time. He sighed and said to himself, So Venus vanishes, and went away, and very glad I was to see the last of him. Beguiledy and Jancis went to the inn with the Grimbles to sign the prentice paper binding Jancis for three years. She was to drive back with them that night. She was free till then, and Gideon said, seeing she was going to work for Lullingford New House, she ought to have a look at it. So off they went, while I minded the stall. I'd all but done, for the place being fuller than ordinary, the things went off pretty quick. The lines of young people had shrunken till there were only a few left that were wanted by none. 
These were such as were known to be over-fond of the bottle, or to have a base-born child, or to be incurables of some crippling disease, or not to know rightly what was their own and what was other people's. I used to wonder how they felt, poor folk, going jogging along in the evening, back where they came from. I was glad I worked at home, and had no need to go and be hired, for certain sure nobody had have taken me. It was a bitter thought, that. The market-place was emptying fast, for the people were getting some refreshment afore the bull-baiting, but I'd still got some daffodillies to sell, and Gideon didn't like anything to go back. So I sat still in the quiet afternoon, looking down the empty street where the shadows of the lilacs and the sainty trees lay very dark and pleasant. I noticed that Mrs. Grimble was there too. She was packing up, and as she put each pat of butter into the basket, she gave it a look as much as to say that she'd give it a bit of her mind after for not being sold. In a while she came across to me. You be sister to my new dairymaid's young man, binna you? Ah, I'm in be hopes they're serious. Oh, ah, that's right. I like my wenches to be walking out afore they come, and with a chap at a distance. I've got sons, and it's a deal safer. And so long as the chap's at a distance and canna be got at, it dunna hinder the work. Well, I'll be going now. They loose the first dog on the bull in an hour, and I must get a cup of tea first. I never can enjoy anything proper, nor take notice, if I'm clemmed. Whether it's a wedding or a confinement, a baiting or the Lord's Supper, I canna truly enjoy it, as it should be enjoyed, unless I've got a pint or two of good strong tea inside me. Well, good day. It's a great affliction for ye. She went back to her stall to gather her baskets. There now, never could I be left in peace. Never could I be let go away from my misfortune. Here I sat as peaceful as could be, till she must come up and say that, a great affliction. But afore she said it, I'd forgotten it, so I hadn't got it. I was out of the cage, till she put me in again. I was vexed and the tears stood in my eyes. Suddenly, along the quiet road, through the shadows and through the mists on my own eyelashes, I saw somebody coming. A man, it was, and if there be any meaning in the words, as I hanna thought on, let them that read put it in. Let them put the strength and the power, the kindness and the patience, the sternness and the stately righteousness of all good men into that word, and let him wear it, for it was himself, Kester Woodseaves, the maester. He came along without haste, as if he had some great business to attend. I saw that he was in his best, the black beaver hat, green coat, flowered waistcoat, and the Wellington boots. Weaver, Weaver, called Mrs. Grimble, when'll you work for me next? He looked up and came our way. What did I do, I that knew his smile was my summer? Why, I got up so hasty that I upset the daffodillies. I left all our baskets and buttercloths and the jam pots for flowers, and I ran from the place as if summit was after me. But being that the market was at the end of the road, and only open in front, there was nowhere for me to go but into the market-keeper's office, which was a dark room at the back of the market, and had a small window with no glass, looking on the stalls. So I could not help but hear all they said. Why, look ye, Mrs. Grimble screamed out like a cackling hen. Hers fled away, as if you were the murrain or the lord of the bailiffs. What ails the wench? Mostly I see em run to, and not from, when a young chap comes along. Who be she? asked Gaster. He had ever a very out of the ordinary voice. It was like as if, when he spoke, the sound of the speaking made the world new for itself, not caring about the old world. 
It was like a wide, blossomy thorn tree on a sweltering day in early June. You could sit down under it and rest you, and it was like the still hearth fire on a winter night, when wild Edric's out in the forest, and the curtains be close, candles snuffed all fast, and the master of the house wrought home. Who be she? he says, and even though it be only a passing thought and three words, I'm a flower that knows the sun. Why, her be San, sister, from away yonder at the mere, Prue San, the woman with the hair shot and lip, a very queer creature, but it makes them queer, you mind, to be born the like of that. Some say she's a bit of a witch. He said naught. But he went across and picked up my flowers, setting them in the jam pots, man's fashion, a bit clumsy and all thumbs, enough to make you cry with love. I could see from the dark at the back of the office. A very neat, tidy figure she's got, he said, and in a minute I knew that he knew I'd heard, and so would ease the wound. Oh, most kind maester! the very marrow of him that loved the world so dear. "'Be you going to the baiting, Mr. Woodseaves? asked Mrs. Grimble. "'Why, yes, and no to that. "'Eh?' "'You'll see in good time, Mrs. Grimble.' With that he went on his way. And what did I do? I did a thing I never thought to do for any man, so forward it was. I came out of the dark room straight into the sunlight, and step by step along the road I followed him, as if I'd no bashfulness at all, such as every girl should have. I kept a long way back, for fear he might turn about and see me, but I never let him out of my sight. It seemed as if I couldna. I was drawn on and on. If I lost sight of his green coat round a turn of the road, I was all distraught till I got sight of it again. The bullring was well beyond the town, in a green meadow where a brook ran. And though if you'd gone a-walking in that green meadow any other day in the year, to gather lilies or forget-me-nots, or to walk beside the water, folk would have thought it a soft thing to do. It was all right and proper to-day, because they were going to kill a creature there. The people in the road never noticed me in my plain black, with my face hid in my bonnet. From a good way off I could see the ring, and the bright colours of the gowns and coats all jumbled together, and a deal of sad colour from the coats of the working men, who could seldom afford a best coat save the funeral coat of the family. I could see the bull, a little white one, tied to a staple in the wall of the bull ring which was a semicircle built of rough grey stones. The bright yellow sunshine held them all, as if they were bees in the mid of the honeycombs, and the blue air, the brown water, the green meadow were all so fair I could not believe blood must be shed on such a day. I wonder to myself, times, if it was fair clear weather on Golgotha when Mary looked up at the cross and whether there were some small bird singing, and the bees busy in the clover. Ah, I think it was glass-clear weather, and bright, for no bitter lacked in that cup, and surely one of the bitterest things is to see the cruelty of man on some fair morning with blessing in it. End of Book 3, Chapter 1Book Three, Chapter Two, of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Baiting. As I came near, I saw that, as the custom was, not only all the women of Lullingford were there, but all the children as well. I thought it shame to bring these poor things that would soon enough know the evil of the world, to see the dogs torn to ribbons, and the hapless beast killed. I said so after to Gideon, 
but he thought nothing of it. Why, you'd make them as soft as all, he said. They mun be brave and well plucked. I said I could na see that it was soft not to like to see a cruel deed, and that it seemed to me to be braver not to like seeing another's pain. Well, well, we canna make the world, for it's made already, says Gideon. There it all was, then, the crowd, the shouting and betting, the yapping and snarling of the dogs, people elbowing and pushing, men crying hot taters and chestnuts, apples, spiced ale and gingerbread, children in their white pinnies watching the bull, very skeered, for it was grumbling to itself. Poor thing, it was thinking of its own big blackberry pasture at the back of Callard's dingle, I make no doubt. It hated neither men nor dogs, and had no grudge against any, if only it could be back there, roving the meadows in the dew. There they all were, and there was Kester. I lost sight of him in the crowd, and hastened my steps, with a wonder in my heart the while what he could be doing in such a place, for I thought him to be a different kind of man from all these. Yet such faith I had in him that I was sure, if he was here, that he was here for good. And something drove me on, so that I must seek him in the crowd and keep nigh him, as if I was his angel for that day. A poor angel, but God minds not much, I think, what like his angels be, so that they do his work proper. The shepherd's collie that runs home to warn the missus that her man has fallen down the rock is his angel sure enough, though he may be a mongrel of the very worst, with ears as flat as a spaniel. Blindly and without reason, like the shepherd's dog, I kept close to Casterwood Sieves, yet not so close that he might see me. So it was that I heard all he said to the men who stood round about the ring with their dogs, a bit apart from the crowd. And though they were men of my own countryside, and some of them known to me, yet I must say that there were among them a two three very evil faces. The dogs were fierce and ugly, many of them with great jowls, snarling and slavering and showing the red of their eyes. Yet if I had been bound to choose between men and dogs, I'd have chosen the dogs. Mostly they were terriers, but there were a good few bulldogs, and of these Grimble's new one was far the worst, with a grin that sent me cold. There were one or two with a lot of mastiff in them, and there were a mort of mongrels. The men all turned towards Castor when he came up, and Farmer Huglet, the chief of them, called out, Where's your dog? Mr. Huglet was a great raw-looking man who seemed as if he'd come together accidental and was made up of two or three other people's bodies. He was a giant, very nearly, and clumsy with tremendous long arms and so big round the middle that tailors who brought their own stuff always charged extra for his clothes. He'd got a mouth like a frog, and a round red snub nose, and such little eyes that they were lost in the mountains of flesh that made up his face. Whenever he couldn't understand anything, he laughed, and his laugh was enough to frighten you. It came pretty often, too. Grimble was hand in glove with him, and while Huglet stuck his red snub nose in the air, Grimble kept his long pale one down. So between them they didn't miss much. They'd each got two dogs. Why, it's Weaver, says Grimble. Dunna you know Weaver, Huglet? Why, no, we hanna crossed paths afore. My brother-in-law weaves for me, you mind. Well, Weaver, where's your dog? I've got none. No dog? Stand aside, then. But he stood where he was. 
it so happened that he was about at the mid of the half moon of grey stone that made the bull ring and the men with the dogs fell away a bit on either hand so he was alone standing there so slim and straight in his green coat with the airs blowing his hair a bit so that a lock of it fell o'er his brow his hat being under his arm he seemed to have naught to do with any there but to be a part of the fair meadow that matched his coat he wore no beard nor whiskers so you could see the shape and colour and line of all his face which seemed to me to be a face you could never tire of looking on times i wonder if heaven will be thus a long gazing on a face you cannot tire of but must ever have one more glimpse he had a kind of arrowy look so that though huglet towered over him he seemed to tower over huglet he looked round about and said chaps i've come to ask ye to stop this there was a long bepuzzled silence then huglet laughed and slapped his thigh and roared again Grimble looked at his boots and gave a snigger. Well, that's a good un, shouted Huglet. Stop the bull baiting, oot, young fellow. Ah, I'd leaf stop it. And what for would you stop it, dear Art? asked Grimble in a soft sing song voice. Stop it, roars Huglet. He canna stop it. I'd leaf it was stopped over all England. You'd leaf a deal, young man. Why, I tell you there's been bull-baiting in England ever since it was England. Take away the good old sport, and it wouldna be England. All this he said in the same loud, roaring voice. I asked ye what for would ye stop it, repeated Grimble, soft and obstinate. Because it's a cruel, miserable business. It inna cruel. The dogs like it they enjoy it and the bull likes it right well mr grimble looked down at the trampled grass for all the world as if he was reading the words there what's it matter if they enjoy it or not i enjoy it says huglet that's enough inna it the other men drew round for though it was the ordinary thing to hear mr huglet shout fit to burst it was out of the common to hear him shouting so long at one person. When Huglet shouted like he was doing now, folk said that the person he was shouting at always gave in and went away quiet. What be trouble? asked Mr. Callard, the owner of the bull. Mr. Huglet turned round and spluttered out. This here borsted fellow wants to stop the baiting. The baiting, mind, as we all come a many weary miles to see rising up a great while afore day puts in mr grimble dear now and missus and me at such trouble to bring the beast along bright and early whatever ails them on he looked at kester as the apothecary will look at a man a long while sick ah says the landlord of the muggo cider i've heard tell of folks as wanted to stop the long kneeling I've even heard of a two three as wanted to stop wars and rumours of wars. But bull-baiting? Never in life. Whoever, save a few fratchety parsons, did ever want to stop a baiting. He must be going a bit simple, poor fellow, says Grimble. Feel well, weaver. The miller came up and had a look, shook his head, and went away, which was a great deal for the miller to do. But what for do ye want to stop it like? says Mr. Callard, very puzzled. I've told em why. Never mind all that. Look ye, Mr. Callard, will ye sell the bull to me? Sell un? Ah, I wanna argle and bargle over the price. But it wouldna be worth my while. I'll get more, a power, by letting un fight, win, and I'll be a rich mon lose and i'll get best butcher's price from the ring owners sister what had you make if he won twenty pound i'll give you twenty pound and you can take the beast away god bless me says mr callard oh god bless me i'm sure 
He stared at Kester as if he was spirit-struck. Bargain, says Kester. Mrs. Callard, who never spoke but after Callard spoke, and then said the same thing, and never did aught but what she was told to do, came up all in a flusker leading the bull. Take the gentleman's offer, father. Take it, my dear, she said, all out of breath. Take the twenty pounds, and us'll lead the darling home. Callard was so astounded at her daring to speak, that he could only keep on saying, God bless me. God bless ye, is it? says Huglet, beginning to roar again. I'll give ye God bless ye, if you do any such thing, Callard. Dang me, spoil all our sport for twenty pound, I'll larn ye, and you too, young man. Oh, but he mun be worse than soft or simple. He mun be stark raving mad to offer twenty pound for the little beast, and then give back what he's bought, says Grimble. Oh, I could cry, yet the poor chap was all right Monday was a fortnight, weaving for us as nice as nice. But he's gone wrong in the yed since, surely to goodness. Oh, dear me. He wiped his face and seemed quite taken to. Kester pulled out his wallet and offered Callard the money. It was pretty well all his uncle left him, I doubt. By this, Mrs. Callard had called all the children to her, for they had five children as well as the baby, and she whispered them. And all of a sudden they cried out together, Take it, Feather, take it, honoured Feather, we beseech thee to hear us. At the surprise of that, Mr. Callard seemed to be quite moithered, and he reached out his hand to Kester for the money, but Mr. Huglet struck it down. I wanna be robbed of my sport, he says. Dunna you dare take it, Callard, we want our sport, I tell ye. All the men with dogs looked black and muttered. Ah, that's righteous, that's gospel, we want our sport. Chaps, says Castor, very pleading, it be pity on so fine a day to set one poor creature to tear another. Devil's work it be. If it's fighting you want, why canna you rustle or box man to man? Look ye, to make a bit of sport, I'll take any six of ye on, one after another, to rustle. The one that beats me by most shall take my coat, and the next shall take my hat and waistcoat. Now then. Nobody said anything, only they shuffled a bit, and looked here and there. Everybody seemed to know that Kester was a very good rustler, and nobody seemed to take to the job. Mr. Grimble looked at Kester as if he hated him and it was plain by what came next that he did in very truth for now having made up his mind not to play second any more to mr huglet he up and said the young man speaks well now i'll fall in with all he says and agree to the stopping of the baiting this day on one condition out with it says castor that you take on the dogs yourself Mr. Grimble gave a spiteful cackling laugh, and Mr. Huglet roared again. Got ye there, me lad, he shouted. And Grimble said, You may love the dumb creatures with your purse, but ye wanna go so far as to love them with your own blood. Go on with the baiting, orders Mr. Huglet. Tie the beast up again, says Mr. Callard to his missus, who was standing by eager to hand it over to Kester, so as he could give it back as he said. Whose dog drew first? Mr. Huglet took no more notice of Kester, but went on with the arrangements. Mr. Towler's dog drew first, and Mugosider's second, said one of the owners of the bullring. Come forward, Towler. Kester stood very still, eyeing Mr. Grimble, till he got quite put about, for he didna seem to want to meet Kester's eye. That'd be the best bit of sport ever you had, eh, Mr. Grimble, says Kester at last, to see a man baited like a bull. Why, nobody had be such a fool. Kester looked round. Chaps, he says, if so be as I agree to Mr. Grimble's plan, and take on the dogs one by one, 
not to kill em, but to put em on chain with naught but my bare hands, and they as savage as you like. If I do this at my own risk, will you give me in writing, as there wanna be another baiting in Lullingford for ten years? And if I fail to put any dog on chain, I've lost, and the baiting goes on. Everybody's tongue was loose at that. God bless me, dear to goodness. Dom it. Well, that beats all, dang it. Days my owns. There was a regular clack of voices. One or two called out that they wouldn't agree to it, but mostly they were very curious to see what would come of it, and as it was known that the parson didn't like the baiting and had been weriting the squire to put a stop to them, everybody thought they might be stopped soon anyway, and so they might as well have the fun, for this was a chance of rare sport and the like of it had never been seen in the place. When Mr. Huglet could speak for laughing, he explained to all the people what was doing. Hands up for it, he called out. All but a dozen held up their hands. Done, says Mr. Huglet, and done for, my fine fellow. I caught hold of Miller's Tim, and told him to go to Kester and whisper as Grimble's dog was a new one, and extra bad in temper. But indeed I felt that neither this nor anything was any manner of use, and I couldn't think of aught to do. But one thing I was determined on, I'd keep nigh him, and when he was down I'd rush in and drag him away, and if Grimble interfered I'd be the worse for un. There's none so fierce as a loving woman, and it always seemed a strange thing to me that the mother of Jesus could keep her hand off the centurion, and it could only have been because her son had given orders afore. But indeed, if it had been me, I think I should have forgot the orders. Tim came running back, and I saw those strong blue eyes follow and settle on me for a breath. Then I hid behind Mrs. Callard. He knowed it, said Tim, but obliged all the same. I went to the refreshment booth and stole the carving knife, but almost afore it was hidden under my flounced skirt, I saw that there was to be no need of it, anyway, for a while. There was to be somewhat more like a miracle than anything I'd seen afore. This was the way of it. Go to the mid of the wall, says Huglet, and fasten the dogs to the bull chain. And if you fasten either of mine, I'll give ye five shillings, me lad. Oh, I could burst a laughing to see anybody be such a fool. Mr. Towler's dog, says the head of the ring. Ready. They loosed Towler's terrier, the savagest little beast in the place. At him, bite him, shouts Towler and I was like to faint, and then it came to pass. Kester stepped forward. Well, Bingo, he says, good dog. Bingo stopped, looked at Towler as much as to say he'd made a mistake, and ran to Kester as pleased as Punch, wagging tail and fawning round. We be friends, Binoe, says Kester. Towler gave a curse, and Huglet looked as black as night. But nobody could say it won a fair and square, and some of the better sort laughed and said, Good for you, lad. It was the same with the mug of cider dog, and the next. As the owners came up to fetch them when they were on the chain, they looked very old-fashioned and taken aback. Kester laughed. I like a dog, he says. Dumb things be my fancy. You could na know it, but so it is. And I can only see one dog here, as in a friend to me, being new come to these parts. Ah, says Grimble, you wanna play your May games with Toby. Indeed to goodness, if you get off with your life, you'll do well. All in a minute I thought of a better thing than the carving knife, though I kept that in case of need. I'd run to the town for the apothecary there being no doctor in the place, to have him there in case of harm. There were a sight more dogs yet, for they wouldn't let him off any. 
there might be time if I was quick. So with the carving knife still under my dress, I edged out of the crowd, got into the road, and ran for dear life. But afore I went, I took one look at him I did love, since if I wasna quick enough, I might never see him alive again. He was laughing, and Huglet was leading one of his dogs away. Though Kester didn't a weave for Huglet, he'd made friends with his dogs on market days outside the mug of cider, seemingly. He'd such a way with animals that a two-three minutes was enough, and they were friends to him forever. And as I looked back, it seemed to me, though I told myself it must be fancy, that those eyes, so live and bright, dwelt on me and smiled at me, friended me and pled with me, being as are the eyes of a man when he looks long upon his dear acquaintance, who has given her peace for his, her soul to his keeping, and her body for his joy. But as I ran, I said to myself, Nay, Prusan, you be naught but his angel, and a poor daggly sort of angel too. And all the bluebird's eyes in the hedge banks went into a mist of tears as I ran, and looked no more like flowers, but like a blue tide of sorrow to drown me. End of Book Three, Chapter Two. Book Three, Chapter Three of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The best tall script flourished. I may say I went over the distance to the town quicker than it's been done this long while. I hid the carving knife in the hedge for fear of tripping over it. The apothecary's was open, as I thought, for he was churchwarden, and couldna go again the parson. I never saw the big green and red bottles look so beautiful, as if they were full of water from Paradise River. Inside there was a pleasant dusk, for the little windows were so close set with liniments and medicines, drenches for horses, simples for cows, plaisters, cordials, and bunches of yarbs, that you could na see at all. It smelt very pleasantly of peppermint, yarbs, and soap, and the apothecary looked at me kindly over his spectacles and asked what the matter was. Why, sir, it's murder pretty nigh, I says. I do beseech you to shut up the shop and come, or such a man as this town never saw afore, nor will again, will be done to death. He pulled on his boots, good man, at that, what remedies must I bring, he says. You can tell me the rest as we run. So I told him summat for dog bites, and summat to bring a man round when he was near death. In a minute he clapped his hat on, and off we went. Take a supper brandy, he says, you're nigh done. But I told him, no, only if I fell behind, he must hasten on to the bullring. I fell back just afore we got to the carving knife, and caught up again at the field gate. As we came in, I could see an awful struggle going on, for we were only just in time. He'd finished, but for Grimble's dog. As we came up, there was a roar. He'd got the dog chained. Then there was another roar, and I saw, oh, my dear love, that the dog had got him by the throat. I caught Grimble's shoulder. Take your dog off, I said. Grimble never stirred. A second of that grip, and he as I loved so dear, had be dead and cold. I rushed forward, I, that has never willfully hurt any living creature, and as the great beast stood reared with his teeth in my maester's throat, I ran him through the heart. The blood spurted, and the heavy body fell down all of a heap and Kester with it. I pulled him away and dragged the dog's jaws apart. There seemed to be no life in Kester. Water, I says to Huglet, who chanced to be nighest. Fetch water, you murderer. Brandy, Mr. Camlet, please. He stooped over Kester. I mun burn the bite, he said. 
Best do it afore we bring him round, but how to heat the iron. I stood up. I cared for nobody. They couldn't have been more feared if I'd been a savage queen. Six men pick up sticks, I says, and quick about it, and you, Grimble, find flint and tinder. I had na got one, he muttered. Find one, I screamed like a wild thing, holding up the knife. Find one, or... The fire was blazing quicker than it takes to tell it. We poured a little brandy down Kester's throat to keep the spark of life in. Then Mr. Camlet burnt the bite, and Kester awoke with a shout of agony, for being in a dead swound he hadna been ready for the pain. There, there, my dear, I says, for the shriek went through my heart. There, there, it be done now, none shall touch you now. Mr. Camlet bound him up, and I washed his face with cold water and gave him more brandy. Not a deep wound, says Mr. Camlet. We were only just in time, though. We couldn't help but be in time, I says. I be his angel for today. And with that the green field swam up before me, and I swound it clean away. When I came to myself, there were Gideon and Jansa sitting by me on the grass, and all the folks were gone. Where be he? I says. Who, Weaver, says Jancis, he be all right and cared for. They've took him back to Lullingford, and Mrs. Callard'll stop with him. She's mighty pleased with the little bull, said Gideon. You saved that chap's life, and no mistake, Prue. I never saw the like. We were just coming in at the field gate, and I looked across and saw you. By gum, I says, and that was all I did say. I ran, and Jancis ran, but you'd done for the old dog afore we could come at you. You take the medal, Prue. You canna ride home, Prue. Shall I run and ask Miller to take her, San? And couldna I come back and give her a hand with the work for a day or two? You can ask Miller and welcome. It's a good thought. But as for coming back, you know very well you're Grimble's vessel made now till three years i didn't want to be it's you and feyther made me well but you've seen the house hannah you you'll be working for that and the aunt ball and the silver plate ah i've seen the house and i think it looks a dark bitter old place for all it's new and i'd liefer never go to no aunt ball than lead the life of a driven slave she was crying, but it made no manner of difference to Gideon. You've got to go to Grimble's, and you've got to go to the Aunt Ball in good time, so why make such a ding-dong? But why must I, San? Because my mind's set. It was almost as if he said, because I'm in the stocks, as if his maid called him to come maying, but feet and hands he was fast bound. When she was gone, they gave me a sup of tea at the mugger cider, for I was all of a tremble still, and then Miller helped me up into the gig, and the old coach horse that had known the merry sound of the horn tooting and the sudden light and commotion at the turnpikes when they rushed out in the dead dark to open, laboured into a trot, for indeed he seemed much of Mrs. Miller's mind, caring not if he never saw home again. Mrs. Miller had naught to say. Miller, as usual, had naught also, and Polly was asleep. After a while, Mrs. Miller and Tim went to sleep too. We drove on sadly in the chilly evening. It was dusk, and then it was dark. Gideon was far ahead, for Bendigo was a good trotter, though aged. The mill pony tied to the back of the gig clopped onwards with a sorrowful sound. It suited me, the quiet and the melancholy, for I was sad and quiet too. He that I loved was hurt, and I could na get to him. There he lay, as weak as a babe, and only Mrs. Callard to tend him. I forgot that she, having six, was well knowledged in the tending of helpless folk, 
for it is the way of lovers to think that none can bless or succour their love but their own selves and there is a touch of truth in it maybe more than a touch we went on and on through country that was neither hilly nor flat in a night neither dark nor gleamy feeling neither glad nor sorry i thought we were like people bound for some place beyond the world that was neither hell nor heaven our six heads counting the nags all nid nodded and i think we were all asleep even the old coach horse when the miller spoke out of his sleep i do believe i canna abide them he said with a nod towards his wife and children i wish they were kit cats to drown in mill pond i wish the world and all was a kit cat he said no more it was like when they say the creed solemn and choppy that was all the miller ever said to me and i do think he said it in his sleep on we went till we came to the dark mill the soundless water like soft black crepe the others got out and untied the pony and miller drove me back to san the night was full of the smell of water and moss with a drift of primrose scent now and again i thought of the weaver's house that seemed built of a spell and him lying there in the kitchen with the loom his face barred with the shadow of it cast by the rushlight his hair all tousled and damp with the sweat of pain if mrs callard spoke unkind to him i could slap her babby i thought but i knew she wouldn't uh. she was a good soul though i always thought she must have a mind like a shell hollow to echo other people as she did when we came to our place there was mother on the door sill very concerned she said what nobody else had and what i had never thought of you met her have been killed prue she sat down and began to cry so i had to laugh at her and asked for summer to eat to show i was alive all right so then she got me such a meal as never was though she should by rights have been asleep hours seemingly gideon had told her some sort of tale but she must know more she wasn't to be satisfied but kept on wanting more she put on her spectacles and looked at me very attentive sitting there in the big oak chair i was quite put about with her staring so with that still look of a sitting bird when somebody comes and spies at her and she never winks nor flinches but just looks back with sharp brown eyes as much as to say i'll stand by what's mine mother seemed to be looking past me at summit that threatened me maybe it was my fate as she thought it to be it was summit that threatened to do me harm i'm sure for after a bit mother looked very defiant and sat up ever so straight and said we'll have the weaver just as if somebody forbade her to have him she said naught of all i'd told her never a word about it being a foolish or forward thing to save a young man's life without with your leave or by your leave she only kept on giving little nods now and again and saying ah come summer we'll have weaver then she said she'd go to bed now and i went and wrote in my book there was no change in our lives only it was quieter without chances coming in of a sunday the stone house seemed very lonesome lacking her and mrs beguiledy not half the woman she had been she seemed to cling to me and kept talking of the little ways and sayings of Jancis as if she was dead. This made Beguiledy very angry, for in truth he was sorry Jancis was gone, not only because of the young squire, but because in her unhandy way she'd got through a good bit of work. He'd say, Now hush thy noise, woman, the wench will be back in no time, with twenty pounds in hand, dear me now dunna go to talk of her as if she was dead fool a gamesome lusty young woman the like of that many's the golden pound her'll put in our pockets when she's learnt her duty and given over hankering after a man as was born under the threepenny planet and'll come to be drowned 
no offence meant, Prue, and none taken I'm in be hopes. You ploughed the gorsty bit right tidy, Prue, and us'll do words of four syllables this day, if you've a mind. Oh, there's no doubt beguiled he was a very queer old man. I was used to think, if he'd had a good education, he met have been one of these great men we all think so much of. A great scholar he could have been, or a music man, or a rhymer, or a preacher. And maybe if all of his mind had been used proper, he wouldna have brought ruination on himself as he did. Ah, and on more than his self. But that we cannot know. We are his mommets that made us, I do think. He takes us from the box whiles, and saith, dance now. Or maybe it must bow, or wave a hand, or fall down in a swoon. Then he puts it back in box, for the part is played. It may be a mumming, or a Christmas or Easter play, or a tragedy. That is as he pleases. The play is of his making, so the evil mommets do his will as well as the good, since they act the part set for them. How would it be if the play came to the hour when the villainous man must do evilly, and see, he is on his knee-bones at his prayers? Then the play would be in very poor case. There was a mommet once called Judas, and if he had started away from his set part in fear, we should none of us have been saved, which is all a very strange mystery, and so we must leave it. But it being so, I think we do wrongly to blame ill-doers too hardly. It is a dreadful fate to be obliged to act in a cursed, ugly way, when surely none would choose it. Needs be that offences come. How should Gabriel show his skill with a two-edged sword, if Lucifer wouldn't fight? But woe be to him by whom they come. Ah, so if the play has a murder in it, or if a good maid is brought to shame, a mommet must be found to do the bad work, though very like, if they could choose, never a one but would say, not me, maester, only they know naught. For I think we be not very different from the beasts that work deathly harms in the dark of their minds, knowing nothing, weltering in blood, crouching and springing on their prey with the sound of shrieks in the night, and yet all the while as innocent as a babe. And I think we be not very much other than the storms that raven in the forest, and the hungry fire that licks up lives in a moment, and the lips of the water sucking in our kin. It is all in the play, but if we be chosen for a pleasant, merry part, how thankful we ought to be, giving great praise, and helping those less fortunate, and even being grateful to that poor mommet which goeth about night and day to work our destruction, for it might have been the other way. So in spite of all, I was always sorry for Beguildy, though, dear knows, he was the villain in our story. We had a very middling crop that summer, both of grass and grain. Our lives went to the same tune with no change, saving that mother was as good as her word, and did send for Kester. I thought she seemed very busy all that June, spinning as if it was ever so till even Gideon gave a word of praise. Then one day she said, There's such a deal spun, I shall be obliged to send for Weaver. But I was settled in my mind not to see him, so the day he was coming, about the end of hay harvest, I took the brummock and went hedging in the far fields where none would find me. I'm going hedging, mother, I says. I'll take some bread and cheese. Can you see to the young turkeys and tell Gideon he must make shift with the milking, for I shanna be back till dark? What must she do but begin to wring her hands and keep on saying under breath, Oh, the pity, the pity to be so cursed! But go I did, and when I wrought home, 
There in my attic were the bits of wool and thread he'd left, and a very pleasant smell of tobacco, for he liked to smoke a bit while he worked. And just by the corner of the loom, what should I find but a blue and white handkerchief, which I very dishonestly did put in my locker, and turn the key with great satisfaction. I said to myself in a kind of gloating way that some day I'd launder it and roll it up with a bit of lavender and send it back, but not yet. Mother was full of tales about the weaver. Oh, he was such a kind man and strong and so considerate. I thought I could have told her that. Like a son to her he'd been, she said. I should have seen him a sitting on the settle at his tea, I dare say, I thought, and lose my heart worse than ever. Wanted to know if I'd any other family besides San, she said, so I told un. Oh, mother, what did you tell him, I said. I told un I'd got the best girl in the world, and a good daughter to me, and very jump and slender, with a long silky plait to the knees, and dark melting eyes, and such pleasant ways, merry and mocking and pitiful. Ah, I told un, proper, I did. And I told un you could do the tall script and the short, and that beguiled he was learning you to read, and that you could do words of four syllables now. Dear to goodness, mother, I said, what a tale you made out. No tale, my dear, for tis the truth. Did you say aught of Gideon's letters? I mean, did you say I wrote em? Why, no, my dear, San met not her liked it, nor Jancis, nor you. No, you've got a lot of sense, mother. It was always said in our family as I had, my dear. So Weaver thinks we're a very well-educated family, I make no doubt, mother, and he'll take it for gospel that Gideon writes the letters. After, when I was helping her to bed, I took courage to say, Did you tell Weaver I was hair shotten? No, no, my dear, what for should I do that? Only he met be thinking of me a bit, seeing as you said such things, and then if he met me ever... Well, my dear, if he met you, and he's the man I think him, he'd be bound to like you right well, says mother roundly. When I tucked her in, she catched my hand. Prue, should you care if he'd got but one leg, or one arm, or was all pitted with the smallpox? Care, mother, I cried out all in a minute, never thinking. Of course I shouldn't care. I should love him the more for it. I knowed you did, my dear, says mother, very contented. I knowed you loved the man, and I'm right glad of it. Now, Dunny, you hide from him, Prue. Be well plucked and risk all, like a good player in the game of costly colours. No, no, never will I. Oh, mother, it was unkind in you to catch me like that. I only wanted to know, Prue. I be getting ancient and old, and the time draws nigh when life'll be a burden. I'd lief know as there was good in store for the best girl ever. She looked out and away through the little moony window, with the dark round blots that were red roses pressed on the panes, and the silvery sky dim and not starry, but very kind seeming, and she seemed to be listening to summat. Then she said, I do believe all shall be well with you, Prue. It's come to my heart as soft as dew, and as sweet as a red rose, that you'll get love as well as give it. After my time, though, after my time. But no matter for that, so I do know it's to come. I felt a shiver of strangeness in the night. What is it, my dear? I asked her. Is it the second sight? No, I see naught, but I feel it within me. You be well, be you, mother, I said, for I was afraid she might be slipping from me, since the dying are ever so. But she said, yes, she was in her daily health, and well, and not going to die this many a day, 
only it came on her at the thought of Weaver, and how he'd said, Well, single I am, and single shall stay, I do believe, but if ever I did think of asking to wed, it'd be just such another as thatn. At the end of corn harvest Gideon asked me to write his second letter to Jancis. We were having our suppers on the bench under the dairy window. After, I fetched the ink and said, what should I write? So he said I must write as he was well and hoped she was, and she was to be a good girl and work hard and not ask for any early money for clothes or boots, but to think of all that was to come. And it was a middling harvest, and her father still in the same mind about the young squire, who was about coming back from the low countries next year with his pockets full of money, and the big long horn cow had calved, but dropped her calf like the guerian she was. And to tell Mr. Grimble, he could do with a few lambs when he fetched them off the hills for the winter, but no sign of foot rot or home they'd come, dang swang. And so no more from G. San. Then he said, Put in as I'll see her Christmas market, if Grimble will bring her. I said I'd do the best I could, and did it matter if I put in a bit more? And I couldn't help but laugh, for it did seem such a peculiar letter for a fellow to write to his sweetheart. And Gideon looked up very sharp and said, Why did I want to write more? So I said the ped did run away sometimes, and he said he supposed it were easy to know quite what you were at when you started writing, and God save him from such foolishness and so long as I put in all he'd told me, I might put in some as well, if I'd a mind. So I wrote it. San, September 26. My dear sweetheart, it do seem a long while since your letter, which was a beauty, and I kissed it a good few times. You know very well how to do a love letter. I can see the two of you at it, your golden hair shining, and your pretty face bent down, and Weaver smiling a bit, and looking well amused with those eyes that would tice any girl away from her own man, and mind you don't fall in love with anybody but me, if possible. Maybe I shall see you at the Christmas market. Tell Weaver that all mother's tales of our Prue be made-ups, for she's very ordinary in every way. Tell Mr. Grimble I could do with a few lambs. Tell Weaver, when he goes nigh Huglets, he might carry a gun as well as not, for Huglets got an awful dog now, and I hope all's well betwixt Weaver and Grimble. If there's ever any sewing work Weaver wants done, being a lone womanless man, I've got two women in my house, mother and sister, both glad of a job at a fair price and red cabbage pickle and damson cheese they makin which pays them very well to sell at half market price and a charity to employ them it's a middling harvest longhorns dropped her calf young camperdines expected back next year and if they've gotten foot rot back they'll come dang swang and so good-bye for now and take all care of self in the beginning of a cough Take a lemon and crushed honeycomb fire hot, and you be my dearest, dearest love, as I'd spend my life for very willing any time, and die for you by bite of dog or any way, my dear. And so good night, from your lover, Gideon San. That is a nice text, the maester become. I often wondered as the autumn went on and the cold nights what they thought of my letter. We knew they had it all right, for one market day Gideon came back with the lambs that Grimble had put in pen for him at the Muggo Cider, and they were good ones with no foot rot. But it was drawing on to Christmas when the letter came from Jancis, and I mind it was a wild night with a lashing of rain on the window when I read it to Gideon. But it was warm within, it made a good Christmas for me, in spite of work and mother being very ailing, 
so as we had to send for the doctor's man all the way from Silverton, for Gideon wouldn't hear of the doctor, saying the expense was more than enough as it was. He kept on grumbling and saying she was a burden, and mother would ask me, does San think I be a burden? So it was very awkward for me. But that letter was as heartening as a platter of good hot soup, and lest Gideon should take it to his own keeping, I made a copy of it, and this is it. The High Farm, Outrack, December 1st My dearest acquaintance, I am thinking of San as I write this, and of the best of lovers. Mr. Woodseaves would be very glad of the sowing and the pickle and the damson cheese San was so kind as to mention. Perhaps might speak to your sister one day about it. Mr. Woodseaves says that is the best cough cure ever, and tried it one foggy night after getting back from here to Lullingford, but thinks it would take a woman to mix it proper. Sorry about the harvest and the cough. But no need to worry about Huglet's dog, not being afraid of any dog, nor of Huglet neither. But that was a near shave at the baiting by gum, and a plucky woman to rush in the like of that and save a poor fellow. For Mr. Woodseaves hears tell it was a woman did it, a tall slim woman with beautiful dark eyes, so they do say. It enough for me to say anything, as you know, San but others will talk. Weaver says if ever he had an acquaintance, he'd leave she was that sort. And so good night, and a merry Christmas from Jancis Beguildy. I love you already, and if these things be done in the dry tree, what shall be done in the green? End of Book 3 Chapter 3book three chapter four part one of precious bane by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian jancis runs away part one it was christmas eve again a year and eight months after kester stopped the bull baiting there'd been no letters from jancis a long while but Gideon never worried about such things. He said it was only the weather, for the roads were so wady round about Grimbles that nobody could come at them in bad weather. They came to market seldom in winter, but laid in a store of such things as they needed, and Mr. Grimble would send half a score wagons of grain to be ground at the mill, and then they'd settle down. The farm and the two labourers' cottages, with the horses in stable, and the cattle in near pasture, and the sheep in the mangled fields close by, all snug for the winter. They were used to keep a lot of simples and cures at such farms, because no apothecary or doctor could get to them. The roads being past all telling bad, not if it was ever so. Woodseaves canna go there, and Jancis canna send to Lullingford, but come a bit of fair weather, we shall hear, said Gideon. I used to think of Jancis mewed up with Mrs. Grimble, a woman I could na bide, nor could Jancis. I thought of the high mountains and the sleet storms, like a wall of ice between her and us, and the snow thick and soft, whispering, whispering. It goes round the house and round the house and leaves a white glove in the window. That's what they say of the snow at Sarn. There were two sons, of course, to liven things up, but one of them was going to wed with the labourer's girl, and the other was very religious and did na hold with any kind of May games, nor pleasuring, nor even much laughing and talking. So she'd only Mrs. Grimble, that was a driver and a scold, and Mr. Grimble, that was very awkward in bad weather, because of the rheumatics. I used to think of her a deal. For if you thought of anybody at San, you thought of them a deal, it being so quiet, especially in the winter, and time standing still, so it seemed. 
and whenever I thought of Jancis I called to mind a thing I saw once in June, when we had strange, untoward weather, and a deal of tempest and sleet, which one day for about an hour turned to snow and I saw the wild roses so tender and fresh, and used to nothing colder than dew, with their pale pink petals all full of snow, and seeming to be frozen through and through, gold hearts and all. I thought of her always like that, for I was fond of her, and she seemed a child to me, though she was older. Even in spite of her making me remember that she was pretty and I was ugly, I was fond of her, and the more so when she was in trouble, for I never love folks quite so well when it's bright weather with them. So I wished I could have sent her summat for Christmas, if it was only a hemmed kerchief of plain linen. I'd asked Gideon to inquire after her at Castor's when he went to market, but Castor was away and the house shut up. That was uncomfortable news, for I liked to think of him by his own fireside, in the little house I knew by sight. It seemed he was nigher then, but it was his custom to go off for a month at a time, in the winter, to stay at one village or another, and do all the weaving there, to save going to and again. It was very quiet in our kitchen. Mother was in bed, being always bedridden now in hard weather, and Gideon was in the woods getting the Christmas brand. For whatever else we were stinted of, we always had that, since it took only labour to get it, and Gideon never grudged that, poor lad. I went to the door to listen if he'd finished chopping, and I could hear the axe barking, and the echo of it coming from across the mere. The trees were mounded up with snow, and the mere frozen till near the middle. The woods, as white as sugar, stood round the water so still, as if they were spelled, like folk in some old tale of witchcraft, so deep they were in trusses and bales of snow, and not a breath stirring. You couldna call summer to mind, you couldna think of the mere with lilies on it and ripples. I held my breath, it was so quiet, till a redshank called from the far end of the mere by the church very sorrowfully, with a sound like, mute, mute. Then some widgeon went over against the darkening sky, and I heard mother give a little cough, so I knew she'd be wanting her tea. The sound of the axe had stopped, so Gideon had be coming soon, and I set about getting the meal. I was baking, a thing I dearly liked. Most of the work I did was men's work, and baking seemed so light and pleasant after it, I liked to see the dough rising afore the big red fire, and to get the oven ready with burning wood, raking out the ash after, and setting the loaves in rows. It was pleasant to be in the warm, glowing kitchen, full of the good smell of bread, and to look out at the grey-white fields and woods, cold and lonesome, and then to draw the curtain and kindle the rushlight setting the table and putting the tater pie to get hot on the gleads and knowing that in a little while all those i cared for would be comfortable for the night the fowl had been shut up since the first dusk the cows and sheep were folded bendigo littered up pussy by hearth mother with a bit of fire in her room and the warming pan in the bed and now gideon was on the way back to his supper the oven being still hot, I put in a batch of mince pies, for Gideon liked a bit of good fare as well as anybody, though he'd growl times, and talk about ruination, and where'd our house be, and the silver plate and all. But though I did as he said all the year round, with a bit of bread and cheese and a tater for a meal, at Christmas time I went my own road, and we had our merry-making almost like other folks. And since, after all that came to pass, I've been more glad of that bit of disobedience to Gideon than of anything in our lives then. For I can say, anyway, they had that, whatever else they didn't have. I was singing to myself a bit, and talking to Pussy, who was almost too comfortable to purr, 
Only if I spoke she'd partly get up and arch herself very polite and open her mouth to mew and then be too bone idle to make any sound. But she looked at me as much as to say, I know you made this nice gladdy fire to warm me, missus, and I know you've got summat in larder for I, and thank you kindly. All of a sudden there came a soft tap at the door. So tiny and timid it was, it might almost have been a poor red breast tapping with its beak. There was one would come in hard weather, and if I was too long feeding it, it would tap on the window. I went to the door, and it being dark by now, and nobody coming our way in a month of Sundays, I may say I thought of frittening and fairies, and lob lie by the fire, and all sorts of queer things that were used to happen in times past. I opened it. There, against the white dreary stretch of the frozen mere, all woe-begone and white in the light of the fire, was Jancis. No sooner did I pull her in than she fell down, dang swang in a heap on the floor. The poor girl! Never did I see such a pickle. Her clothes were all torn, boots broken, hands and face scratched as if she'd been through briar hedges, which it turned out after that she had, and everything ringing wet as if she'd been dragged out of the mere. She'd fainted dead away, and I'd enough to do to get her round. When she came to, she told me she'd had no food for nearly two days, and she'd walked all the way from Grimble's in this weather. To think of it, the long and the short of it was that she'd run away, and she'd no money and no decent boots, and she'd had to slip away when she could, which chanced to be when she hadn't got her shawl. She cried and cried. Oh, I couldn't bear it, Prue. Oh, dear Prue, done a scold, it was more than anybody could bear. And when it came nigh Christmas and there was no news, and all of them ten times worse being mewed up with hard weather, oh, I couldn't bear it. And the girl at the cottage told me that the last two dairy maids ran away as well. She said, why didn't I run away too? Partly she said it because she was sorry for me, and partly because Alf Grimble, that's her young man, was paying me attentions. So she told me the best time to go, and kept them all out of the way, and gave me some bread and meat and a bottle of milk, and promised to tell them some tale to keep them from following me. She stopped a bit for breath, and there came from outside the sound of Gideon's cartwheels creaking along in the snow. What be you going to say to Gideon? I asked her. Oh, dunna let him be angered with me, Prue, dunna. I canna bear any more. When I tell you all I've been through, you'll see I canna. Gideon came to the door dragging a great log that was the Christmas brand on a chain. Dunna turn me out, Prue, whatever he do say, and however angered he be at me losing the place he settled on, keep me for this night. So I said, did she think any creature could make me turn her out at any time, let alone in such weather? And I tucked her up on settle, and said she must rest now, and afterwards she should have a sup of tea, and then to bed, and all her troubles were over. Then she smiled and whispered, I love ye, Prue, you've been like the saviour to me this night, and so fell asleep. Times, seeing what came to pass, I'm main glad of that smile and that whisper. Eh, but Gideon was in a rage. Why, she'll lose all the money, he says the first minute, and she'll not only lose the money for the year and four months to come, but she'll lose the wages for the year and eight months she's been there. If they break their time, they get no money, you know that as well as I do. I asked how he could think of the money, when she'd come to our door the like of that, all draggled and half dead. You always were a fool, Prue, he says, and I suppose you always will be. But my patience was out, and I talked to Gideon straight. I'd thank you to keep your tongue in leash this evening, Gideon. 
Here's Christmas, and Jansus come to you out of death's arms very nearly, for it wanted but a little. If she'd lost her way again so late, she'd have been done. And seeing I've taken her in, and she's to have my bed, and I've cosseted her for ye, she being your dear acquaintance, you ought to be humble and grateful to me, and to them above, for the salvation of the poor child. Dear to goodness, what a spitfire all in a minute, says he. He laughed a bit, being startled, for I wasn't a used to breaking out like that. Then he went tramping into the kitchen. Well, he says very loud, for he wasn't a used to sick folks, and he always seemed to think they were deaf. When mother was sick, he'd shout at her somewhat odd, though mother had kept her hearing very well. Good evening, son, says Jancis, very small and weak. So, you've wrought back. Ah. Uh, broke your time and all. She began to cry. Now then, don't do that, he says, quite taken too. Prue'll give me some more tongue if you cry. I am not to say a word, not to-night. There'll be summat to be said to-morrow, but I'm to leave you be to-night. Well, how been ye? He stood in the middle of the kitchen and shouted it at her, so I couldn't help but laugh. Nicely, thank you kindly, son, she says. You don't do much credit to your pasture at Grimble's, I'll say that. See young Camperdine ever? No. Got an acquaintance over yonder? No, son, you be my acquaintance for ever and ever. Not Alf Grimble? No, but he was sweet on me a bit and pestered me. That was why I ran away. I never thought Jancis was so clever. But every woman's clever when she's in love, I do believe. She was ever so white against the black saddle. I ran away because you be the only acquaintance I do want, son. So that was it. I'll break Alf's head for uncome cattle market. No, Dunna, Dunna. So you ran away all those miles and miles because you didn't like Alf, and because I was your dear acquaintance? Ah, uh, give us a kiss, wench. I ran away into the dairy at that, and pussy with me, for she was always a bit skeered when Gideon was in. I skimmed and skimmed, and if I cried a bit, who was the worse? For I wished I was on settle with the young man shouting at me from the middle of the kitchen, and then saying, Give us a kiss, wench. And if you should ask what manner of young man would I choose, I'd say, as he'd wear a coat the colour of a May meadow, and look at you with eyes full of power and knowledge, till your soul turned right over. I canna have what I want, pussy, I says, but you can, for your wants be easy got. And I gave her a great saucer of cream, I did. What would Gideon have said if he'd known? But he'd got his cream in the kitchen. I'm giving you this, pussy, I says, because I canna get my own cream. It eases me to see somebody satisfied. She looked at me, frittened, thinking she must be going to get slapped in a minute, since I was too good to be true. Then she lapped it up. With that I heard mother calling. You've had that, anyway, pussy, I says. And now, mother... Would ye like some cream with your tea? Why, yes, my dear, I do dearly like a drop of cream with my tea, but what'll San say? He's busy lapping cream hisself, mother. Eh? Mother thought I was comic-struck. Well, in a manner of speaking, Jancis become. Jancis? Ah, run away. Dear to goodness! Walked all the way, she did. But why didn't she go home? I never thought of that. It seemed so natural she should come to us, like a clemmed red breast. She was afraid of beguiledy, I make no doubt, mother. Ah, you'll have to go and tell Mrs. Beguiledy. Boxing Day I'll go. Let Jancis have her Christmas. Be they 
as you met say, lovering at all? Ah, he was took by surprise, and he gave her a kiss afore he knew it. We laughed a bit. And now for your tea, mother. There's getting to be a real Christmassy feeling. Cream all round. And after supper I'll trim the house up with holly. Mind you get some cream yourself, my dear. As I went down the stair into the kitchen, where the two were sitting very old-fashioned on the settle, I wondered what would be cream for me. All in a minute, as I was scolding the tea, I knew. Jancis, I said, you ought to write to Mr. Woodseaves and say you've run away, or maybe he'll be making shift to go over extra early to write a letter for you. Ah, right, Prue, seeing as it's you and not me as writes, I done a mind, but he wanna go over there again. Not go? For why? I'll tell you all about it tomorrow day. I be so tired now. All right, I said, though I did long to hear about him. I'll tell about running away tonight, she said, but I told her supper first. Draw up now and take a bite and sup. Then you can tell us all about it, and then I'll write. I knew it would do her good to tell it, for when you've come through a bad time, to tell of it takes the thorn out. So she told us how she timed it to get to Lullingford on market day, and asked Gideon to bring her back, but took the wrong road in the hills, all looking the same in the snow, and wandered far out of the way, and was benighted, and slept in one of the huts that they make of furs for lambing time, and how she heard a breathing under the door, and thought it was the roaring bull of Bagbury. But she cried out upon the Trinity three times, as loud as she could, and it went away. Then she struggled on to Lullingford, going across fields, not being able to find the road. She was chased by a horse, which was worse than the roaring bull of Bagbury, and that was when she crept through the hedge. When she got to Lullingford, Gideon was gone, for he always started back as soon as he could. She went to Kester's, but he being away, she could get no help there. She was afraid to ask anybody else, for fear they'd send her back to Grimble's, so she started off again. But afore she'd gone far, she was so fainty that she had to creep into a barn and wait till morning. Then when she got to the woods, she thought of a shortcut and lost her way again. And indeed it was no wonder, for in the woods about Sarn it inna all that easy to find your way, in summer even. Dear to goodness, says Gideon, you want a chap to look after you, seemingly. Such a tale of foolishness I never heard. And what Fayther'll say passes me, she went on. He'll be neither to hold nor to bind. He's very set in his ways now, and if you go again his plans, he's very crousty. If mother knew, maybe she'd think of a way out. I'll go and see your mother come Boxing Day, I said. It'll be a funny thing if we canna invent summat to get the better of an old moithered man, hoping you dunna mind me saying it. Mind, you can say the worst you can think of about my dad, and I doubt I shanna think it's too much. And truly he be moithered, book learning or no. Set your heart at rest now. We'll think of summat to give you time to turn round. Maybe you could get another place, or maybe Gideon, if you mean, maybe Gideon'll want to get wed, I say in my own good time and not afore. I've told Jancis, if it's a good harvest and we do well, I'll be willing to get wed at harvest home, and she's willing as well. I'm right glad. Loving's never too early, and if you be fond of a girl, you man want her to be in your house, by fireside and table, indoors and out. I was thinking of a little house not twenty miles away, as different as could be from ours, and one in it as was a very obstinate bachelor, and did not want any woman there, let alone poor Prue's on. 
I thought it was about time I wrote the letter. What shall I say in your letter, Jancis? She said I was to say what I liked. So I fetched ink and paper and my quill and wrote it. Christmas Eve, San. Dear Mr. Woodseaves, I write to acquaint you as I've left Mrs. Grimble. Being very near with the food and a driver and Maester's rheumatics very awkward in sharp weather and son's awkward also one way or another, I've broke the journey at San. I may say Gideon and me think to be married come harvest home. I may say I be very glad, for when you do love anybody, you want to be with them and can arrest nights, wondering where they be, and if all's well, and if they change their stockings when damp, and if they be lonesome ever. I be more choice of him, I love, than of all else in the world beside. He be so kind and so brave, and when he be there I can but say, The maester be come. I love him past telling, and shall to the end. And so good night, Mr. Woodseaves, and a merry Christmas, from Jancis Beguildy. You write a pretty tidy letter, Jancis, I says. Would ye like me to read it? Laws, no. What for should ye? You know what's to be said. Ah, I know right well what's to be said. Only I manna say it, I thought. That's the trouble. I fastened the letter up and put it on the chimney piece, ready for Gideon to take next market day. End of Book 3, Chapter 4, Part 1book three chapter four part two of precious bane by mary webb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian jancis runs away part two there was a strangeness about the place all that christmas it was the best christmas we ever had and there was more singing and laughing than there'd been for many a year and yet it was, in a manner of speaking, sad. It seemed to me as if the singing came from a great way off, under the water, and when Jancis sat by the window, with the light falling on her pale gold hair and pale face through the greenish bottle glass, it made her look as if the water flowed over her. Green gravel, green gravel, the grass is so green, the fairest young lady that ever was seen. I'll wash you in milk, and clothe you in silk, and write down your name with a gold pen and ink. Ah, I can hear Jancis singing that song now, with her sweet shrilly voice a great way off. Ah, me, a great way off. Mother let me get her up Christmas morning, and came into the kitchen, sitting snug in the chimney corner, watching the lovers with a pleased, understanding, merry look, such as I've often seen on the faces of old women that have lived their lives, and know summit of love. It's as if they said, as they looked at the young lovers, Pleased be ye, my lad, you'll be better pleased yet. All of a twitter be ye, my girl. Well, I can tell ye, you'll be in more of a twitter later on, a power. I could see very well that when we three sang, as Joseph was a-walking, and good Christian men rejoice, mother was hearing other voices too, little voices, like the callard children's, lifted up all together, shrilly and sweet. She was seeing other faces, well scrubbed and rosy, lifted up to her as she sat in the dusk of the settle, ready to smile when the solemn carols were done, and shout, Grandma! She kept on patting Jancis on shoulder and saying, Pretty thing, pretty! And once I heard her cautioning Jancis against hairs. When your time comes, my dear, don't you go in the woods much, nor yet in the meadows. Keep near home, and you wanna come across one. Twould be a sad mischance, so it would. 
Oh, Mrs. San, says Chances, laughing and colouring up above a bit, you do run on so fast. We inner so much as caught in yet. And so do time run on, my dear. You manna let the moss grow on the path of love. Dunna give too many nay words. He's a good lad when you dunna vex him. But it's San more than me as wants to wait, said Chances. Foolish, foolish lad. What matter for the silver plate? What matter for so many maids and men? I'm sure I'd be content without, so as I needn't tend swine again, and can have my feet to the fire and a cup of tea. San wants to take me to the aunt ball, said Jancis, and I be to go in afore Miss Dorabella. That's a mischievous thought, for what done it matter who's first, so long as all be in, and what is it to go to one ball more than another? But I'd like it right well to go in afore Miss Dorabella. And so thee shall, called out Gideon from the door, where he was knocking the snow and mud off his boots. And so thee shall, my girl, and dressed as shameless as a lady. He came across the kitchen with the bit of mistletoe he'd clumbed the big apple tree to get, and gave her a loud, smacking kiss under it. Mother clapped hands as pleased as a child when Kitty wakes up and plays. But even when she clapped for joy, her hands still looked like the little praying paws of a trapped mole. Not later than harvest, San, she pleaded. You want to put it off later than that? I'll last till then, sure, but after, the winter comes, and who knows, I'd leaf see you where the fall winter. Oh, we shanna put it off, mother, no danger, what need, for I shall be a rich mon when I've sold the corn, and it'll cost naught to get it, for we can have a love carriage, and I can pay back with task work in the winter, and in another two three years we can shift, for the old mon at Lullingford won a last long, and the money'll be ready when the place comes on the market. So they were all merry. And when I said the tea's scalded, Gideon gave me a very affectionate pat on the shoulder and said I was a good wench. A right good wench, if ever there was one. Now draw up, draw up to table all. I want me tea cruel. But I couldn't be as merry as they were. I felt outside it all. Only I took a bit of comfort now and again between cutting bread and frizzling rashes and pouring tea in looking up at my letter on the mantel, with the address on it, in very tall script. Mr. Woodseaves, The Weaver's House, Lullingford. Then Jancis told us about Castor, and of the things that had come about through Grimble's spite, which could not be told in letters. For it seemed that Grimble and Huglet had misliked Castor ever since he stopped the baiting, and the mislike had soon grown into black hatred. They tried to set all the other farmers again him, saying this and that. They found fault with his weaving, which was the best in all the country round. And they said he was slow and dear. Not content with that, they must inquire into his religion and his ways of thinking in the matter of the corn laws and the parliament men. They hobnobbed with Squire over that, and set him again Kester too, worse than he was, for they said naught about the baiting, but kept to the corn. Every way they could, they worked against Kester, and very worried they must have been that he did not drink or go after woman, or do anything that they could have told of to the parish constable. But they did their best to make his life a burden for it irked them so sore to think of no bull-baiting for ten years. So one day when he was weaving at Grimble's, and it came to evening, Mr. Grimble looked at the cloth Castor had done in the day, and could not find fault with it, neither with the quality nor the quantity, for he'd worked right well, and Jansa said it was as smooth as silk, and never a lump nor a knot in it. He said naught to Castor, and after supper Jancis fetched the paper, and they began to write the letter to Gideon. 
and it seemed Mr. Grimble couldn't abide to see that, for he couldn't read nor write, and he thought Castor was above himself. So when he couldn't keep any longer, but man speak or burst, he says, If young San do like damaged goods, he'll get what he wants, and I doubt he'll have you to thank, Weaver. Very comfortable and pleasant you be together, I must say, you and San's girl. It's baby linen you best be weaving, young wood thieves. And with that, Castor snatched up his hat and all his things in a fury, but saying naught. And when he got to the door, he turns round and says, You met get Huglet's brother-in-law to weave for ye from now on, Grimble. You'll go without weaving for all me. You be a foul-mouthed toad, and a disgrace to your parish, which is situate in hell. He flung out, and he never came near the place again. I was forced to go up to the attic to think about it a bit. I did love Castor so sore for his rage. I thought I'd like to see an in a rage, though not with me, for if he was in a proper rage with me, I'd die. On Boxing Day, I went across to the stone house, and a windy walk it was, for the snow was drifted deep along the wood path, but it was fair overhead, and a mistletoe thrush was singing, and the cuckoo's beads were very bright on all the may trees. Beguiledy was out for a wonder. Mrs. Beguiledy and me had a good talk. Well, well, poor lamb, she said. To think she couldn't have come home to her own mother, because the mester be such a pig-headed fool. Drat the man. Now what's to do? For go back to Grimble's she never shall. But ours'll be roaring mad to think of all that money gone. Keep her a bit longer till the worst's worn off, my dear. Oh, she can bide, and welcome, as long as she's a mind. May them above reward ye, she says, for she was a very religious person in the manner of the church. And though I've no wish to speak ill of her, yet I partly think she was religious, in a measure at least, to spite beguiledy. But maybe this is a wicked thought of mine. Gideon was telling us that Callard's girl ran away afore winter, I said. She's by lonesome there all day with the five little uns and the baby. Maybe if we went at it the right way, and made a favour of it, they'd pay the same rate as Grimble's. They'll get nobody else till the spring, for they're all hired now till May, and besides, Callard's dingle in a place the girls like. You go and see Mrs. Callard, and I'll make shift to have a lesson to keep your maester busy. But you've left learning this long while, my dear, for you know as much as Beguiledy does. Ah, well, there's summat new I want to learn, but I dunno if it's in the books. What met that be? It's an old ancient charm, Mrs. Beguiledy, and it's called content. Oh, that! It's in no book of his'n. Nor in any book, I said, but I thought there's one knows it. Please God he met learn me, but that he never will. Ay, but it be no manner use for me to go, Prue, she says. They'd set the dogs on me very like. Callard's very religious, you mind, and he canna abide ours. And all he thinks, his missus thinks. All he says, she says, pat like the sun echo. Come to that, it'll go hard, but they'll take chances in at all, whatever, being who her dadda is. But maybe if you went, and told them on the quiet, that chances is promised to son, they met think of it. For your brother's beginning to be well spoken of as a man that's bound to be rich. So I said I'd go. I could not abide going, being looked at a bit sideways myself, and spoken ill of time and again. But when I saw Gideon and Jancis so pleasant and merry together in the even, playing beggar me neighbour by firelight, I knew I was bound to go. Why, Gideon, I says, you're busy at it, I see, though you cannot play conquer with cobnuts and snail house, and now, being too old, you're beggaring somebody still. 
Conquer, says mother from her corner. Ah, what a game that is. He was always very set on it, you mind. He liked to play with them big pink and white conkers. The Roman snail, they call in it, dunna they prue. It was those you went after the night poor San was took in his boots, poor soul. She cried a bit and went to look very small, which she always did when she was vexed. There, there, mother, dunna fret, he's in peace now. Ah, poor soul, and San's took the sin. My son, San, jumbled it up proper, I did. And I can see as there'll be lads to play conquer in our kitchen yet, with the big pink and white uns of an evening. She looked across at the settle. Gideon had just beggared Jancis and was in very good fettle. Ah, boys and girls, says mother, for I see well as he'll beggar her of more than cards. She began to laugh at the thought of the grandchildren and at her joke and she laughed so much that she gave herself a hoost and i had to put her to bed next day i set off for callard's dingle it was a way nobody would choose to go with snow deep on the ground for it lay over bleak high pastures with northerly slopes bitter cold and drifted up but seeing i was on a good errand i began to sing out on the bare pastures with none to hear open the gates as wide as the sky and there by the farm in a little fenced field what should i see grazing under a dark pine wood but the white bull that kester saved from the baiting i stopped and looked at it a bit there it was not dead nor maimed its nice white coat in good case and looking as contented as if it was just come to heaven and all because of kester He'd kept his promise and paid the money, and then given the bull back to Callard for his children. If you ever come to think bull-baiting's bad, I'd leave you told em so, he said, but not again your conscience. Now Callard was a very honest man, and he felt bound to make some return, whether or no, so he took the matter up in good sadness. Jansa said afterwards that it was very amusing to see him gather all the children together round the hearth, sitting on their little stools of an evening, the baby also being there on its mother's knee, and Callard had say very loud, Bull baiting's bad. And his missus, in that melancholy voice of hers, would repeat, Bad, like the sarn echo. Then all the children would sing out like a nest of birds, bull baiting's bad and times the baby would give a guggle and times he'd stay quiet considering like there was only one disagreeing voice and that was old grandfer callard's which was very high and trembling he'd call out no no it inna bad it be a right good merry old sport but nobody listened to him for he was getting very simple he came to the door when I knocked, and called out to his daughter-in-law. It be that there long thing, young woman, Maria, the witch woman. Well, bring her in, Father law Come thy ways, he said. Her'll be down when the baby gives over hollering. I do wish I'd got such lungs as his'n. I be very middling, very middling I be. Can you do cures? I said no to that. Oh, I thought beguiled he learnt ye. A very sinful man is that, soaked in sin like a sheep in raddle. It wanna be any manner of use for him to yammer at the doors of paradise and say, Wesh me and I shall be whiter than snow. For I tell ye, not the judge of all could claim him, even if he could spare the time to it. Ah, a wicked old man is the wizard. I do believe he lives by sucking folk's life away in the mid of night. Ah, sucks their blood, he does. They say he goes to the churchyard and digs folk up to steal their bones and grind them for his spells. They say he fetches little children home in his bag and makes a meal of em. Oh, he be the wickedest man since Punty Pilot, no danger. By this the elder children were roaring with fright 
and Mrs. Callard called out from the top of the stair, Fay the law, what be saying now? Hold thy noise. Mr. Callard came in then, and said I'd best take potluck, seeing it was tea time. So when we'd had our tea, I told them about chances. So, hers run away, says Mr. Callard, in this weather. Well, by gum. Gum, says his missus. Broke her time, says Callard. Time, says his missus, sorrowful. Nobody ever broke their time when I was the lad, said the old man. They darst na. They'd have been put in the stocks. And you be sure it inna anything to do with Weaver. Weaver, says Mrs. Callard, grievous. Weaver, Weaver, shouted the children, and it seemed to me as if they praised his name. I be as sure of that as I'm sure that I breathe, I said. And she's promised to your brother. Ah, they be wed come harvest home. Then, says Mr. Callard, the missus shall give the girl a trial. Trial, echoes Mrs. Callard in a hopeless sort of way, as if she thought that was what chances would be. They agreed to take chances for six months, and to give her three pound, which was a deal for them to offer. So I went back in high feather. Next day, Gideon said we could have Bendigo. So I drove chances to Callard's, stopping at Beguildy's on the way to break the news to the old man. Oh, dear me, but he was in a passion, and the worst of it was that he blamed it all on Gideon, who had naught to do with it at all. I'll be even with that brother of yours for this, he says. Ah, a very aggravating man. His dad was the same. I couldn't plan out anything or set my hand to any work, but he'd come and knock it down, tiddly bump. And young son's the same. Look at the way he's let and hindered me over the young squire. But Mrs. Beguildy was pleased. And you shall come home at the end of hay harvest, chances, she said, to make your wedding clothes, and the wedding shall be at Michaelmas. The glory roses'll be in their second blooming then, and you shall have em for your nosegay. I tell ye, says Beguildy, as San shanna take her. You can tell un so from me, Prue San, thwarted I wanna be. I've cursed the man by fire and water, and cursed he'll surely be. Tell un neither with the ring nor without it shall he take my wench. Well, good day to you, Mr. Beguildy, I said, for I thought it was time to drive on. Prue, said Jancis, as we drove through the water meadows between Plash and Callard's Dingle, what for did ye knife Grimble's dog and take on the way you did about Weaver? She looked up at me with those big blue eyes of hers, and I beat Bendigo cruel so as to be busy about summat. The poor old nag gave a half look round, and my conscience pricked me, but what was I to do? Folk be saying it was a very out of the ordinary thing for a girl to do for a stranger. Ah, even as far as Grimble's they knew it was you, though neither Grimble nor the missus told them, for they didn't like to speak of it, being beaten over it. But everybody knows in all the country round by this. She kept on looking and looking at me, and the red scarlet was burning like fire in my cheeks. I kept on thrashing Bendigo, and we went over the tumps and marshy bits at such a wallop as never was. Jancis gave a little laugh, very knowing and aggravating. Poor old Bendigo's done naught, says she. I want to get there, I answers, foolish-like. Oh, I'll be bound you'll get there, she says. Then she was quiet for a bit, though she watched me all the while. I wonder, she said after a time, what Weaver had think if he knew. He couldn't know, I said. He was in a swound. He met here tell, and I wonder what he'd think if it came to his ears that Prue San had foughten for unlike a tiger. He'd think not. Everybody do know I'm sorry for the afflicted. Well, but he inna what you'd call one of the afflicted, Mr. Woodseaves inna. He's the best wrestler in these parts, and a right proper man. 
He was afflicted when Grimble's Toby got him by the throat, one he? Ah, but why must it be Prue Sand that did save him? And why must she take his yed to her bosom so kind and all? Not but what he'd got very nice brown hair and silky. I was used to notice it when he was writing the letters for me. And that Felina thinks so too. She does fairly torment him, market days. What a brazen piece! What does she do? I was glad to turn Jancis on to summat else. Oh, she goes to the house and leaves a great basket of mushrooms, or a frail of wimberries, or maybe a bit of mutton, if shepherds killed a sheep. And if she meets him in the road, she'll look at un with them green eyes and smile as sweet as an October nut. And one night when shepherd was drunk, and they were late starting home, what must she do but go in the dusk and sing a wild song outside his window? What did she sing? Oh, she sang, a virgin went a souling in the dark of the moon, a soul cake, a soul cake, oh, give it me kindly and give it me soon, a soul cake, a soul cake, a young man he looks from his window so bright, there's a virgin come wailing in the dark of the night, now what'll you give me for a soul cake, my maid, my body, my body for a soul cake, she said. And I call that a right down improper song, dunna you, Prue? What did he think of it? I wouldn't have demeaned myself to ask him, but she's a very wild woman, is Felina. She'll tice him up and tempt him to a fall if somebody dunna keep her off. But I want to know what I be to say to Weaver if he asks me why you were so busy a saving of him. Say naught. Naught, no answer. It's all he'll get. The way you stood over the fellow, like one of the angels at Eden Gate, with that great knife. It's none of your business if I did. Ah, it be. For why? Because I love ye, Prue. Thank be to goodness we're at Callard's, I said, as we came into the fold, and the house door burst open and out came the five children, Grandfather Callard, Mrs. Callard, and the baby, like bees from a skep. The last thing Jancis said afore I drove away was, I shall be bound to send for Weaver soon. Whatever for? To write me a letter to San. Why, you be only at two three miles from Gideon now, Whatever do you want to write a letter for? It's none of your business if I do, said she, very mim, and laughing to herself, which is what you did say to me, Prue San. End of Book 3, Chapter 4, Part 2